Christmas at Cliffside, Romantic Women's Fiction, Cliffside Point, Book 5, written by Ellen Joy, narrated by Jennifer March. Chapter 1 Lila Whitmore stood in the reception room of the wharf, among the women of Martha's Vineyard's elite, as they chatted about decorating their beach houses or winter houses or weekend getaway houses for Christmas. I found this amazing fabric designer in Europe, Abigail Schofield said, just vaguely enough to make Lila question her. Abigail tended to exaggerate the facts. But Lila didn't care enough today. She didn't care about interior designs or country clubs or summer parties. She didn't care what their husbands, children, or extended family did. She didn't care about their charities or the philanthropy work they were doing because none of it mattered. All that mattered to the women standing together at the annual Christmas luncheon was who was wealthier, skinnier, classier, or whatever else made these women better than the other. All they did was compare themselves and try to outdo the others by what they wore, what they drove, or where they lived. And as she listened to Abigail tell the women how wonderful her new curtain rods were, Lila wondered why she never noticed this behavior before. Lila, Abigail said suddenly, as though Lila had missed an important part of the conversation. Excuse me. Lila made her smile as perky as possible. What are you doing for Christmas this year? Hannah Taylor asked, her face scrunched as though she were hitting a nerve. Lila glanced around at the dozen or so women, all waiting for her to answer. They were like vultures waiting for a sick animal to die. Whatever Lila said at this moment would be spoken about, examined, and judged. I'm staying on the island and celebrating with my family, she said. Gigi St. Pierre tilted her head. I thought your parents were going down to Palm Beach. Shoot, Lila said in her head. Gigi hadn't forgotten her parents' annual plans. She noticed Gigi looking at Abigail, swallowing back a laugh. Yes, I know, Lila said. I'm staying with my grandfather. Hannah made a face at Abigail, who made a face at Gigi. That's nice, Gigi said with fake enthusiasm. Roland and I are headed to Paris again, Hannah said. I just love it there at Christmas time. Have you ever been to Provence's Christmas markets? Abigail asked, a bit of competition in her voice. Lila looked out the window, wishing she hadn't come to the annual ladies' Christmas luncheon for Martha's Vineyard's Charity Society. She could have just dropped off presents at the local church and accomplished the same exact thing. As the women continued to one-up the other, Lila snuck away to the window of the dining room. The wharf sat right along the Atlantic coast, and from where she stood, the water seemed as though it went under the restaurant. She stared out at the cold gray sea, its waters choppy with whitecaps. The clouded gray sky above matched the water below. Inside the wharf, it looked like a Christmas Hallmark movie. Lights strung around a tall Christmas tree with gorgeous glass ornaments, wreaths hanging on doors, garland wrapped around doors and the large mirrors, everything colored in reds and golds and greens. She looked back at the group of women standing together, not even noticing Lila's exit. It didn't matter, she kept reminding herself. None of what they thought mattered. They could say what they wanted about her. It didn't matter. Her mother was deep in conversation with Abigail's and Gigi's mothers. Gigi's mother, Deborah, snuck a look in Lila's direction and quickly glanced away. It didn't matter. Lila kept her gaze on the choppy gray waves. She smiled to herself, thinking of her friend Harper writing on the boat, typing away with the sway of the ocean. Lila almost wished she had thought of staying on the boat herself. Not that she didn't want Harper to have a place to live, but Lila didn't want to go back to her big empty house. Deborah snuck another look, and Lila decided to head to the restrooms. 
She'd sneak out if it weren't for the award she was receiving after the meal. As she walked through the crowd and made her way to the bathroom, she noticed her mother with a new group of women. Sonia did not seem to be happy about whatever was being said. Lila tried to remember a time when Sonia was happy. When was the last time her mother had laughed? Like, belly laughed. When was the last time she had looked like she enjoyed herself? Lila couldn't remember. It had to have been a year. Christmas last year. Lila had seen her mother happy when the engagement had been announced. Joel had even gotten her father's permission. Sonia had cried with joy at the announcement. Lila picked up her phone, about to text Andrew, her twin brother, to ask if he had seen their mother happy in the past year, when she heard her name. Lila's got nothing else going for her but this award. Lila froze before turning the corner. It was Abigail. Lila's former best friend's voice was unmistakably annoying. She looks like a complete fool being here today, Hannah said. I mean, she was only asked to head those events because of her mom. And now we must sit through this ridiculous ceremony. Lila's pulse sped up. It doesn't matter, she said to herself. It doesn't matter what they say. Did you hear? Her parents invited Joel to their place in Palm Beach still, and that's why she isn't going? Abigail said with a laugh. Can you imagine your parents choosing your ex over you? Lila's heart dropped. Have you seen who she's been hanging around with lately? Hannah said, lowering her voice. Oh, I know. That weird girl from high school. Harper, Abigail said with a giggle. Joel told me he had stayed with her because he was worried about her. Lila's throat went dry. No wonder he left her, Hannah said. Lila jumped behind a plant as Abigail and Hannah came around the corner. They didn't even notice her standing there, barely hidden by a ficus tree. Had her father invited Joel to Palm Beach? Lila was positive Sonia wouldn't have invited him, but would her father? Andrew would flip out if it were true. He didn't need more ammunition to start in on their father. She looked at her mother, standing in the middle of the room, her minions orbiting around her like planets around the sun, just doing what had always been done, without ever changing course. She could hear Abigail's laugh over the crowd's murmurs. As people started to move toward their seats, she noticed Sonia looking for her. A Whitmore wouldn't let a little gossip ruin the spotlight. Her mother had been waiting for this moment since the day she made Lila sit on her charity board. It didn't matter if anyone in the room liked or respected Lila, as long as the trophy or award said Whitmore on it. Lila stayed in the shadows, wishing she could be anywhere but there. Her phone buzzed with a text message from her mother. Where are you? Sonia's swan-like neck swung around to see where Lila was. I'm not feeling well, Lila texted back. Could you accept for me? Her mother read the text in the middle of the room, then dropped the phone to her side, storming off toward the honoree's table up front. She whispered something in Marjorie Hatfield's ear and put her phone away. She never texted Lila back. Knock em dead, Biddy sent. Lila immediately felt guilty. She had practiced her acceptance speech with Biddy at her grandfather's place the night before. She had been hanging out a lot at Pop's, or on Harper's boat, or Sunday dinners at Evelyn Rose's house. She hung out at Books and Bread and volunteered at the library and nursing home. Anything so she didn't have to go back to the house. But as her mother rolled her eyes with her friends, probably telling them about her having to save her daughter once again, Lila had no desire to play the game any longer. That's when something came over her. Something she wouldn't be able to explain later. A sudden jolt of courage she hadn't had with this group or her mother before. She walked out onto the floor where, for some reason, a makeshift dance floor sat, which no one ever used at these kinds of events. She plowed past the group with Abigail and Hannah, past their mothers as they circled around Sonia, and walked up to the stage, 
where Marjorie was trying to wrangle everyone's attention. If you ladies could find your seats, please, Mrs. Peterson, the head co-chair, said. She and Lila's mother had scrutinized the seating chart for hours. Like a wave coming to shore, the women moved together toward their seats. Sonia hesitated before moving, all the while keeping an eye on Lila. Lila gave her a smile, which seemed to satisfy Sonia enough to find her seat at the front table, where she and the other royal members of the Martha's Vineyard Charity Society sat together. Lila's heart pounded hard inside her chest. She was going to do it. Do what she had said she would the other night as a joke with Harper. Marjorie leaned over the podium and into the microphone. Lila would take the microphone off the stand. She wanted to hold it in her hands, so she had something to do with them. Then she'd give her speech. The one she had practiced with Harper over a bottle of wine. As Nancy began welcoming the group, Lila second-guessed herself the whole time especially when she saw Abigail lock eyes on her after whispering something in Hannah's ear. Marjorie read her own speech, which Lila's mother had written, listing all her work through the year. No wonder Harper had hated Lila in high school, because back then she would have done the same thing if she were in Abigail's position. She'd divert the attention to something else, or in her case, someone else and Lila was a pretty good target. Everyone knew Joel had cheated on her with his trainer and his assistant. Abigail just seemed to think that Lila didn't know about her sleeping with Joel. Everyone, please put your hands together for this year's Volunteer of the Year Award winner, Lila Whitmore. Marjorie held out a glass award with Lila's name engraved on it. Lila didn't even stop her stride as she took the microphone off its stand. Thank you, Marjorie, Lila said. She gave a quick look at Sonia as she took in a deep breath. I have always enjoyed giving my time and volunteering, but never more so than this year. As many of you know, this has been one of the most difficult years of my life. Sonia's eyes widened in horror. Smirks began to grow around Abigail's table. But since no one really wants to sit here and talk about my charity work and would rather hear about Joel's affairs, I'll clear the air. She looked directly at Abigail, who quickly caught on. She had bet wrong on Lila, terribly wrong. All the rumors are true. Joel cheated on me. He cheated on me with his assistant at his office, his trainer before that, and with one of my dearest and closest friends and probably more women I don't even know. Abigail's mouth dropped in horror. The rest of the women sitting around the table, the very women who would have been her bridesmaids, all had immediate reactions of shock, horror, and enjoyment. They were supposed to be her best friends, but she wasn't sure if they ever had been true friends. How could you sleep with your best friend's fiancé? Either way, Lila certainly didn't want to be friends with them any longer. Sonia stood up, but Lila had expected this, and it was why she held the microphone. Sonia would have to rip it out of her hands. I want to thank all of you who looked the other way instead of telling me. Lila stared directly into her mother's eyes. Oh, and I want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you for the award. Chapter 2 Biddy scrubbed the sinks, the counters, and the floors. Then she dusted and vacuumed and washed every sheet and towel in the laundry closet. She cleaned out the cabinets, wiped down drawers, and organized all of Randy's junk drawers. She arranged and rearranged, making sure everything looked just right. Drake and DJ were coming in tomorrow. Biddy was filled with anticipation and anxiety. This was the kind of day she could go for an extra long walk with her friends, or sit in books and bread chatting with the regulars. But the day had turned out to be a dud. A wintry mix had stuck around since the morning, and the roads were too slick to drive on, which meant she was stuck. And Biddy didn't do well being stuck still. So she cleaned. 
Where'd you put my nail clippers? Randy asked from his recliner in the family room. I put them where they belong, Biddy said back. In the bathroom. After moving into Randy's house, Biddy had set up some rules while she cared for him, one being that he couldn't cut his toenails while watching television. You really are a drill sergeant, you know that, he said, getting up from his chair. She peeked into the family room from where she stood at the kitchen counter. Don't even think about moving. Randy groaned and grabbed for his newest and still loathed walking cane. Men his age were their own worst enemies. Randy had fallen so many times because he had refused to use a cane. Now, not only was he walking without falling, but he was walking more and gaining strength each and every day. When Biddy had first arrived, he'd been stubborn about the way he lived. But Biddy proved even more stubborn with the way she wanted them to cohabitate. Where did you put my Reader's Digest? He shouted as he passed the magazine rack. You left it in the bathroom, Biddy said, pulling all the stuff out from underneath the sink. You know he's not going to look under there, right? Randy said as he passed to the bathroom. She sat up, brushing her hair back. You're Captain Obvious today. I always loved feisty women. Biddy eyed the half-used bottles of window cleaners and cleaning sprays. She pulled off her rubber gloves, looking at the mess she had purposely created to fix. Easier to clean up this mess than the mess she'd been avoiding since leaving Oklahoma. Drake coming to Martha's Vineyard with her grandson was everything she had wanted since arriving on the island. She couldn't wait for her friends to meet them. She couldn't wait to show them around. She couldn't wait to celebrate Christmas and the New Year together. But the truth of the matter was, she and Drake had a lot of things to talk about. One being his divorce to Darlene, and two through a million was everything that happened after Richard's death. She grabbed her gloves. That was enough thinking about what she was avoiding thinking about for now. She pulled back on the gloves and dove under the sink. Just as she reached for what appeared to be old SOS pads, her phone rang. As Biddy answered, Evelyn immediately started talking. Let's have a big dinner here at Seaview to welcome Drake and DJ to the island. Biddy moved to a chair. That sounds like a great idea. But she wasn't sure what Drake would think about it. She wasn't sure what he wanted with this visit. Did he want to get away for the holidays with his son? Was he escaping his divorce? Or was he as lost as she worried about? When he called asking for help, she hadn't realized how bad things were. She hadn't known Darlene had left him. She hadn't known why Darlene didn't have DJ. She hadn't even known that Drake had moved out of his and Darlene's home until he had slipped and told her. Let's plan for the day after he arrives, Evelyn said. Does that work for you? Biddy hadn't planned much for their trip. Drake had said DJ's interests were all things ocean at the current moment, but as she tried to prepare things for them to do on the island, she was stumped. There was the aquarium in Boston, but that meant taking the ferry to the mainland and back. A busy day for most people, and she wasn't sure if DJ would be up for it. The truth was, she hadn't seen her grandson in two years. A lot can change with a nine-year-old in two years. What can I do to help? Evelyn asked. Could you change the weather? Biddy tried to sound light, but her nerves raced through her body. I'm worried this system will stick around and wreak havoc for their flight. Don't worry. I saw that it's going to clear up soon, Evelyn said. Let's hope. It's going to be so great to see them. Biddy wished she had the same excitement. She hoped this would be the visit they needed to mend their relationship. She really did but a part of her worried it could set things off as well. Two years was a long time, not just for nine-year-olds, but for 30-year-olds. Just give us a ring if you need anything, Evelyn said. Biddy appreciated it. Thanks, I will. She put the phone down and looked out at the fog. On a clear day, Randy's house had gorgeous views of the Atlantic Ocean and Sugar Beach, but today... She could hardly see the backyard through the wintry precipitation. 
Where's my phone? Randy yelled from the bathroom. Biddy groaned to herself, looking at the table beside his recliner. It's in the family room. She picked up her gloves and got back under the sink. Chapter Three Evelyn stood with a pair of binoculars at the window. She swore she saw the shape of a humpback whale breaching out of the water. The image appeared again, and she pointed at it. See? Over there. Charlie looked up from his book. It's just the sun's reflection on the water. You don't see humpbacks in winter. They have one of the longest migrations and head south to warmer weather. You're literally a walking encyclopedia. I don't even need my phone. That's what happens when you own a bookstore. You tend to read a lot. Charlie sipped his coffee. I should put some more logs on that fire. Evelyn put the pair of binoculars down and by habit picked up her phone. She immediately set it back down. Oh, I can't do it. She and Charlie had promised each other they'd stay off their phones for the day, and it was her who kept struggling. I can't help it, she said, even though she was sure Charlie hadn't seen her cheat. I'm dying to know what they think. The New York Times is not the be-all and end-all. Charlie leaned back in his chair, but Evelyn couldn't sit still any longer. This review could make or break my book, Evelyn said. This was the book she had needed to write for years, and in a genre Evelyn Rose didn't usually write. A memoir. What if people are like, this lady is so boring, what was she thinking? Evelyn shook her head. I'm not Cheryl Strayed. No, but you're an award-winning author who has been successful through ups and downs and is pretty amazing because of it, Charlie reminded her. Evelyn took in a deep breath and pushed her phone across the table. Burn it in the fire. Charlie rolled his eyes at her dramatics. Her heart continued to beat at a speedy rhythm. Why had she decided to write a memoir? Catherine had warned her. People only love the juice, which meant dishing on other people. You're too nice, Catherine had said. People want to hear the dirt. What if it's on my gardening gloves? Evelyn had teased, but she hadn't listened. In the end, the story had wanted to be written, and Evelyn couldn't ignore it any longer. She got up from the couch and walked around what she called the gathering room. It sat at the back of the house, with the best view of the Atlantic Ocean on the first floor. When she had bought Seaview, it had been the tumbled sea rock fireplace that sold her on the crumbling Victorian seaside cottage. Instead of tearing it down, like the real estate agent had practically suggested, she had hired a contractor to renovate the whole thing. It had been her best project. That's what her memoir centered around, the renovation. Through it, she wrote flashbacks of losing George and herself, how she had spent five years pretending he wasn't dead, only to fall apart when she realized she'd lost five years of her life. She wrote about taking the singles cruise, how her writing had fallen apart, how her relationship with her daughters had been strained by George's death, and how she had returned to the island where she'd written her very first novel. It was her story of starting over, how she had offered second chances, discovered herself by being open to new experiences, and found lifelong friendships. She looked around the gathering room, where everything was draped with Christmas decorations. Lights hung from the mantel, and the large blue balsam she and Charlie had cut down in the White Mountains. Decorations from both households, including new ones too, covered the tree. Evelyn had even put a starfish on the top, with homemade shell ornaments baby George made. Christmas decorations were throughout Seaview. It was magical, especially with the snow starting to fall outside. It's so beautiful out there, Evelyn said, watching as the snowflakes disappeared on the water's surface. She had loved visiting Martha's Vineyard in the summer when she'd first started coming to the island as a 20-something, but she had never stayed for the winters. She had been too afraid. The locals had loved to tell her stories of nor'easters. 
but it had turned out that she enjoyed the winter as much as the summer. In the winter, the busy island became silent. Only locals shuffled through the cold wind and unpredictable New England winters. The summer tourists and summer residents were long gone. Now only she, Charlie, and Stan had to share Sugar Beach these days, though the seals liked to sunbathe on the rocks and beaches. What if it's a shark? Evelyn said aloud. What? Charlie said, leaning over the firewood rack. All the seals are back, she pointed out. Sharks migrate down between the Carolinas and Florida this time of year, Charlie said. They usually stay and mate up until spring. Seriously, do you know everything? Evelyn put the binoculars down and walked to the kitchen, about to get another cup of coffee. But she stopped herself. Her nerves were rattly enough. She probably should skip that second cup. I want to go for a walk, she said. During the winter, even through inclement weather, she enjoyed going to the beach. An icy, rainy fog covered the whole island, making the road slick and hard to travel on. The only place it wasn't hard to maneuver was the beach. It's cold and wet, Charlie said, holding three logs in his arms for the fire. You stay, and I'll take Stan. Evelyn headed toward the coat closet. I just need to get out of here. I want the waves to drown out my spinning thoughts. She shook her hands out, trying to release some of the anxiety crawling up her arms. Let me just put out the fire and change, Charlie said, looking down at his pajama bottoms. Evelyn nodded. Charlie didn't stay overnight very often, but the weather the night before had been bad. Another positive about the winter months, people tended to stay when there was bad weather. New England weather in the winter could be very unpredictable, and Evelyn loved a spontaneous sleepover. With her girls gone and Wanda and Biddy across town, the house felt empty when she woke up alone. Two more weeks, she said, wrapping a scarf around her neck, up to her head, and then around her face. Two more weeks, Charlie repeated. The wedding would be a simple ceremony, followed by a small reception. Evelyn and Charlie had agreed. They wanted nothing fancy, just close friends and family. She put on her hat that strapped underneath her chin and had fake fur inside, the warmest find she'd purchased on a trip to northern Maine. She grabbed her gloves and put them on, then slid into her coat sleeves. She'd have Charlie zip her up. She noticed Stan sitting at her feet. He had picked up on the fact she wanted to walk. Oh, Stan, I forgot about you, she said to Charlie's dog. Stan looked up, tongue hanging out of his mouth. Daddy will hook you up, she said to the dog. As she waited for Charlie to change, she peeked over to her phone. It hadn't rung, otherwise she would have heard it, which meant the review wasn't out yet. Or that Catherine, her editor, didn't want to tell her what it said. Oh, God, what would her agent say? Sue had been even more against Evelyn writing a memoir. You have a hit series on the largest streaming platform, Sue had said. Why would you pivot to memoirs? Evelyn could feel her nerves building up. Charlie, I'm going. Meet me on the beach. She swiped up the phone and stuffed it in her winter coat. Okay, Charlie called from upstairs. I'll be there in a few minutes. She turned to Stan. Wait for Daddy. The dog huffed a snort, as though he understood what she was saying. Be a good boy. Evelyn opened the door and stepped outside. The wind hit her right as she stepped out, stealing her breath with the shot of cold Atlantic air. She pulled up her scarf and walked down the wooden plank walkway toward the beach. It had been a mild start to the winter. Snow hadn't stuck around long enough to accumulate but little coverings of frosted moisture covered the sand, making the beach look as though a layer of lace sat atop it. Evelyn walked straight to the water, wanting the breaking waves to sound out her rambling doubts. What if her memoir didn't reach her readers? What if there was a fallout because of her truth? What if nobody cared? Evelyn hadn't been political, but she had been real. Real with death, 
real with love, real with success and expectations, real as a single woman in her fifties. She had been honest. She wanted to write it to help women like herself. If she could start over, so could other women in her situation. But what if she came off as someone else? What if she came across all wrong and the opposite happens? What if she'd ruined her career? Anxiety crawled up her legs, into her stomach, and radiated out her arms. Why did she care this much? Her phone rang, and she immediately picked it up. Evelyn Rose did it again. Only this time, instead of dreaming of a better world, Evelyn Rose gives hope that real life can be a fairy tale come true. Harper paused over the phone. Harper? It's out! Your review is out! Harper exclaimed. She immediately continued. As Evelyn Rose shares the story of being widowed and trying to find herself through loss, you will be there rooting her along as she brings you along this journey. Your heart will break and come together again in the most wonderful way. Evelyn Rose proves that miracles really do exist. Evelyn stood there, her mouth agape. Really? Harper squealed. They love it! Evelyn wished she could take hold of something as she spun alone on the empty beach. She covered her mouth to hold back her excitement. I can't believe it! She glanced at the house. It looked as though Charlie hadn't even left yet. Where the heck was he? She couldn't wait to tell him. You haven't called your dad, have you? Evelyn asked. Nope, Harper said. Good. Evelyn started back toward the house. It was colder than she had expected anyway. A nice fire, a good bottle of wine to celebrate, maybe some more bad weather. I gotta go, Harp. She hung up just after Harper said goodbye, racing toward the house. She noticed Stan sitting at the door with his leash on, but no Charlie. She opened the back doors that went into the kitchen. Charlie, she called out. Stan, where's Daddy? She looked through the kitchen into the gathering room. Charlie sat on the ground in his winter clothes, his feet still without shoes. Charlie? She went straight to him as he sat there in the middle of the room. He was frozen, his hand on his chest. Call 911. Chapter 4 Harper stood in the hospital room, pacing back and forth, as Evelyn sat inside with Charlie and waited for the doctor to do another examination. Why don't you go to the cafeteria and grab something to eat? Charlie said to Harper. I'm not hungry, Harper said. She could see Charlie look at Evelyn. I don't want you to see me in my skivvies, Charlie said to her as he lay on the hospital bed. The doctor will be here any minute. He suddenly looked so much older. When had he gotten so gray? Do you want anything? Harper asked. But she noticed Charlie hadn't stopped looking at Evelyn, who sat in the chair next to his bed. No thanks, Charlie answered. His eyebrows burrowed with concern. Ev, you okay? Evelyn didn't say anything, just stared at the white bedsheets, her hands clasped together. She shook her head slightly. Charlie reached out his hand. Come on, talk to me. How long have you known about your heart condition? Evelyn's tone was hard. Harper realized Evelyn wasn't just upset, but downright mad. You have a heart condition? Evelyn swung her head to Harper, crossing her arms against her chest. He's known for some time now. Charlie looked sheepish. I didn't want to worry you. So you figured hiding it would be better? Evelyn stood up, tears in her eyes. What if you had passed out and couldn't tell the EMTs you had a heart condition? That's the number one thing men my age would pass out from, Charlie said back. Harper knew he was trying to make his voice sound light and cheerful. They'd figure it out. Harper looked down as Evelyn stared at her father, her face incredulous. You think this is funny? Evelyn said back. I lost my first husband to heart disease. I can't lose my second. Harper could see the tears before Evelyn wiped them away. 
I'm sorry. I just didn't want to concern you, Charlie said, his humor gone. He understood the severity of the situation. Evelyn was more than just mad. Harper could feel her own heart starting to pump harder. You knew you had a heart condition? She asked again. For years, Evelyn said. No medication, no exercise besides his walks with Stan, no special diets. Harper shot a look to her dad. You knew you had a heart problem and did nothing? I was exercising, Charlie said meekly. I made an effort with my diet, and I didn't need to take the medication. Charlie fixed the sheets around his waist, instead of making eye contact with Evelyn or Harper. Harper and Evelyn shared a look. Do you know what it was like for my girls to lose their father? Evelyn asked him. Charlie looked away from Harper. I'm sorry. They will never get over losing him like they did. Evelyn's face showed a pain Harper had never seen before. And I can't go through that again. She didn't break her stare at Charlie. After a silent and tense moment, Charlie lifted his hands in surrender. Okay, you're right, he said. I will make getting healthy a priority. More than a priority, Evelyn said it like a demand. Charlie nodded. I promise. Harper could tell this didn't satisfy Evelyn, but she hoped for her father's sake that Evelyn could let her feelings go for the time being. I don't want to add any more stress, Evelyn said, as if she were reading Harper's thoughts. But I want this to be a partnership. Harper felt her phone buzz. Andrew had texted. I'm catching a ride home with Chase and Samantha. Harper's stress lessened a bit. Andrew would be the calm and steady presence she needed. Her phone rang, and before she even looked to see who called, she answered, stepping out of her father's hospital room. Hello? I did it, Lila said. Harper didn't know what Lila had done, but whatever it was, Lila sounded thrilled. I kept hearing them all whispering and shooting glances at me. Lila's voice boomed over the line. And then I just said it. Can you believe it? I dropped the microphone and walked out with my award. I felt like Beyonce. Harper immediately started to cry. Big, heavy sobs she couldn't hold in any longer. Harper, are you crying? Lila asked. It's my dad. Harper looked back into the hospital room. Evelyn sat next to Charlie, but rested her head next to his on the pillow. Evelyn had been mad but Harper could see the fear in her eyes, which scared Harper, too. He had a heart attack. Oh, my God, Lila shouted out. I'm coming to the hospital. No, don't, Harper scanned the hospital's corridor, searching for visitor information. I don't know what's happening yet. He's being monitored at this point, but I don't know. Harper felt lost and out of control. Where was everyone? Biddy and Wanda should be here, and Renee would shut down the store if she knew Charlie had had a heart attack, right? She knew Mateo would come as soon as he heard. No one's here yet, Harper said. Then I'm coming right now, Lila said, hanging up before Harper could protest. Harper glanced back into the room. Evelyn had moved onto Charlie's bed, facing him, and was crying. Harper's eyes pricked with tears before she realized what was happening. Charlie had almost died today. She checked her phone. Where was everyone? Harper! She turned to see Renee and George running down the hall. Where's Charlie? Harper couldn't push any words out, and Renee pulled her into her arms. Biddy and Wanda are in the lobby. They won't let anyone who's not family into the ICU. Renee wrapped her arms around Harper. How are you doing? Harper squeezed Renee and her son with both arms. I'm so glad you're all here. What happened? Renee asked. Harper shook her head. He started having chest pains this morning, but didn't say anything because he didn't want to bother anyone. Renee's mouth dropped. All morning? 
Evelyn called 911 when she found him on the ground in pain, Harper said, her voice quivering again. It'll be okay, Renee said. He's where he needs to be. Harper didn't want to bring up the obvious, that Renee's own father had died of a heart attack, that things might not be okay at all. What should we do? Harper wasn't great at handling these types of situations. She didn't know what to do when things were out of her control. Let's talk to my mom, Renee said. Harper nodded and followed Renee into the hospital room. Pa! George called out, his hands stretched toward Charlie. Mama! Evelyn sat up, swooping George into her arms. You have to be careful. Grandpa Charlie isn't feeling well. George's face became concerned. Boo-boo! Evelyn nodded. She placed her hand on her heart. A boo-boo right here. George looked at Charlie. Boo-boo? Charlie nodded. I'm going to be just fine. Are you? Harper couldn't help it. No one wanted to talk about the real possibilities. Yes, Harper. I'll be just fine, he said again. But Harper looked to Evelyn, who didn't look back at her, and instead kept her eyes on George. Why didn't you tell us? Harper now felt the anger start to rise. She understood how Evelyn felt. What if Evelyn didn't go back to check on you? What if she had gone on a walk without him like she had planned? You could have died, Harper said. Okay, Harper. Everything is all right, Charlie said. He held out his hands, closing his eyes, and took in a deep breath. I'm fine. You had a heart attack. Harper wasn't going to just brush this under the rug. But I'll be fine, he said back to her. She wanted someone to agree with Charlie, say that he would be fine. Evelyn merely kissed George's head. Renee just looked at Harper. He'll be fine, right? Harper asked the room. Doctor, Evelyn said, standing up. Good afternoon. The woman's voice boomed throughout the room, demanding everyone's attention. Even Charlie's eyes were open now. You must be Mr. Moran. The doctor reached out her hand and shook Charlie's. My name is Dr. Patel. I'm a cardiology specialist in internal medicine here at Martha's Vineyard Hospital. Harper stood taller, more alert, as the doctor explained what had happened to Charlie. Your angiogram came back. You have a small blockage in your left artery. And I don't like the look of it, she said, holding his chart. I'd like to put in a stent. Are there any risks? Charlie asked. There are always risks, but there's a very small chance of you experiencing any complications. The doctor started talking about the procedure. We'll go through the groin, using the balloon, then we'll put the stent in your artery. From the side, Renee stepped closer to Harper, then took her hand and put it between her own. He's going to be just fine. But Harper knew those words. She had used them herself with Wanda when the treatments weren't working, and she didn't know what else to say. She had said things would be fine, that everything would be okay. She had used those phrases when her great Aunt Martha started losing her lucidity. She'd said those things to make herself feel better, because there wasn't anything she could say to make the other person feel better. She squeezed Renee's hand and gave her a nod. She'd let Renee feel better about the moment. What would she have said? The same thing. The exact same thing. I love you, Harp. Renee whispered as she squeezed back. Harper's breath caught in her throat. She blinked back the tears as the doctor continued to talk about the stent and the prep. I mean it. I love you like a sister, Renee said. We'll all get through this together as a family. Harper nodded, thankful to have Renee here, to be the one willing to say what she felt. She loved Renee and Samantha like sisters, too. Evelyn had already become like a mother figure to her. Things were great. But what if Charlie didn't make it? What if Charlie had another heart attack, or he did have complications during surgery? Would they still be a family? 
Mateo came suddenly into the room. Charlie, what did you go and have a heart attack for? Charlie looked relieved to see Mateo, the pressure in the room slightly lessening, just by the joke between them. I needed a vacation and was afraid to ask Renee. Charlie winked at Renee. Well, you can have all the time you need, Renee teased back. How long is the recovery? Harper asked the doctor, who seemed to be done discussing the procedure with Charlie. It'll be a few days to a week before he can leave the hospital, the doctor said. But in a few months, with exercise and a healthy diet, your father will be healthier than he has been in years. The wedding, Harper said. I'll be fine by the wedding. Charlie waved at her as if dismissing the possibility that he might not be well enough for the big day. Is someone getting married? The doctor asked. I am, Charlie answered. The doctor smiled at him. When? New Year's. Evelyn scrunched her face, looking at the doctor as though she didn't think it would be enough time. The doctor made a similar face, seemingly thinking the same thing. I don't know. Two weeks. Dr. Patel glanced at her phone. Evelyn was upset again. Did he have a heart attack because of the stress? No, this isn't because of your wedding. It's because of all those deep fried foods and family genes. Dr. Patel started typing on her phone. I'm going to send in your nurse to get your vitals again. Then tomorrow morning, we'll prep you for surgery and get you on your way to the altar. Evelyn looked at Charlie. Let's get married tonight. Charlie appeared shocked. Tonight? Tonight, right now. Evelyn turned to the doctor. Isn't there some sort of religious person here who could marry us? Randy's a judge, Biddy said. Harper beamed as Biddy and Wanda came into the room. I thought they wouldn't let you in. Once they saw it was Biddy, the nurses looked the other way, Wanda said, walking to Evelyn. What were you thinking, not telling anyone? I know them all from Randy, Biddy said in a side conversation with Harper. Now, should I get the judge? Actually, it can be an active or retired judge, Lila said from the doorway. Lila, Harper smiled and hugged her friend immediately. I can't believe you all got in here. Sorry, Dr. Patel, Lila made a face. I know I'm not technically family, but I did just win volunteer of the year. That's right, the award, Biddy said. Lila beamed. I'll tell you all about it later. Well, don't leave me out, Charlie said from behind everyone. Mr. Moran, is this all your family? Dr. Patel asked. Charlie shook his head. I have a few more on their way. Harper stood next to Lila as she and Charlie shared some silent recognition. That crease in the middle of his eyebrow deepened, and he gave her a nod like he had when she graduated from high school or when he'd sent her off by herself to California to visit her mother. A nod to say she'd be okay without him. But this felt like more than that she'd be okay, or that they had each other. This felt more like a nod that she wasn't alone, no matter what happened. Harper gave him a single nod back, because no matter what happened, she wanted Charlie to be at peace. Chapter 5 I'll be able to sell this house in no time, the real estate agent said to Lila as they stood in the kitchen. There are a lot of families in the city who want a place on the island. Lila Whitmore had said nothing during the tour with the real estate agent. Instead, she'd followed the heavyset woman in a too tight red suit as she'd made comments about her house. The house her father had bought for her family the family she was supposed to have with her husband, Joel. But since he never became her husband, she never had the family, so she had to sell her perfect four-bedroom colonial on Martha's Vineyard. She thought about Charlie and Evelyn, and how right they seemed together. Even though they didn't end up getting married before Charlie's surgery, there was no doubt they would. Do you think you'd like to redo the kitchen? 
the real estate agent asked. Darker cabinets are what people want nowadays. I'm selling it as is. Lila tried not to think about the hours of her time spent making the kitchen into what Brenda apparently thought was outdated. Or was it Belinda? How about the floors? Lila stared at her and didn't respond. Right, Brenda or Belinda said, tapping her fake nails against her tablet. She clicked her heels along Lila's wood floors. It's still got a gorgeous view, and I can sell that. Lila bit her tongue. The real estate agent acted as though her newly built home were a dump. But Lila had styled it after a farmhouse in England her father had taken her to as a child. The cookie-cutter mega mansion had been bare and average before Lila. She'd spent a year during her engagement making that house into her dream home. She'd spent hours in fabric, consignment, and antique stores, and hunting estate sales for the perfect pieces. She painted, landscaped, and even built bookshelves in the study. She had painted the future nursery a pale turquoise. I would suggest painting neutral colors upstairs, the real estate agent said. Lila suddenly wished she'd taken her father's offer to take care of this himself but the idea of dealing with her father had seemed more miserable than dealing with Brenda. I can set up an open house this weekend. Brenda handed her a fake leather portfolio with all her information. Great. Lila didn't look at it. She put it down on the counter and ushered Brenda toward the garage door. I'll see you then. Your yard has a pool, right? Brenda asked, looking out the back window. Yes. Lila loved the pool. It was one of her favorite things about the house. She didn't have oceanfront, but she had a view, and the best view was from the pool. She had imagined sitting there, having barbecues with friends, or watching her three blonde children run around, with Joel lounging in the sun, doing normal things families did together. She felt the familiar prickle behind her eyes, and knew she needed to get Brenda out. Lila was about to lose it. It's been nice, Lila said, but I have an appointment I need to run to. She didn't, but Brenda finally got the hint. She wanted her gone. I'll send you the details of the open house, Brenda said as Lila opened the door. Great, Lila stood at the threshold, waiting for Brenda to leave. Goodbye. She shut the door as Brenda lifted her finger in the air. Lila couldn't stop herself at that point. The tears fell immediately as she silently stood against the door, holding herself up until Brenda left the premises. If Brenda, or, she looked down at the portfolio, Belinda, heard or saw Lila fall apart, then the rest of the island would be talking about it by midday tomorrow. After her performance at the annual volunteer Christmas luncheon, she needed to stay out of the public eye or until her mother would forgive her for embarrassing her in front of her friends. The same friends that talked behind her back about her daughter's fiancé sleeping with their daughters. That would be just what the island needed in the winter. Some big, juicy gossip. Dumped and desperate, Lila Whitmore loses it again, but now in front of her real estate agent. Then the realization of what people had already said about her hit. Dr. Joel Schaefer slept with his assistant. Lila knew all about Joel straying. He was only with her because of her family. She was certain all of them were true. She was also certain Joel had loved her at one time, but their relationship had evolved into something different, which she hadn't realized until it was too late. He wasn't going to end it. She must have been compatible enough to live the lifestyle he wanted, Hence, a huge box colonial that stood out from the cute Victorian cape-style fishing houses in the neighborhood. So much had been riding on this relationship. So she had looked away. Her father loved Joel. He'd been more upset about the end of the relationship than she had been. He would lose the dream son-in-law who teed off after him, could network better than most, and loved to kiss his butt. Lila held her breath as she heard Belinda's car drive off. But then she heard another set of wheels. She looked out the window. 
a black luxury SUV pulled into the driveway right behind Lila's spot. Lila's head hit the door with a bang. Her mother was here. Did you shower this morning? Sonia Whitmore asked as soon as she came through the door. Lila looked down at her leggings and sweatshirt. She had showered, but then got back into her loungewear. Her phone buzzed in her hand with a text message. How was the real estate agent? Harper had texted. Lila looked at Sonia, who walked into the kitchen. Who was your real estate agent again? Belinda Draper. Lila set the portfolio onto the counter, waiting for her mother to drill her for information. Did you find her on the internet, or did you actually do some research on this agent? Sonia opened the pleather cover. Even her blank stare was condescending. Lila bit her tongue so hard she could taste the blood. Biddy says hi. It was just smart enough for Sonia to smile. You should really think about updating your cabinets, Sonia said, walking around the marble kitchen island. Did you come for a reason? Lila snapped out. She wished just once her mother would break that icy exterior and talk about how she felt when the same thing had happened to her, when her husband had cheated on her. But that would mean Sonia would have to stop pretending, and Lila didn't think her mother had it in her to be real. I came to try to talk some sense into you, Sonia said, facing Lila. You don't have to sell the house. Your father and I gave this to you. I don't want any part of this house. Lila hated living here, hated what it symbolized, hated who she'd become in it. Then come back to our house, Sonia said. She had spoken to Harper in anticipation of this exact moment, how easy it would be to just say yes, keep living as comfortably as before, not having to sacrifice, and live off her father's money. No, Lila said. I have a place, like I told you. Lila, I can't have my daughter living above a bookstore. Sonia looked disgusted at the idea. What are people going to say? It's a bakery now more than a bookstore, Lila said knowing that her mother would only get aggravated by the comment. Sonia placed her hand on the counter and stared at Lila. I understand you're going through something. It's been a hard year for all of us. Hard for all of us? The words were out before Lila could stop them. Yes, all of us, Sonia looked indignant. Do you know what it's like to cancel a wedding these days? How much I put down on deposits? I had to call each of the guests individually to apologize. Lila stared at her mother, blinking hard at the tears that threatened to return. Don't look at me like that, Sonia said. Most mothers would make their daughter do it themselves, but I did it for you. I never complained. Let it go, Lila repeated in her head physically holding her mouth shut as her mother continued. Do you know how many people had to cancel their travel arrangements? Sonia asked Lila. Don't you think you should be upset with Joel for sleeping around? Lila couldn't hold back. What was her mother getting at? Look, I'm not sure where you're going with this, but it's not helping. Lila wanted to say something else entirely, but she had been good about biting her tongue on her father's extramarital affairs. She'd allow the big, fat elephant to block the view once again, as Sonia continued to ignore it entirely. What about one of those cute condos in Oak Bluffs? Sonia asked. Lila sighed loudly, annoyed to have this conversation again. Harper's father is getting married and has offered his apartment— do you know how hard it is to find a rental on Martha's Vineyard? Then keep the house, her mother said, almost pleading with her. Lila stared at her mother. The woman somehow looked slightly swollen, instead of younger, as Joel had promised with all the work he had done on her. Sonia Whitmore had been Dr. Schaefer's best plastic surgery client. Funny how beautiful Lila had always thought her mother looked, even before all the work. 
I heard you've invited your plastic surgeon to Christmas at the house in Palm Beach, Lila said. Christmas in Palm Beach had been one of the only holidays the Whitmore spent together as a family, just the four of them together, until she had started including Joel. Sonia made a face. What are you talking about? Lila almost rolled her eyes. Her parents had been pushing this relationship for years. A few little hiccups wouldn't change that. I heard about your Christmas plans with Joel at the luncheon. I didn't invite him to Palm Beach. Sonia looked incredulous. Did your father? Lila nodded, surprised by her mother's reaction. But Sonia said nothing more about the matter. Instead, she pursed her lips and looked completely neutral. Or fake. Lila shrugged, feeling pathetic that she was still waiting for the mother to come out in Sonia to show her daughter that she too was upset with her own husband for crossing the line, to stand up to him for once, to show that her daughter meant something to her. You know your father loves Joel, Sonia said, as though that answered the deep betrayal Lila felt. Then Lila thought of Andrew and how he would feel that the favored son-in-law was still in the picture. Good luck telling Andrew. Lila couldn't help but feel a little bit of pleasure seeing all that plastic surgery, unable to hide the fear in Sonia's eyes about her favorite child finding out the news. He would be furious, and Sonia knew it. Andrew had no trouble letting their mother know his feelings about things. It was probably why he was the favorite. All Lila had done her whole life was agree with her mother and follow the rules she'd set. And what had that gotten her? I'm stepping down from the board, Lila said. Don't be so dramatic. No one will care in a week. I don't want to be a part of it any longer. Lila looked at the glass of ward on the table. You can take that back. Sonia folded her arms across her chest. Lila, this isn't just about you. There will be people talking no matter what Joel and you are going through. Exactly, Lila said and I don't want them to be my friends anymore. Sonia just stood there. You can't be serious. You've been friends with these women your whole life. They are not friends, not true friends. Lila shook her head. True friends don't talk behind your back every chance they get. It'll pass, Sonia said, as if it really didn't matter. You need to grow thicker skin. Who cares what people say? They're supposed to be my friends. They're supposed to support me. Lila didn't understand what Sonia didn't get. I know that Harper and Biddy and... Please don't bring this up again, Sonia said, holding out her hands. She and I would not get along. Lila didn't understand why her mother refused to be friends with Biddy. Biddy's really awesome. Lila said. She loves Pops as much as we do. She's very good with your grandfather, but it's not a good idea to become friends with your employees. She's got a really nice set of friends. Lila had tried to encourage Sonia to accept an invitation to dinner with Pops and Biddy, but to no avail. Sonia recrossed her arms. I think it's best we stay professional, for Pops' sake. Lila didn't move from her spot against the counter. Well, I better start packing. I need to depersonalize the place. If you don't mind. You're kicking me out of the house I bought you? Sonia said. The shot felt cheaper than Sonia's usual remarks. Lila had to remind herself that her mom felt threatened. Lila wasn't accepting a man treating her like her father had treated Sonia for years. She was standing up for herself, no matter the consequences. So, Lila walked away. If her mother wasn't going to leave, she would continue on with what she needed to do, which was pack, even if she stayed. Chapter 6 Drake had only seen the ocean once, when his stepfather Richard had taken him and his mom to the Gulf of Mexico. He had remembered it being one of the happiest times in his entire life. That and having Drake Jr. 
now standing on a ferry in the middle of the Atlantic in December. Drake felt nothing but gray misery. Five more minutes, Drake said to his nine-year-old son, DJ. Only five? He whined as they stood with his newly purchased parka his grandmother had bought him, along with their plane and ferry tickets. Darlene didn't even fight when he had asked to take DJ to Martha's Vineyard for Christmas to visit the mother-in-law she had hated so much. Darlene had looked relieved to have one less child to take to her new boyfriend's house. Drake wished he had come to the island under better circumstances, but the longer he'd waited for things to get better, the more things seemed to fall apart. Luckily, Biddy had offered to pay for the tickets, because he wouldn't have been able to afford them otherwise. With him being laid off for the winter months, he wondered how long it would take for him to be completely broke. Okay, buddy, it's time, he said, shivering from the wet coldness seeping into his down coat. Let's get inside before you catch a cold. My teacher told us that's an old wise tale, DJ said. People associate the cold weather with illness, but it's really from being around germs and small indoor spaces because of the cold. We're more likely to stay away from colds if we stay out here. Drake stared at his brilliant son. How did a boy who wanted to play cowboys all day get to be such a smart little guy? I'm going to catch hypothermia if we stay out here, which is deadlier than a common cold from inside. DJ looked up at him, the spray from water bubbling on his glasses. That would be correct. Let's get you dry before you see your grandmother, he said. When was the last time I saw Grandmother Barbara? You know she goes by Grammy Biddy, Drake said. It's too childish, DJ said. I can't go around calling a woman who is probably wise, given her age, Grammy Biddy. Drake held back his eye roll. She'll whip you with a belt if you call her Barbara. But that's her legal name, DJ said. Yes, and your legal name is Drake, and we call you DJ. That's because I have no say in the matter, DJ said. I can't legally change my name until I'm 18 years old. But Grandmother Barbara has never legally changed her name. And she's much older than 18. I dare you to say that to her, Drake mumbled under his breath. But it was loud enough for DJ to hear. The kid was smart, but not smart enough to know not to answer a rhetorical question. Did you know there won't be a horn when we arrive at dock? DJ had moved on to another fun fact of fairy education. Today was fairies, yesterday was gray seals, and before that was the fishing industry on Martha's Vineyard. Drake couldn't remember what else DJ had been studying since finding out they were going to the island for Christmas. It's an obligation to signal your sound when boats go in reverse, DJ continued, especially large vessels. But only in movies do boats constantly use their horns. Harbors are said to be relatively quiet. Do you think they'll blow for show? Would you like me to see if there's another horn blast? Drake knew DJ worried about the noise. He had a huge aversion to loud noises, like a skittish horse on the 4th of July. A Kanaska crew member. Drake had tried calling before they arrived and got a kid at some information hotline who had no idea. I bet someone on the ship would know the answer. He walked DJ toward the center of the ferry, where he found an attendant wearing what looked like a captain's uniform. Excuse me, do you know if the ship will sound the horn when entering the port? Drake asked the man, but he shook his head. Only if there's another boat when entering, a woman said, standing next to them. She smiled down at DJ. Is this your first time on a ferry? DJ pulled out the pamphlet, ignoring her. DJ didn't talk to strangers. Yes, Drake answered for him. First time to the island. Her face lit up, and the woman clapped her hands together. Well, welcome to Martha's Vineyard. He smiled back at her, but had no desire to continue with the small chat. Make sure you stop at our local bakery and bookstore, right as we get to port. 
She put her hand on DJ's shoulder, and he jerked his body away hard. Don't let her touch me, he said loudly to Drake. The woman's hand went to her mouth. She looked horrified. Then she saw DJ looking at the pamphlet as if nothing had happened. She looked to Drake, seemingly waiting for an explanation of some kind, and an apology. Drake didn't know how to navigate this situation. What most people saw in this scenario was a kind woman and a bratty kid. But to DJ, this woman was a stranger. Her intentions were good, clearly. To Drake and the others on the ferry, she obviously wasn't dangerous. But to a kid like DJ, it didn't matter. He didn't even like his father touching him, let alone some woman he'd never met putting her hand on his shoulder. Drake didn't apologize. Let's find somewhere to sit, okay? He said to DJ, who had a map of Martha's Vineyard now open with the pamphlet. The woman smacked her mouth shut as they walked past her. Do you remember the circumference of Martha's Vineyard? DJ asked. 124 miles, Drake said, ushering his son to a bench at the front of the boat. DJ loved to quiz Drake. With? That's a trick question, Drake said. Why? Because it could be from two to ten miles wide, depending on where we are. Drake smiled to himself for remembering that information from the plane ride. That is correct. DJ looked at him suspiciously. And how wide is it at Grandmother Barbara's? It's six miles wide as the crow flies at Grammy Biddy's house, Drake said. He gave DJ a look. Can you please call her Grammy Biddy? DJ looked indignant. No, that's a silly name. Why? Of all the things DJ dug his heels in about, this was one of the weirdest. Because it's an adjective to describe size, and it's wrong. Oh dear, Drake thought to himself. Please don't call Grammy Biddy large. But look, DJ, you're really smart, right? Drake didn't have to remind him. But in this area, you still need to study. What area? DJ asked, looking concerned and interested at the same time. Women. Drake pointed to a bench for the two of them and sat down. He leaned back and put his arm around DJ careful to just lightly touch the collar of his son's shirt. I'm not the smartest either, but one thing I do know is you call them by the name they choose and never ever tell them they're large. But Grandmother Barbara is over six feet tall, which is larger than the average woman. DJ spoke so authoritatively, always justifying his answer with evidence and an explanation. Take my word on this one, Drake said. Never call a woman large, no matter what the facts tell you. Drake wondered what Biddy looked like now that two years had passed. Even as she'd grown older, she had been more beautiful than the average woman. As a little boy, he'd noticed men's heads turn as she walked by. By middle school, his friends would drool while staring at her. By high school, he'd stopped inviting his friends over. When he dated girls, they would be jealous or envious. He even knew one girl who couldn't stop comparing her beauty to his mom's. Darlene had hated her for it. He was a latchkey kid. His mom worked full-time as a nurse and did what she had to do to provide for him. She had been a wonderful mother in that way. She would work day and night, having friends watch him or having him sleep over at people's houses. She would attend his games and school events, she would bring him to his grandfather's ranch for a week in the summer. She never complained about sleeping on the couch while he got the only bedroom. She never once said no to any of his requests. She had been a wonderful mother. The only fault his mother had was men. I see land! DJ pulled out the binoculars he had insisted on bringing with him. He got up and walked to the window, which was covered in dried salt and grime. Through the gray mist and fog sat a bare, snow-covered island with gray shingled buildings. He thought about what the lady had said about the horn. 
I bet they'll blow the... A loud warning horn came from above. DJ dropped the binoculars and covered his ears. Drake heard the glass breaking as they hit the ferry's floor. He closed his eyes for the incoming storm. My binoculars! DJ screamed in panic. The tantrum was about to begin. Drake opened his eyes and knelt down as slowly and calmly as he could. It's okay. We can get you another pair. But these are from the Audubon Society Club, he yelled at Drake. Drake looked around at the people watching. He picked up the binoculars as DJ went to grab them out of his hands. Whoa there, easy boy, he said, laying on his accent. They were outsiders on that ferry, and he wanted the people looking at them to know. We don't go around yelling at each other. DJ's eyes were suddenly furious at Drake for not letting go of the binoculars. Give them to me! Drake could see the woman DJ insulted earlier make a face of disapproval. He wondered how his mother would react to these situations with DJ. His breakdowns and behavior, the things the school found alarming and the red flags, the ticks and the persistence, the rude remarks and the cold personality. The glass is broken. You could hurt yourself, Drake said, trying as hard as possible to stay calm. We need to clean up the mess. He almost said your mess, but the pronoun would have triggered DJ into another fit. The last thing he needed was to start the visit with his mother having the same old argument. How about a donut before we see Grandma Biddy? Drake whispered to DJ. DJ let go of the binoculars. I want the strawberry frosted with sprinkles. With the crisis somewhat averted, Drake bought DJ a donut and then stood at the windows, watching the ferry navigate its way to port. As they disembarked, his heart raced inside his chest. He had never been so nervous to see his mother. They had never gone this long without seeing or communicating with each other. Should he apologize right off the bat and start things fresh? Let go of the anger and hurt? Or maybe she'd apologize for how things went. They were both as wrong as they were right. All he knew was that he didn't want to fight anymore. He didn't want time to pass like it had and lose more of it. When they disembarked, DJ didn't even look for Biddy, but Drake saw her right away, like he always did. He couldn't help but rush toward her like a kid who had missed his mom while away at summer camp. He dropped their suitcase and wrapped his arms around her. Hi, Mom, he said, and he held her in his arms. For the first time in his life, Biddy Lightfoot was speechless. She didn't say anything for a solid minute or more, as they stood hugging each other. He could feel her pulling herself together. My, 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 Biddy said as she let go of Drake's embrace. Look who's a young man. She put her arms out to DJ, but he was still fixated on the map of Martha's Vineyard. Where exactly is your house located on this map? It was a split second, maybe not even a split second, but long enough for Drake to see Biddy's disapproval, just like the woman on the ferry, the look that had started the last fight two years ago between her and Darlene. Right about here, Biddy pointed to the map, and Drake noticed how close to the water the house seemed to be located. Is it on the water? He asked. She shook her head. But there's a mighty fine view. He grabbed his luggage. Well, thanks for picking us up and everything else. DJ has really looked forward to being on an island. Biddy smiled, genuinely happy to see them, he knew. He knew his mother loved him and DJ with all her heart. Did you know Martha's Vineyard was originally inhabited by the Wampanoag people? DJ said. Yes, you know there's a lovely museum that we can visit sometime, Biddy said as they began to walk out of the ferry station. As they stepped out the doors, the wind picked up and blew DJ's map out of his hands. My map! DJ ran straight into the middle of the parking lot. Biddy grabbed hold of his down jacket and pulled him back. Let go of me! DJ screamed at her, and Biddy immediately let go. 
He ran to the empty parking space where his map flew and picked it up. Biddy looked at Drake, her mouth ajar, bewildered by his reaction. You let him run into parking lots? No. Drake took the map out of DJ's hands. He knew two things at that point. One, DJ was going to lose it. And two, so would Biddy. Chapter 7 Lila had never been instantly attracted to any man until Drake Lightfoot walked through the door. Lila had forgotten about the arrival of Biddy's son. She had thought he'd look more like a boy, not a rugged cowboy ready to ride off into the sunset. His accent made her knees wobble. Lo, he said, giving Lila a handshake and a nod. This is my son, DJ. He turned to DJ and said, DJ, this is Grammy Biddy's friend, Lila. Lila extended her hand out to the handsome young boy. He looked at it, but did not return the gesture. Fist bump? Lila asked. He looked at his father, who gave a nod, and then reluctantly extended his fist out to hers. Less germs, she said. He nodded, as if he understood the feeling. Handshaking is a bit primitive, in my opinion. He gave her a hard nod and stepped back. She then extended her fist to Biddy's gorgeous cowboy son. How do you do? He looked to DJ, then back to Lila, as if they were both crazy, and fist bumped her. How's it going? Good, good, she said. Not sure what she would say to this man who was a mix of Clint Eastwood and John Wayne. Men didn't look like that on Martha's Vineyard. Welcome to the island. Her voice came out frothy and childish at the same time. She felt like a complete idiot. He nodded but said nothing as he looked round Pop's house. They all stood in the foyer, except for Pop's, who sat at the television. Don't tell me you're a Cowboys fan, Pop said to the man. I'd rather shoot myself in the foot than root for the Cowboys, Drake said. No, sir, we root for the Chiefs. Pops huffed. We watch the Patriots in this house, Pop said, eyeing the kid. My dad says the Patriots are cheaters because of an incident called Deflategate, which is a play on words from the Nixon Watergate scandal, DJ said in one long, quick sentence. Lila snuck a peek at Pops to see his reaction. He tilted his head and gave a nod of his own. Welcome to the island, son. Lila noticed a smile form on Biddy's lips, a mixture of pride and humor. Pops went right back to the football game. Why don't you watch a game and I'll grab you a drink, Biddy said to Drake. I can bring your things to your room. Drake walked to the window in the family room where Pops watched the game. It overlooked the water and was one of the best views in all of Martha's Vineyard. Each year, a contractor would show up at his doorstep begging to purchase the house. Even Sonia had offered to pay him an astronomical amount of money, but he had turned them all down. You have an amazing spot here. Drake looked at Biddy as she pulled his luggage toward the door. Come on, DJ. I'll show you where you put your map. Biddy winked at DJ, whose head was stuck inside a topography map of the island. Did you know that islanders would turn off the lighthouse's lights, put up a decoy to make the ships crash into the rocky coast, and plunder the wreckage? DJ said to no one in particular. They're called moon cussers, Pops said to the boy. I've got a book about it, right there. Yes, that's right. The boy pointed to the information that he read. It has something to do with having no moonlight. The darker the night, the better. Pops pointed to the shelf next to the fireplace. Pull that one out with a black spine. Martha's Vineyard yesterday and today. DJ pulled out the book and opened its cover. It has a map! Be careful, Pops warned the boy. DJ nodded seriously. I will, sir, believe me. I know how important it is to keep records like this in pristine condition to pass on to others. I like this boy, Pops said, 
and turned up the volume. DJ took the book to the coffee table next to Pop's chair and opened the book up so it could have both front and back covers lay upon the table. The book had to weigh at least a few pounds or more. It was about two feet long and at least a foot and a half wide. It had been one of Pop's treasures, and only with permission were the grandkids able to see it. Lila knew she should go, give Biddy and her son time to catch up, but she didn't. Instead, she said, What can I get you to drink? Must have been a long flight. Give this man a beer, Pop said. Drake held up his hand. No thanks. It produces serious side effects throughout most of your major organs, DJ said. It can damage your heart, causing cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias, high blood pressure, and even strokes. Lila noticed Drake took in a deep breath, one she had seen her brother take when she got on his nerves. Not to mention the damage it can do to your liver and pancreas. It's been proven it can cause cancer. Skin damage. Okay, buddy. We all get it. Drake looked at Lila. I'd love a water. Lila gave him a sympathetic smile, but then let out a laugh. She liked the little father and son duo. They were a total juxtaposition. The father, a rugged cowboy, with a kid genius with his head in the books. I can show you where we keep the water, she said to Drake. Just let me know. Drake whispered a silent thank you and turned his attention back to the game on the television. Lila walked into the kitchen and saw Biddy coming out of her apartment. Biddy, you didn't tell me your son's a hottie. Biddy laughed, letting out a whoop. Yes, I suppose he's rather handsome. I couldn't keep the girls away once he grew a mustache. Well, I guess he got that from his mama. Biddy hooked a fist onto her hip and looked out at the men sitting in the family room. He's got a big old heart, but women were always his problem. Biddy kept her eyes on him through the open doorway. I guess he got that from me as well. She said aloud, but Lila had a feeling she was talking to herself. Are you sleeping in the other bedrooms? Lila asked wondering how the sleeping arrangements would work. Biddy shook her head. No, nah, they're sleeping on the pullout. They can take the boys' room, Lila said. Her uncles hadn't been back in years to visit. As callous of a mother as Sonia could be, she did at least take care of her father. She wondered if Pops had given Biddy a hard time about them staying, or if he wished the same thing would happen to him, have his son visit with his grandchild at the house, and have to make arrangements for everyone to sleep. You should take them to the Christmas market days down in the village, Lila said. Everything is draped with Christmas lights and decorated. That's a great idea. Biddy opened the refrigerator and pulled out a plate of dips. I've got a ton of food for the game. Why don't you stay and get to know everyone? I don't want to intrude, Lila said. But something made her want to stay. Besides the fact that Drake was this mysterious, handsome stranger, she had nowhere to go and no one to hang out with. After her stunt at the luncheon, she was sure her so-called friends had gone to Team Abigail. Harper was with her dad at the hospital, and Andrew was with her. Oh my God, she thought to herself. Her best friends were her grandfather and his nurse. I feel like I'm intruding on you and your family she said. Heavens no, Biddy said, pulling out another tray of food. Renee made us finger foods. Lila's mouth immediately watered at the tiny pastries filled with cremes and fruit. Tell me you have her mocha mix. It had become her favorite winter drink since meeting Renee and discovering her bakery, a chocolate mix that made the best afternoon mocha slash coffee slash hot cocoa. Lila loved it. She packed it with everything. Biddy held up a glass jar. They look amazing. Lila couldn't wait to try one. Take this out to the boys, will you? Biddy said as she turned to the oven and started hitting the buttons. Lila grabbed the platter of pastries and brought them to the family room. She set them down in between Pops and Drake on the side table. Wow, when did Biddy start baking? Drake said, 
leaning over and grabbing a pastry. This is from our friend's bakery, Lila said. She moved to the island about a year ago and makes everything herself. He popped a tiny creme-filled pastry into his mouth. That's amazing. She does a real good job, that Renee, Biddy said, coming in with another tray. Is that Big Papa's salsa? Drake pushed the book down to make room. Hey, DJ said, swiping his arm at the bowl of salsa in Biddy's hand. DJ, Biddy yelled, pulling the bowl out of his reach just in time. That is not acceptable behavior. DJ stared Biddy down, his face indignant, his eyebrows burrowed. The grammar school kid looked like he wanted to throw the bowl now. It's my fault, Drake began. I should have told DJ I was going to move the book to make room. That's not how we talk to an adult, Biddy scolded the boy. DJ's face brightened into a shade of cherry tomato. You almost ruined a nonfiction informational text about this island. Young man, you don't speak to your grandmother like that, Pop said in his judge tone, authoritative and somehow also demanding instant respect. DJ looked at Drake, whose eyebrow rose, but he didn't make a move. DJ got up, his lip wobbly. I didn't even want to stay at this old man's house. He ran to the door and Drake groaned as he got up. He's always anxious about traveling. Sorry about the behavior. Lila suddenly felt bad for the boy. She understood what it was like to be in front of people who had an opinion. She decided to follow Drake, grabbing her coat and the little boys, as she made her way to the front door. The two stood on the front stoop. I'm not going back in there, DJ said. That man is mean. I want to go home. Drake's head dropped. Come on, DJ. It's freezing out here. No, I'm not going back in there. DJ faced the street, but didn't step out from under the cover of the front walkway. Lila opened the screen door and walked out with DJ's coat. Here, thought you might need this. DJ didn't turn around. Drake grabbed it. Thanks. She didn't move, unsure what to say, but something made her want to help. One time, Pops yelled at me when I took candy out of that glass jar on the bookshelf because I didn't ask for permission first. He's really set on rules. It's because he was a judge and had to deal with people who broke the rules all the time. Lila had volunteered at the elementary school for years. One thing she understood about kids was that they needed explanations about rules. They needed to know the why. He's also big on respecting your elders, Lila explained. This didn't seem to make a difference with DJ. I want to go home. He's had a long day, Drake said, his accent thick but clear enough for her to know he didn't need or want her help. Sure, Lila said. She turned to the door when Drake stepped in front of her and opened it for her. In all her days with Joel, she never remembered him doing something like that. He never opened doors or pulled out chairs or did that thing with his hand on the small of her back when leading her into a room. Joel had hardly ever waited for her. Thanks. Lila didn't know what her heart was thinking as it pumped light and fast, but Lila's head was stuck in his deep caramel eyes. I should go home, she said, immediately stepping into the house and grabbing her purse. Thanks, Biddy. Love you, Pops. She didn't make eye contact as she pounded past Drake, who also came inside. She plowed past DJ on the stoop, teeth chattering, hurried directly to her car, and left. Chapter 8 Evelyn held Charlie's hand as he came out of surgery. Like the doctor had said, everything went smoothly. She wondered if Charlie's heart attack had been a cruel joke or a generous second chance. A heart attack two weeks before their wedding. Two weeks. She couldn't help but think about her late husband, George. What if he had survived his heart attack? Would he have slowed down? Would he have changed his life like she had hers? Had George known about his health? Charlie turned his head, 
dozing and waking up off and on since he'd come back from the recovery room. You're still here? Charlie said. Where do I have to go? She said, realizing there was an edge in her tone. Of course I'm going to stay here. His look became concerned, and Evelyn instantly felt guilty. I'm sorry, she said again. She shook her head. I'm making this about me. He reached out for her hand. I'm going to be fine. The worst is over. I just can't lose you, too, she said, choking up right away. The tears had been merciless, her emotions completely unstable. One minute she was strong, the next a mess. I can't be blindsided either. Charlie had confessed to feeling tired after taking out the trash, having to stop and catch his breath climbing the stairs, and feeling pain in his arm once in a while. He had said nothing and ignored it. I'm going to be fine, Charlie said for the hundredth time. Now you have a better version of me. There is no better version, Evelyn said, taking his hand. That's why I want you to stick around. I'll be better at taking care of myself, he said. Better at eating and exercising. And managing stress, she said. You need to not worry about burdening others. That's what relationships are all about. We take on each other's worries together. Charlie nodded. I'll get better about that. He looked at her, his eyes tender. I am sorry I put you through this. Evelyn squeezed his hand and kissed him. I just love you so much. I don't want anything to happen to you. Evelyn wanted to go through all his things. Charlie had been so stubborn about doing everything himself. His banking, the mortgage on his building, insurance, etc. She thought it had been a pride thing. But now she worried it was more than that. Was Charlie hiding more that he didn't want to worry her with? Evelyn now wished she'd done things earlier, like switch insurances and combine their finances. Healthcare is very different when your insurance covers your healthcare costs. Knock, knock, Harper said as the door opened. She and Andrew came into the room. We're here to tell Evelyn to go home and get some rest. I'm good, Evelyn said. She wasn't going to leave Charlie. She squeezed Charlie's hand. You're stuck with me. The best way to be, he said. How about you tell Lila the apartment's ready, Evelyn said to Harper. Charlie sat up. Are you saying you want me to move in? Well, I figure what's two weeks, she smiled, but took his hand, cradling it in hers. I want to take care of you. Evelyn felt selfish suddenly. She had wanted to wait to live together. She hadn't lived with a man for over six years. She hadn't had to share her bed or her space. She had been the one to make the decisions about everything, down to the outlets. But now all she wanted was Charlie by her side. I'll bring some stuff to the house tonight, Harper said. Lila wants out of her house bad. Andrew, who looked a bit intimidated around Charlie, handed over a small wrapped box. What's this? Charlie asked. I have a friend who makes these, Andrew said. Charlie tore the paper away and pulled off the top of the small, slender box. Inside sat a pen sculpted from a stone. It's gorgeous. I saw it on the way here and thought of you, Andrew said. It had been a thoughtful gift. Evelyn smiled at the gesture. She liked the young man who was head over heels in love with Harper. Thank you, Charlie said, holding the box in his hand. Charlie didn't seem to like Andrew as much as all the women, but Evelyn knew no one, not even a prince, would be okay for his little girl. Evelyn could read his cues by now. Charlie also didn't like to be fussed about or be the center of attention. She stood up and said to Andrew, Let's check out the coffee selection here. Harper jabbed her thumb behind her. There's a coffee station on the main floor. Evelyn kissed Charlie on the forehead. I'll be back, my love. 
He took hold of her hand, pulled her to his lips, and kissed her. Thank you, he whispered. She dragged Andrew behind her, leaving Charlie and Harper alone for a moment. She didn't know anything about the young journalist, other than the fact that he could write well and was at the beginning of a big career in investigative journalism. But from what Biddy had told them, his family was nothing like him. The mother sounded uppity and snobbish, the father egotistical and abrasive. They sounded more like the villains in her books than this nice kid's parents. They walked down to the elevator and she hit the button. She noticed her hands were shaking. You okay? Andrew asked. She nodded, taking in a breath. Still a bit anxious from the surgery. Maybe we should look for a margarita bar rather than coffee, he said with a smile. Evelyn let out a laugh, and it felt good. She could laugh now. The worst was over. She looked up to Harper's new boyfriend with gratitude. They stood in silence as the elevator traveled down to the main floor. What have you been working on these days? He shifted his posture, standing a bit less formal. Writing was the common ground between them and made the shy guy a bit more comfortable. I'm following this story about an attorney that was just brought up on charges of fraud, but it looks as though this is just the tip of the iceberg. Evelyn instantly became interested. Is he out on bail or being held in jail? He's being held. But I think he's the scapegoat. And there are way bigger fish out there, Andrew said. This drew more curiosity from Evelyn. Really? Andrew smiled, lifting his eyebrows. Do you remember the players I talked about last time we talked? I do, she said, stepping closer even though they were the only two in the elevator. Well, let's just say one of the players is willing to sit down with me, Andrew said. Then, as the elevator stopped on the main floor, he turned to her and asked, Do you think I should leave the hospital? Evelyn shook her head. No, you're here for Harper. She patted the back of his shoulder, wondering how long it would take Charlie and Andrew to get over the awkwardness at this point. She really liked Andrew and thought Charlie was missing out on a nice relationship. He swept out his hand to let her off the elevator first. The coffee cart is on the left. There on the main level was a coffee cart, manned by a young girl in a hospital volunteer shirt. Hey, Mr. Whitmore, the young lady said, looking up from her phone. Hey, Ava, you work in the coffee cart today? Yep. She set her phone down. What can I get you in? She looked hard at Evelyn. I'd love a tea, actually, Evelyn said to the young volunteer. Sure, I can definitely do teas. Ava pulled out a bin of different tea bags and let Evelyn pick one. I'll take a tea as well, Andrew said. Two hot waters coming up. Ava moved to the jug that was plugged into the wall. That'll be five dollars. Five dollars, Andrew said, but he was clearly joking. That's the story I should write. Hospitals ask volunteers to charge five dollars for hot water. And the two tea bags, Ava said, smiling. Andrew nodded as he handed her some cash. Tell your mom and dad I said hi. Ava handed them paper cups without lids. We'll do. Evelyn noticed as they dipped their tea bags into the hot water that Andrew knew a lot of the staff. You know everyone. Yes, Andrew said. You know everyone when you grow up here on the island. Evelyn had noticed it was more than just knowing his neighbors. You seem to really know people, like beyond from growing up. Andrew sighed. Lila's been volunteering here for years. She ran the coffee cart along with the gift shop, front desk, you name it. Lila volunteers everywhere, Evelyn said, remembering seeing her at the library and even the VFW at Thanksgiving serving meals. She used to come here a lot because of him, Andrew mumbled. Evelyn had heard all about the broken engagement, the constant betrayal, and the public embarrassment over dinners on Sunday nights. She enjoyed Lila as much as she enjoyed Andrew, and so did Harper. Lila and Harper had gotten rather close over the past few months. She could tell Lila's twin brother worried about her. 
You know, Lila seems to be doing well under the circumstances, Evelyn said. She's going to come out on top. You watch. Andrew nodded. Lila usually does. As they walked back to the elevator, silence grew between them. Evelyn's stomach began to twist, her anxiety rising up her legs again. She didn't want to see Charlie sitting in a hospital bed, hooked up to tubes and machines. She had already seen enough of that with Wanda. Was this what getting older was going to be like? Sitting around, watching each other fall apart? Evelyn could feel the floor beneath her feet slightly sway as she focused on the button to the elevator. Tell Charlie I need to grab something from my car, she said, as the elevator doors opened. Andrew grabbed one door. Do you want me to wait for you? She had started walking toward the closest exit of the hospital. No, I'll be fine. She hadn't even driven there. She just needed to get out, right away. She needed fresh air. She needed to gather herself. She needed to figure things out. Chapter 9 Drake didn't know what to do with himself at the house. He had only been on the island for 12 hours, and his mother was acting as if things were exactly the same as they always were between them. She lived across the country with a man old enough to be her father, and she worked as the help, which really wasn't different than when she'd been married to Richard. He grabbed himself another cup of coffee and walked to the window in the kitchen, looking out at the water. Sure is pretty. Mm-hmm, Biddy said from her spot at the table before drinking from her cup. She shared the Boston Globe newspaper with DJ. Do you think I could meet him? DJ asked. Biddy had pointed out Randy's successful grandson who wrote for the paper. Of course, Biddy said enthusiastically. I'm surrounded by people who write. DJ looked absolutely pleased by this. Finally, a man DJ might respect, Drake thought. What DJ liked most of all were books. Big books, small books, fiction, nonfiction, informational, expository, ads. DJ will read it over and over and over again. Drake heard the front door open along with squeaks of rubbery heels walking across the tile floors. Too thick of plastic to be high heels, but too soft to be cowboy boots. Darlene had loved to wear heels out with her friends. Never for him. She did look good in them. No wonder men hadn't noticed the diamond ring around her finger. Just when he swore it was Darlene, he swung around and saw Randy's granddaughter striding into the kitchen. Her long, sandy blonde hair fell down her back in perfect tendrils. Her outfit fit her expensively. She had more light reflecting off her bling than the sun off the ocean. He had never seen this kind of money before, even when Richard's ex-wife had come for a visit. Good morning, the woman sing-songed. Hi, DJ. Drake turned around, checking out DJ's reaction. Good morning he said back, not looking up from the plate of eggs he was managing to eat. Biddy hadn't prepared his eggs as over-easy as he'd like them. I heard you're into maps, Lila said. DJ looked at Drake as though he had revealed a secret, but Drake held up his hands. I didn't say anything. Biddy wiggled her eyebrows at DJ, but it did nothing to garner any attention from him. Instead, he still eyed the near stranger suspiciously. Drake turned back to the view of the water to hide his eye roll, but he kept his focus on the conversation happening behind him. He had to give it to this lady. Most people avoided DJ. His moody behavior, his eccentric quirks that made people uncomfortable, and his way of making everyone feel dumber than him. Drake loved his son with all his heart but he had a feeling this conversation would end very badly. She had no idea what she'd gotten herself into. I do like maps, DJ finally said. Well, I know there are some really cool maps down in the village library that show the topography of the ocean floor, she said. Dang. Drake instantly turned around again. Was this woman an angel? 
How'd she know that was exactly what he'd want to see? I could go now, DJ said, closing the business section and making sure he folded it up correctly, just like Randy had asked him to do before letting him read. DJ made sure to explain to Randy that Drake didn't provide adequate reading material at home. It doesn't open until ten, but if you want to go, I'm happy to take you and your dad. She looked to Drake and smiled. But only if that's okay with you. I thought we could all take a walk on the beach, Biddy said. Why? DJ asked. The seals love to sunbathe in the morning on the beach in the winter. Would you like to walk with Grammy Biddy and her friends? No, thank you. DJ picked up a new section of the newspaper. Biddy tilted her head. Oh, I was really looking forward to showing you. Lila sat down at the table next to DJ. They're really cute to watch. They're also the reason why there are so many sharks around the New England coast, DJ said. The seals. Lila made a face and looked at Drake. More of a book kind of a kid, huh? DJ made a confused look, scrunching his eyebrows together. He didn't get her, but he also didn't get Drake, or anyone for that matter. Drake wasn't sure if DJ had a single person in his entire life that got him either. He had no friends. He had teachers that seemed to tolerate him in class, but no one connected with him. Darlene didn't understand him most of the time. And Drake, well, he seemed to be the only person who could figure him out. But Lila had nailed it right on the head. DJ was definitely a book kid. DJ was the kid that would rather read about the seals or the beach or its topography than get his hands and feet dirty in the sand or water. He hated loud noises, crowded places, most animals, except large animals like cows or horses. He read all day, every day, even when he was supposed to be doing other things like math or chores or church. No matter where he was, he always had a book hidden somewhere. DJ liked to read, but he liked to study more. He loved images along with his reading, whether it was a photograph of a place or person, a drawing or map, or a table or diagram. He studied it over and over and over, just like the chart on the front page of the business section DJ studied at that moment. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration will be there collecting data, Lila said, picking up the real estate page. DJ tilted his head. It was just vague enough to catch his interest. Drake watched the interaction from his counter in the kitchen. What kind of study? DJ asked, as more of a demand and in hard syllables. This didn't seem to deter the pretty woman. The female seals give birth to their pups this time of year. The scientists document and check the health of the new population. Drake hoped this adventure wouldn't end up with him having to have the birds and the bees talk. Why do you paint your face like that? DJ asked her. You remind me of a clown. Lila's mouth dropped. DJ! Biddy scolded him. Drake dropped his head, then set down his coffee and held up his hands in surrender. I'm sorry. He doesn't think before he speaks. DJ kept studying her as if nothing he said was wrong. I just wondered why, he said. Drake knew he did want to know why. He wasn't trying to be insulting. He legitimately wanted to know why. She feels pretty wearing it, Biddy answered. Lots of people like wearing something that makes them feel good about themselves. I think it makes her look weird. DJ, Drake shouted. Enough. The room silenced. Then from the other side of the room, Randy appeared. Young man, you do not speak to a woman like that. DJ's face twisted with confusion, and Drake dropped his head. Why? DJ looked to Drake, completely unaware of how insulting he had been, and why he was being scolded for it. DJ, why don't you go clean up? Drake said. DJ pulled another section of the paper out from the stack. 
I'm not finished reading. Now, DJ. Drake used his deepest and most stern voice. DJ's eyes immediately flooded with tears. His father didn't usually yell. Drake groaned. DJ didn't get why his dad was mad at him and why everyone in the room was staring at him. Yes, sir. When DJ was out of earshot, he turned to Lila, who was staring at the table. I'm really sorry, Drake said. Oh, it's okay, she said back quickly. It's none of my business, Randy began to say. Drake shot a look at Biddy. She hadn't told them about DJ. She obviously hadn't told them how Drake was very protective of his son, even to the point of ruining his marriage because of it. He cracked his knuckles as he waited for the judgment to come from the Honorable Judge Randy. What's his school like? Randy asked. This question took Drake back. Excuse me? Well, he's very intelligent. But sometimes schools aren't equipped for kids like DJ, said Randy. For kids like DJ? Drake could feel his defenses rise. He grabbed hold of the counter, and Biddy slanted her eyes his way, her warning loud and clear. Randy nodded. Mm hmm Someone that smart needs a special kind of education, a place where they can help him, Randy said. Does his school have programs for gifted children? Drake shook his head. As far as he knew, the school was decent. But he wasn't signing up to volunteer, he supposed. So he only knew what DJ had told him, which was that it was not good, like everything else to DJ. Extra typical elementary classroom. He's only nine? Randy said it more to himself, like it was a surprising fact. He might need kids around who get him. People who get him. Like Lila. She's great with kids like DJ. Strike two. Drake tensed his jaw. What Pops is trying to say is that I volunteer with children who have special gifts. If anyone said special again, it would be strike three. Look. He's just in a new spot, at Christmas, in a stranger's home. He spoke as slowly and as calmly as possible, but he could feel his heart pumping hard. His hands would shake if he unclenched the counter. You must be very proud of him, Lila said. At first, Drake wondered if she was being sarcastic after being insulted, but there was a genuineness to her voice. She played with her phone spinning it around in circles on the wooden table. He knows exactly what he wants and who he is. How many kids even know what they want for lunch? She opened her phone, and he noticed there was a picture of her and a man who smiled brighter than the sun. They looked happy together, like a couple in those toothpaste commercials. Were they sitting on a boat? Where was he now? Sorry again, he said bouncing off the counter, feeling calmer than before. She waved him off. Not at all. Kids say the darndest things. Maybe teach him that being right isn't always kind, Randy said under his breath. Strike three. He let go of the counter. Okay, Biddy stood up, clapping her hands in a loud slap. I think you should see the seals and get some fresh air. Randy's more than capable of watching DJ. Go, Drake said. I'll stay. Pop still has his highway almanacs from the 70s in his office. Lila pointed to the other room. I bet DJ would love seeing the different roads. Drake stared at the beauty. Dang shame she already had Mr. Perfect. Not that a guy like Drake Lightfoot would ever have a chance with someone like her. Chapter 10 I feel like he's from a Western, Lila whispered at Harper on the couch at Seaview. All the women except Evelyn sat together in the room off the kitchen. Was he wearing chaps? Harper joked. No, but a very sexy pair of Levi's and cowboy boots, like actual cowboy boots. 
Lila covered her mouth so Biddy, who sat across the room, couldn't hear or read her lips. He's wicked hot. Harper jabbed her elbow into Lila's ribs. Why don't you make him your Christmas gift this year and ask him out on a date? He's Biddy's son, Lila shook her head. Plus, he's going through a divorce. I didn't say marry him, Harper winked. Lila jabbed Harper back in her own ribs, but notice Harper lose train of thought and stare off. Lila reached over and pinched her elbow as she bit her nails. You doing okay? Harper nodded. I just can't believe he's had a heart attack. He's in good hands, Lila said. She had been in the hospital enough times to see how well heart patients like Charlie did after surgery. Martha's Vineyard Hospital has some of the best heart specialists on the East Coast. Harper smiled reassuringly. I know. He's going to have a new lease on life if he does what he needs to do to stay healthy. Lila had seen some patients come back for another stint, or worse, but not often. My dad is just stubborn. I feel like all men are, Lila said. Not Andrew, Harper shook her head. Barf, Lila said, rolling her eyes at the same time. Get a room, Harper shrugged. He isn't. Wanda arrived in a long down jacket that almost touched the floor. She didn't remove the Arctic coat, but plopped down next to Biddy on the other couch. How's the visit with Drake going? Lila noticed Biddy's eyes flashed a look, almost like a plea to say nothing. And Lila smiled, looking instead at Harper's bracelet, which Andrew had purchased. It's been great, Biddy exclaimed. DJ's the sweetest little thing ever. Lila couldn't help but widen her eyes at Biddy's description. Biddy loved her grandson, no doubt. But no one would say that about DJ. He was smart, he was handsome, he was inquisitive, but he wasn't the sweetest ever. You should have had them join us to see the seals, Wanda said. Biddy crossed her legs and clasped her hands over her knees as her foot bobbed up and down. They're awfully tired from all the traveling. Maybe tomorrow. Lila could feel the need to tell someone the truth. Back in the day, her opinion would have already been shared by now. But Biddy didn't need her thoughts on the matter. Lila knew what others' opinions did to someone's happiness. No, Lila would learn to listen and support. If Biddy wanted to talk about Drake and DJ, she would. Until then, Lila would stay out of it. This is a really nice idea, Harper, Biddy said, changing the subject. To have us all meet Evelyn for a walk. She's been at the hospital day and night, Harper said. Walking will allow her to talk about things and open up, Biddy said. She must have been so frightened to see Charlie like that, Wanda said. Harper, how have you been feeling? Harper shrugged. I feel like this was a weird blessing. He obviously needed a wake-up call. He's always been bad with food and exercising. I mean, he walks the dog, but he's lackadaisical, stopping to look at the water or to pick up shells or collect more sea glass or stop and write a scene. If I didn't shove pastries down his throat, maybe he wouldn't have had the heart attack. Renee looked upset. I mean, I make him try everything. Oh, Renee, Harper said. Pastries aren't his problem. He's had heart trouble for a few years. Let's focus on the blessing, Biddy said. Charlie had a wake-up call at the best possible time, if you ask me. Now he can focus all his energy on being happy. Look, Evelyn's home, Wanda said from her vantage point. Lila didn't get up like everyone else, feeling a bit like a trespasser in this very intimate setting. Yet, she also felt extremely privileged to be included in it. The motley crew of women greeted their mother and friend at the door with gratitude and graciousness. They all showed their concern for Evelyn, who looked tired and worn out. Each of the women sincerely appeared to care about Evelyn's well-being, 
and one another's. It was incredible. Her whole life, the women around her had plotted against or talked about one another and were pleased when another failed so they could gossip to another friend. Nothing was a secret. Her mother trusted no one, not even Lila. Who wants a Bloody Mary? Evelyn asked. Heck yeah, Biddy said in her southern drawl, which Lila had begun to love at times like this. Biddy, who held a high standard of all things at the house and with herself, would let loose occasionally. Lila admired Biddy, the way she carried herself, even though she clearly had troubles. She never appeared sad or depressed. She never complained, always listened, always offered help and smiled. She was welcoming, even though sometimes Lila was certain she had overstayed and overtalked. She was nothing like Sonia. Biddy never bought anything for herself, not even special groceries. She rarely went out, and never to dinner unless it was on Pops. She didn't buy clothes, or do anything special like facials or manis and petties. She didn't wear much makeup at all, but she always looked fabulous. A stunning beauty, even in her sixties. Unlike Sonia, she had embraced her age letting her hair go silver. She didn't inject her face to pretend she didn't have wrinkles. Her chin looked great, but like any 60-year-old, it sagged just a bit. Sonia didn't sag. She was so tight she could hardly even smile naturally. Lila had held out on any form of work, injections, tucks, pulls, and surgeries. Her friends had already gotten nose jobs and other small procedures through Joel. Joel had said Lila didn't need any work done. But he'd said, if she ever thought about it, she should start with some Botox along her crow's feet and the creases along her forehead. He warned her about smiling too much and drinking from straws. I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick, Lila said, scooting off the couch as the women discussed how they needed to encourage Charlie to join their walks. Maybe we should get the guys to start a walking group, Wanda said. Lila got up, thinking about Pops and walking. He used to be so active before the falls. He had loved to garden, drive his boat, and take walks by the beach. The last time she remembered being with him at the beach was when her grandmother was still alive. Lila counted the years quickly in her head. Had it already been ten years? Lila looked at Biddy. She wondered if Randy was right, if she was an angel. Maybe Grandma Linda sent her to watch over Pops. She certainly took good care of him. She walked to the bathroom and stopped as she passed the mirror. She leaned forward, getting as close as she could, hanging over the counter. She did have a lot of makeup on. She wouldn't have called herself a clown, but who was the makeup for? She was kind of playing some sort of dress up. She took a tissue and rubbed off some of her blush. Why did she wear all this? She stared back at herself in the expensive outfit she'd had to buy and her fingernails that had had to be done. Who was she impressing? Not any of these women. Certainly not Marlboro Man from Oklahoma. Definitely not her mother. Joel didn't seem to notice one way or the other. When she returned from the bathroom and Biddy handed over a Bloody Mary, she practically downed it, because she knew exactly who she'd been painting her face for. For Abigail, and Hannah, and Gigi, and the rest of the women standing at that luncheon. She gulped down the spicy drink and came up for a breath. When they all gathered outside on the beach for the walk, Lila stayed in the back of the group with Harper and Samantha. The wind was harsh that morning, but the skies were bluer than ever. The sun shined so bright off the sand that Lila had to squint, even in sunglasses. A couple dozen or so harbor seals scattered along Sugar Beach. Lila absolutely loved the large furry animals. 
There was something about their big black eyes and long whiskers, their no-neck bodies, and the way they wiggled. She wished she could just take one home with her and cuddle it all night. She didn't need a fiancé. She needed a seal. She watched as a black and gray speckled one itched its belly. What do you plan on doing for the rest of the day? Harper asked. I'm going to the bakery and meeting up with Andrew. Lila would have loved to say yes. She wasn't quite so sure she wanted to take the smart, yet very honest DJ to the library. I promised to take Biddy's grandson to see some maps at the library. Harper made a face in surprise. That's nice. Lila nodded. He has a thing for maps. Lila could feel herself want to tell Harper about the scene with DJ. Do you think I wear too much makeup? What? Harper looked confused now, but Lila noticed she didn't say no. The rest of the walk, the women rallied around Evelyn and Harper. Lila noticed Biddy said nothing more about her son and grandson. Before Lila headed back to Pops to meet DJ, she had just a few minutes to run home. She ran upstairs to her closet and grabbed a new shirt, one that looked more professional, more like what a teacher might wear and less like a TikToker. She grabbed a washcloth and ran it under hot water, studying her face in the mirror. Why didn't she think she was ever pretty enough without painting herself up? Why didn't she think she was skinny enough, cool enough? She wiped her eye first, retouching just a little bit of mascara and a hint of some eyeshadow. She couldn't change the world in one day. She took off all her blush and didn't add a new coat. She left her lipstick, otherwise she'd look like a corpse with her lack of tan. She looked in the mirror. The face staring back at her felt different, but it reminded her of someone she had known long ago. When was the last time she hadn't worn makeup? She pulled her hair back into a low ponytail. She wasn't going to become a librarian overnight, but maybe DJ was right. He was right about everything else. Chapter 11 I'm back, Biddy said as she came into the house. DJ and Randy sat in front of the television with the news on. DJ was on the floor at the coffee table with a big book in front of him. The walk had helped Evelyn, but it had also helped Biddy put things in perspective. DJ was a different kid. So what if her grandson wanted to call her by a name she hated? So what if he wanted nothing to do with her? As long as he was happy, that was all that mattered. She would start fresh with the boys. Forget about the day before. Forget about the fact Drake hadn't shared anything about the divorce, or about the fact that Darlene didn't want her own son at Christmas, or the fact that he had no money, even though she thought he had a good job. But when DJ ignored her when she came inside, she couldn't help but feel it grind against her. Are you ready for Lila to take you to the library? Biddy asked DJ in an upbeat voice. He ignored her, flipping to the next page of the book. Randy grunted in the background. Young man, your grandmother asked you a question. DJ didn't look up, just flipped to another page and said, I'm ready, yes. He flipped to another page. Biddy walked away and into the kitchen. She could feel her irritation rise. Didn't Drake see how rude his son was? Didn't he want to raise a polite young man that people wanted to be in the same room with? Or at least his own grandmother? Raising a son wasn't about being his friend. Drake needed to be a parent. Biddy looked out from the kitchen back to the family room where DJ sat at the coffee table as though nothing was wrong. Maybe she needed to use the same advice. Tell Drake to start helping that boy. Or did she just want to be friends with Drake? When Lila showed up, Biddy's heart sank. She had removed all her makeup. You look better, DJ commented as he put on his winter coat, hat, and gloves. DJ, Drake scolded him. Biddy couldn't believe he hadn't learned from this morning. Drake looked at Lila, horrified, 
but Lila smiled. Thank you. No, that's not how we talk to people, Biddy said. I've got this, Drake said. He shot Biddy a look that said he didn't want a mother or a friend at this point. Oh, what had gone wrong between the two of them? Are you coming with us? Lila asked Biddy from the door, probably trying to defuse the situation, but things were already building up. Biddy shook her head. No, y'all go. I'll have lunch ready when you come back. Drake gave her a look, like he knew the real reason she wasn't going. She looked away, ashamed, because he was right. She had no idea how to be a grandmother to this boy. You're his mother, Randy said in the kitchen after they left. You have the right to know what's going on with your son. Well, maybe on the East Coast, men like to talk to one another. But where I come from, men don't talk about their feelings. Biddy could only imagine what Richard would say in this situation. Nothing. He'd say nothing. Men want to talk, believe me, Randy said. Most of us just need a little bit of guidance. Biddy took in a deep breath. Randy, you old fool. I love you, but you of all people should know better than to stick your nose in someone else's business. Pops gruffed out a few syllables. I'm not sticking my nose into anything. She put her hands on her hips. Your family's just as crazy as mine. He opened his mouth and raised his finger. It used to be good, before that idiot married my daughter. I'll rest my case, Your Honor, Biddy said, pulling out a whole chicken from the fridge. Don't tell me you're making your famous chicken soup. Then I won't tell you, she said. With the baker's bread? He asked. I picked it up at Evelyn's this morning. Biddy pointed to the fresh loaf Renee had made them. I do love your soup. Randy was Biddy's favorite sous chef. Recently, he had started sitting at the table, chopping vegetables and herbs, and telling her stories as she prepared the meals. He was a really good storyteller. What can I do? Nothing, Biddy said. You go and relax before DJ gets home, and wants to tell you all about these maps they're going to see. Randy nodded his head in agreement. All right, but let me know. She could have used the help. Randy was a decent chopper, but Biddy knew as good a storyteller as Randy was. He wasn't good at keeping his mouth shut about his feelings. And she could tell he felt the same way she did about DJ. He was a spoiled young man that needed discipline. Yes, he was different. Yes, he had his quirks and idiosyncrasies that weren't his fault. Biddy understood that some of the things were out of his control. However, being polite and respectful was not one of them. Biddy didn't want to admit it, but maybe the reason she had such a hard time with him was because he reminded her of how Drake's father had treated her. As though she didn't exist. As though she didn't matter. As though... She was worthless. Well, Biddy wasn't worthless as a wife, as a mother, and certainly not as a grandmother. Chapter 12 Drake hoped to God that Lila didn't notice his glances, but he just couldn't help himself. The woman was stunning. And DJ had been right, even more so without the full face of makeup. Her blue eyes were soft like the morning sky along with her golden locks. He didn't need Freud to tell him why he had the hots for her. She reminded him of Biddy back in the day, and treated DJ like his mother had treated him, like he was a marvel. Tell me where you learn all this, Lila said in the storage room of the public library. DJ shrugged. I read a lot. Lila nodded. I like to read too. The ocean is the last final frontier on Earth, DJ faced Lila. I want to save the ocean from all the destruction. You know what? I bet you will save it. 
Maybe it was because Darlene had been so distant lately, but DJ looked at her like someone would admire a piece of art. The beautiful library volunteer had access to the storage room, where the old maps of the ocean topography were stored, all rolled up on a wooden spindle and carefully kept in a cylinder box. She and DJ leaned over one that sat spread out along a wooden table. DJ pointed to the contour lines. Did you know the elevation numbers indicate the direction of elevation by reading uphill? Lila smiled. I know, she looked at him. It's kind of neat to think topographic maps use sea level as their mean, which, if we were on the beach, we'd be exactly at zero. She nodded. It's where two points meet, right? He nodded. Drake watched in amazement as DJ's face lit up. I need to go with Grandma Barbara. Grammy Biddy knows all these special places on the beach, too, Lila said. There's a cove and these tall, tall cliffs that are made of layers of red clay. How high are the cliffs? DJ asked excitedly. But then, as if they had read each other's minds, they both looked at the map. 150 feet, they said together. Drake almost pinched himself. Who was this woman? She certainly wasn't from Oklahoma. Lila looked more like a movie star than a pioneer. But she was smart. DJ smart, which spoke volumes. DJ respected smart. He didn't care that one of the most beautiful women stood in front of him, her hair hanging down along her shoulder as she pointed out more along the coast. This is where the seals mate and give birth. Lila circled a section of the map with her index finger. They've been protected since 1972 from the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And attract sharks, DJ reminded her for the fifth time since they came to the storage room. Which have also been violently hunted almost to extinction throughout the centuries, Lila said in response. Drake couldn't hold back his smile as DJ narrowed his eyes. There's no way I'm getting near seals. Sharks don't come up to land. Drake didn't understand this phobia. What if Grandmother Barbara pushes me into the water? He asked, completely serious. Drake stared at him. She's not going to throw you into the ocean. She did the last time I was with her. DJ folded his arms. DJ, you were swimming in a pool, Drake said to him. She was playing with you. Well, drowning is a leading cause of death among people my age. DJ's eyes widened. It's the second leading cause of death for children one through four. I was five. See, you didn't have to worry, Drake said. He noticed Lila watching the interaction. He pulled another topographical map closer to him, pretending to be more interested in it than he actually was. I could have died! It's unsupervised children who drown in pools, Lila said as a rebuttal. DJ swung around to her, and Drake braced for impact. DJ had times when he didn't take well to being challenged or corrected. He could see it on DJ's face. His son was considering a retort. Well, what about the sharks? DJ said back, annoyed and stumped by this beauty. All right now, DJ. Drake put his hand flat on DJ's shoulder. It was the one signal DJ responded to. He held it there for just a few seconds, but long enough to let DJ know he needed to cool it. Most of the time, if Drake was supervising DJ's behaviors, he could nip his tantrum in the bud. He had been good at diverting his attention to another fact or detail. Then Drake could deal with the other party, usually his mother, but sometimes his brothers, teachers, or peers. Most people just thought he was a brat, even Darlene. Drake had to assume he must be doing this whole parenting thing wrong, because no matter how much he had tried to understand his son, nothing helped him. Plus, no one got DJ like he did. No one saw this amazing kid 
who was so scared of the world that he'd rather push it away and bury his head in a book. Well, I think we've taken up enough of Miss Whitmore's time, Drake said. She's a volunteer. She gives away her time, DJ said. He moved the map to reach another. He began to open the cylinder when Drake placed his hand on his shoulder again. No, DJ, it's time. He used the sternest voice he could before turning it into what DJ referred to as a yell, although DJ had no idea what real yelling sounded like. He had never heard his grandfather, that's why. I'm getting hungry myself, Lila said, looking at her phone. I was going to head over to the bakery here in town. My mom's making her famous chicken noodle soup, Drake said. DJ raised his finger in the air. You will not want to miss it. Lila grinned. It had been the first positive remark toward Biddy the young man had said. Of course, she put that horrid green stuff in the last time, DJ said. That was two years ago. Drake had groaned out the words. He had tolerated as much of the stuffy storage closet as he could. He smiled at Lila and wanted so badly to be able to read the beautiful woman who volunteered her morning for DJ. Back home, Drake attracted women, and they'd only play this kind of game with DJ to get Drake's attention. But she seemed to want nothing to do with Drake. He also noted there was no ring. Thanks again for bringing us here, he said, nudging DJ. Ow! DJ rubbed his arm as though the light tap had actually hurt him. Drake nudged him again. Thank you. Then, like in a fairy tale, Lila leaned down to DJ and smiled. She held out her fist and said, When you get back to Pop's house, check out his office. There's an original map of the island from 1917. DJ's expression changed from slightly annoyed to something Drake had never seen. DJ looked as though an arrow had been shot out by Cupid and into his heart. He couldn't stop staring at Lila. Drake couldn't either. Let's go, DJ, he said abruptly. He stood up, pushed the chair under the table, and headed toward the exit. You have to ask Randy, of course. Drake heard her say to DJ as the two got up, not paying any attention to Drake's weirdness. Using please and thank you. I can do that, DJ said, as though offering gratitude was an extra step he had to consider. You should also ask Randy if you can look at it up close, she said. Drake realized what Lila was doing, and it was smart. She was preparing DJ, showing him the rules before he broke them, explaining how to behave without having to enforce it. Drake needed to get out of there before he took this woman in his arms. Come on, DJ, he urged as he walked down the corridor. When they returned to the main area of the library, Drake felt completely out of place in his plaid shirt and mud-stained boots. The fellow patrons of the public library all looked as though they fell out of an L.L. Bean catalog. Good morning, Miss Whitmore, an elderly man said to Lila, as they walked up to the front desk. Hey, Bruce, she said casually, as though they knew each other well. Meet my friends visiting from Oklahoma, Drake and his son, DJ. Well, welcome to our little island. The man beamed as he got off his tall stool and walked around the front desk to Lila. He reached out his hand at Drake, then to DJ, who, surprisingly enough, shook it. Do you have a second to sign our guest book? Drake let DJ take the lead, who seemed pleased to be asked to sign. It'll be documented that I was here, DJ said to the man. Yes, it will, Bruce said with a smile. Had Drake fallen into Alice's strange wonderland? Was DJ really smiling as he thought of what to write? He's wicked smart. Lila said from behind him, catching him off guard. Drake shook out of his thoughts. Oh, sorry, yes, he is. Has he always been this inquisitive? 
Lila asked. Yes. He said it so quickly that he worried he'd come off aggressive. He glanced over at Lila. Her attention was completely focused on DJ and his interaction with the guest book and Bruce. Drake waited for DJ to explode out of nowhere. The morning had gone way too smoothly. He listened for something that would trigger DJ, something Bruce might say, or the way the clock ticked in the background, or the loud children in the library. But DJ left with Lila, talking about the map on the office wall. Do you think he'll let me take it off the wall? He asked her in a serious tone. I'd ask Grammy Biddy how to ask Pops, Lila said, as she opened the doors to her very expensive and very white interior Land Rover. But maybe tonight, just study it in the office if he allows you to. DJ thought about what she'd said for a moment, then nodded. Do you think he'll let me take the oceanography book to the coffee table? Lila looked back at DJ as he got into the seat and buckled. I definitely asked Grammy Biddy on that one. She knows how to get Randy to agree to anything. Drake slid onto the soft leather interior, wondering what kind of volunteer earned this kind of money. Lila leaned over to adjust her rearview mirror and a soft scent of lavender and vanilla made him close his eyes. Hot dang, this woman was fine. Lila didn't stay for the chicken noodle soup, but she did promise to come back for dinner. I'm making my famous barbecued ribs with potato casserole and homemade cornbread, Biddy said, hooking her hands onto her hips. Mmm, Lila said. That sounds delicious. Come around six. Drake watched as the beauty hugged his mother and then walked to her car. Then he peeked into the family room where Randy was snoring in his recliner. He waited until Biddy came into the kitchen and said, So what's Lila's situation? Biddy stared at him. She's off limits. What? You heard me. I was just asking about her. Drake immediately became defensive. I wasn't asking her out. I know you, Biddy said. Drake clenched his jaw. His mother knew nothing about him anymore. He didn't chase women. He stayed clear away from them. He didn't go out. He broke every plan he could to stay in with DJ. He no longer watched movies but documentaries. Instead of looking forward to late night partying, he enjoyed early evenings in. He didn't live carefree, but anxiety-ridden. Seems like a pretty expensive car for a volunteer, he said, stating the obvious. Biddy nodded. Yes, well, there's a lot of money on this island. Does this Randy guy have a lot? Drake couldn't be sure. The house had completely outdated decor. Yet, modern appliances, expensive televisions, computers, and art. Randy could be modest, but there was a photograph of a luxury boat he also loved. Probably, Biddy said. She placed her hand on her hip. Does it matter? He could feel that the topic of money bothered his mother. Did I tell you about Richard's kids? Drake wasn't going to bring it up. And he didn't know why he thought it would be a good idea. But luckily, DJ walked right up to them and interrupted. Grandmother Barbara, do you know my daddy nicknamed me Biddy? His mother said to DJ. DJ's forehead creased in interest suddenly. No, I didn't. She nodded. It's because he was such a great big man. And I was such an itty bitty in his hands. Biddy smiled at the memory and then returned her attention back to DJ. I like Barbara better. I don't, Biddy said in a low tone. At all. Reminds me of when my daddy died. He had been the only one to call me Biddy. Everyone called me Barbara after that. I missed Biddy. His mother gave DJ a hard stare. Drake almost moved across the room, ready to prevent DJ from sticking his foot into his mouth. 
I'm sorry you lost your father, DJ said. Drake's mouth dropped, wondering if he had heard DJ right. Did his son just show some empathy? Then, within the same breath, DJ said, Do you think you could help me ask Mr. Randy if I could look at the map in his office? I'd wait until after he has his coffee and cookie. She tilted her head to the side and lifted an eyebrow. Maybe have tea and a cookie with him. DJ wrinkled his eyebrows together, thinking about the scenario. He looked into the family room, then nodded at Biddy. I'll wait. Drake helped Biddy serve lunch after Randy swore he wasn't sleeping in his recliner. It was funny how a sniff of chicken noodle soup could take him back to childhood. He wondered if one day this smell would bring memories back to DJ. Just as Randy finished his last scoop, Drake stood and offered DJ and his help. We'll clean up, Drake said before Biddy stood. He knew his mother would protest, but he didn't want DJ to protest first. So he grabbed as many dishes in front of him as he could, leaving only DJs for him to pick up. Come on, DJ. We'll get the cookies and coffee. The mention of cookies and coffee brightened DJ up right away. He lifted his finger in the air and said, I can help. He popped right off his chair and followed Drake into the kitchen. I'll get the cookies. Drake held out his arm and stopped DJ in his tracks. Listen, geologist. I'm not studying rocks, DJ said, mystified by his lack of understanding of all sciences. I'm an oceanographer. Whatever, DJ. Drake wanted to help him see this map without a temper tantrum. Look, you need to use all the social graces from the South you can remember. Please, thank you, sir. That's kind of you, etc. Drake laid on his accent, heavy and Southern. That man's a judge. If you want to look at his things, you need to speak to him like he's a judge. And that goes for Grammy Biddy, too. He doesn't like how you don't listen to her. The name, he whined. Drake crossed his arms against his chest. DJ looked out at the table where Biddy and Randy sat. He nodded at Drake as if he understood what needed to be done to see the map. After cleaning up, Biddy brought out cookies and coffee, along with a glass of milk for DJ. Excuse me, sir, DJ said, as he placed the tin of Christmas cookies on the table. Would it be possible to see the map of Martha's Vineyard in your office? Randy looked up from the tin, his hand already on a snowman sugar cookie. So, you heard about my map? Yes, sir. DJ said. Drake silently thanked above for pulling DJ aside and prepping him, because he could see a different Randy. The judge liked this change in behavior. Miss Lila told us about it. Randy rubbed his chin, eyeing DJ. Did she also tell you about my pictorial map from 1883? It's of Eastport, just before the ferry port had been built. It was only a fishing town then. DJ's eyes expended. Yes, sir, I'd love to see it. Randy looked to Drake, giving him a nod. Well, then, let's ask your Grammy Biddy if we can bring these cookies to the office. Chapter 13 Lila skipped ribs with Biddy's family. She created this lame excuse of having a headache and open houses and real estate agents, and Biddy bought it. Harper did, too. Sonia did not. You have an obligation, Lila, she said. This is the biggest fundraiser of the year. The toys will get to the tots, don't worry. Lila had taken care of all the toys. Tonight's fundraiser wasn't about the toys or the children or anything besides the women and men who paid for it all. The me complex. Instead of caring about the kids who were receiving, they cared about the people who saw they were giving. I'm not going. Lila hadn't said no to her mother like this before, and it felt less frightening than she had expected. All the things she had feared came true. Her mother was furious. 
Her face turned red in anger, her lips pierced in stress. This would ruin her night. Her whole year, she let it. You think it's easy for me to have everyone talking? You not showing up will just get the whole fire started once again. Then don't go. I have to go, Sonia snapped at her. You think I can just walk away from my obligations? Lila's throat dried up. Are you referring to my wedding? Sonia rolled her eyes. Not everything is about you, Lila. Lila squeezed her fists. I'm sorry, but I'm not going. Stop behaving this way, clean yourself up, and act like a lady, Sonia said. Lila stared at Sonia, unable to think of anything nice to say, or anything to say at all. She wanted nothing more than for her mother to leave her house. I think maybe you should go, Lila said. Excuse me? Sonia laughed at her, openly in shock. I'll leave too, as soon as I can get my personal effects boxed up. Lila winced as she waited for the fire to come out of her mother's ears, but instead, she stared at her. Sonia Whitmore had nothing left to say. Then, without a word, her mother slammed the back door so hard that the picture frames against the wall shook. Lila figured she should just take them down, because with the way things were going with Sonia, she had a feeling there would be more door slamming to come. Lila looked out at her kitchen. The real estate agent had said not to decorate for the holidays, that personal Christmas decorations could look tacky to someone else. But Lila loved to decorate. She loved to dress a room up with garland and ornaments, whether it was the library or the nursing home or the local elementary school. She loved to create something that made people smile and feel good. The only time she loved her home growing up was when Christmas came. The staff would spend hours decorating with lights and sprigs of evergreens and ribbon. She and Andrew would sit on the upstairs balcony looking down at the massive Christmas tree that took three men to steady. It was the only time the house that usually felt cold and formal transformed into something warm, welcoming, and magical. The ten-foot hearth glowed with ambers and golden flames. Stockings hung before them with their names embroidered on them. They'd wake up Christmas morning, open presents, and immediately head to Palm Beach, where they'd spend the whole vacation together on the warm beach, celebrating the new year. Every year they did that. Even after her father's affair had hit the media, they'd gone together as a family, no one else. Joel had been the only other person. She walked through the kitchen and stood on the first step of the back staircase, removing the picture on the wall of the five of them sitting in front of the tree. She looked at her and Joel. She sat in his lap, his smile huge, her father's even bigger. Joel knew that she loved Christmas. He'd spoil her with presents. Joel knew all about her. He had been along for the ride the whole time. He knew how her mother treated her, how she was shadowed by Andrew, how nothing she did was right, and how her father passed her up for practicing at his firm. Joel knew all of it. He knew what it meant to be a Whitmore, because he was a Schaefer and their families ran in the same circles. Her phone buzzed. Speak of the devil. Heard you had a rough time at the luncheon. Word didn't take long to spread. She put the phone in her pocket and went up to the next frame on the wall. A picture of her and Joel skiing in Vermont. Then another picture of them on the pink sands of Bermuda. One right after the other were photographs of this happy life of a couple she didn't even recognize. Had she been happy? She just remembered living in fear, constantly worrying about when the next time would be. When would she start hearing rumors again? Andrew never understood why she'd stayed, even after she'd known about the first time and had been hearing rumors for months. Why would she stay with Joel? even after he hit on women in front of her. She looked at the last picture of her and him in high school, 
when the papers had printed the story about her father. When every morning news station showed her father's face as he got hounded by journalists and cameras while getting into a car. Then the woman, covering her face as she walked into the courtroom. Joel had stayed by her side, even when Abigail, Hannah, and Gigi were talking about her. The courts had dismissed the suit. It had been a stupid power play, Lila realized now as an adult. Her father had scorned a woman who wanted to hurt him as much as he hurt her. The only problem was that her father was too much of a narcissist to get hurt by someone else. He didn't care that he hurt his wife or his children or his assistant that sued him. All he cared about was the bottom line, how the suit would affect his reputation, how the suit might cause damage to the family name. Never an apology. Never an offering of better behavior. He'd never even recognized it. Maybe he had with her mother. Their relationship was so tightly closed, she had no idea how they felt about one another. Lila looked at the last picture hanging on the wall. It was of her and Andrew as little kids. Being a twin with Andrew had never been easy. He seemed to have gotten all the positive traits from the Whitmore genes and her the negative. He was naturally talented in sports, smart without much effort, social, and his confidence was unwavering. Take everything about Andrew and you'd find the opposite for Lila. Except for school. She was good in school. But no matter how many high marks or awards Lila had received, it didn't matter. She wasn't the Whitmore her father wanted to take over the family name. She thought about Drake and how protective he was around his son. The whole time they'd sat in the basement of the library, he'd watched her as if he wasn't sure how she'd react to him. She wished her father would have been that protective of her. She carried the pictures up to her room and set them in a box with the others. She pulled her phone out of her pocket and opened Joel's message. Come and get your things before I throw them out. Chapter 14 Biddy watched as DJ tiptoed into the family room and put Randy's binoculars back where he had found them. You didn't ask, she whispered, startling the boy. He froze and looked up at her. I wanted to see if there were seals, he stuttered. Biddy knew her expectations were high for this young man. She knew he could probably touch anything he wanted in his own home, but he wasn't in his home. For the dozenth time, Biddy wondered whether it was a good idea to have invited Drake and DJ out. Maybe her expectations had been completely wrong. Time may change some things, situations as well. But from Biddy's experience, people usually don't. Drake hadn't changed his mind about things. The mere mention of Richard's kids showed he wasn't over what had happened. Didn't he know how much she had loved that man? And his kids? She didn't want to fight them in court for money. She'd look ungrateful for what she had received. She'd look like the gold digger they'd always said she was. No, she wasn't going to fight for the money, even if the law was on her side. She'd waste all the money on lawyers. I was just borrowing, DJ said, turning to face Biddy. She hooked her fists on her hips like her own mama used to do. Without asking, it's called stealing. I wasn't stealing. His voice rose right away. Biddy leaned back, straightening her posture, crossing her arms. Drake was due out of the shower any minute. If she was going to get this kid to see any sense, she'd have to do it now, before Drake could stop her. She pointed her finger at DJ's chest. You listen, young man. You speak to me with kindness, or you go to your room. He scowled. I wasn't stealing. You're lying. His voice rose again even higher, and she could tell Randy started to notice. She leaned over the small boy. He was small for his age, she guessed. He didn't look like he ran around much, unlike his father who played outside constantly. Go to your room, 
Biddy said, pointing down the hall. You can't send me to my room, DJ screamed. You're not my mother. Biddy inhaled long and hard before she said the next few words. Go before I take you. DJ's eyes widened in disbelief, and there in the hallway stood Drake in a towel. What are you yelling for? Randy stood up from his recliner. DJ's face reddened as he stared back at Biddy. I was not stealing. Drake looked to Biddy. Did you accuse him of stealing? Biddy narrowed her eyes at DJ. Go to your room, young man. She wasn't budging. Drake could be mad all he wanted. Drake looked at DJ since Biddy wasn't answering. What happened? Your son took my binoculars without asking for permission, Randy said from the family room. Go, Drake said to DJ. What? You heard me. Drake pointed down the hall in the same direction as Biddy. Move your rear end before it ends up under my belt. Drake looked at Randy. I apologize. I don't think you need to, Randy said, sitting back down in his recliner. Someone else does. Drake shot Biddy a look. I'll take care of it from here. No, she said. This is between me and my grandson, thank you. He's not like other kids, Drake said. He's not like me. He won't respond well to your tough act. What's that supposed to mean? Biddy let down her guard for just a split second. She couldn't help it. She tried not to let the comment bother her. I'm trying my best, you know, he said to her. What? She said, surprised. She hadn't meant to suggest he wasn't trying. She wanted to help. I know you're trying. Then what do you want to tell me about my parenting? He said to her. What else am I doing wrong? The kid needs to learn the word no, Randy said from the family room. Biddy saw Drake's face turn a different shade of red. She had never seen her son angrier. Drake, please calm down. I wasn't trying to make you feel like a bad parent. Hello? The front door swung open, and there in the foyer stood Lila with a huge box in her arms. I brought Christmas. She turned toward the commotion, and her mouth dropped open. Oh, hello. She averted her eyes from Drake, who still stood in only a towel, dripping wet. I'll go out to my car, she said, then turned and walked out of the house. I better check on my son, Drake said, leaving the kitchen and going into the apartment, shutting the door loudly behind him. Biddy looked to Randy. Why did you go and stick your nose into my business? Because it's my house, and I have to hear it. You ever thought you should maybe stay out of it? Biddy snapped at him. I asked you if you could give my family some space. You promised to mind your business. Biddy had confessed one night of her troubles with her son and his family. She even did something she hadn't done with the ladies. She told him the truth about her concerns with her grandson. I'm sorry, Randy said, and he genuinely did look sorry. I'll try and keep out of things. Biddy gave him a hard nod. She appreciated what Randy was trying to do, but him getting involved would not help things any. Biddy looked back to the foyer at the plastic bin Lila had left. The side of the bin had the words, Christmas decorations, written in marker. She looked out the window and saw Lila standing by the car. Lord knows what that poor girl was thinking. Just as Biddy began to clean up breakfast, Lila came back into the house with another large plastic bin. This one said, Garland and Lights. The writing was neat like a schoolteacher's handwriting. Biddy looked around Randy's home and suddenly noticed how stark it was without Christmas decorations. She had found a few things in a closet, 
a couple snowman cookie jars. But other than that, there was no sign of Christmas. She had been so rattled she had forgotten to ask if he had any. She decided to text the one person she knew would know where to find a tree. Can you find me a tree? She could see the dots on his end flashing below her message. Charlie Brown? Or should I surprise you? Tommy wrote back. Biddy let out a single laugh. Surprise me. Biddy hadn't texted Tommy much after their date. Just as well. If not for needing the tree, she probably would have let this one go. She had no business getting involved with another man. Drake would have something to say about it if she did. She could only imagine what he'd say. She couldn't blame him. She saw the goodness and he saw the evil. She saw the man who needed a shoulder to cry on, and he saw a snake slithering into his life. Biddy always chose losers, even before her mama told her so. She knew it, too. She chose men like her own daddy. Men who'd gamble away their family's property on a horse. Men who'd drink themselves into oblivion. Men who promised the moon, but burned her with the sun. Even Richard, she supposed. She shook out of her thoughts as Lila brought in a third plastic bin. I have more in the car. She looked beyond Biddy, and that's when she swung around to see Drake, now fully dressed and standing with DJ. You brought Christmas, Drake said to her. She shrugged. I was about to donate some stuff to the VFW, but remembered Pops hadn't decorated yet. She opened the top of one of the boxes. And I brought some books from my place. No more books, Randy said from his recliner. Sorry, Pops, too late, she said, winking at DJ, who looked anxious to see inside. She pulled out shoe boxes with brand names he'd only read about. I kept all my grandmother's things. Randy walked over from the recliner. He took one of the boxes from the bin and opened it up. Linda's angel. Inside sat a crocheted angel with a gold pipe cleaner above its head. Randy looked at the ornament with such love and fondness that her heart broke as his eyes filled with sorrow. Linda loved Christmas. Lila bounced to the next bin and peeled off the plastic cover. Inside, just like the writing said, was garland with lights. Let's hang it on the mantle. What's in the bags? DJ asked. He looked sheepishly around the room. You have something to say? Biddy asked, not forgetting the whole situation. DJ looked at his hands, then lifted his chin up in the air. He didn't make eye contact with anyone. I'm sorry. He said it like a robot, without emotion. I will always ask for permission before I use someone else's things. Now that sounds more like it, Biddy said, her hands still on her hips. Sounds like a polite young man standing in front of me. And you know who comes for good boys and girls, Lila said. Drake dropped his head as DJ lifted his finger. Actually, lying is also not very good. And like stealing, I don't lie. If you believe, Lila pulled out a porcelain Santa statue. You will receive. DJ looked curious, which usually led him to ask dozens of questions, but he watched as Lila emptied more of the bins. I even had this remade to replicate Grandma's, Lila said. She pulled out a styrofoam container. Inside was a porcelain Christmas tree with colored lights. Let's plug it in. Randy walked over to the dining room table and pushed aside the centerpiece. She imagined what a cozy home Linda must have made for her family. Biddy smiled as DJ followed Lila and Randy into the dining room. Grab that plug right there, Randy said to DJ, and the stubborn little boy disappeared and did exactly what he was told without question. We need a light bulb, Lila said, holding up the empty socket sitting under the top of the tree. I've got one, Randy shuffled across the dining room with his cane and through the kitchen. He came right back and twisted in the new bulb. 
All the while, Biddy and Drake watched the spectacle in amazement. Biddy had never seen Lila or Randy that happy. When the light turned on and all the different colors of the Christmas tree lit up, all three of them laughed and clapped. Biddy noticed that even Drake smiled. Oh! Lila jumped up and ran to the door. I forgot something in the car. She disappeared out the front door, and DJ ran to the window to check out what she was doing. When she returned, she held a cooler in her hands. I brought ingredients for Grandma's chocolate chip cookies. Randy found a few Christmas records he had stored away, and Drake helped hang the garland around the fireplace and on top of the bookshelves. I brought some stuff I found at the beach to make a Christmas ornament you can take back home, Lila said, pulling out a container and showing DJ. She opened the top, and inside were perfectly shaped shells, starfish, and colored sea glass. What's this? DJ asked, picking up a very hard-to-find piece of red sea glass. That sea glass. Why do you have it? DJ asked, dropping the red piece and moving to a light aqua. Because it's pretty, Lila said. We could use it for our decorations. But it's trash, DJ said. Oh, Biddy thought. The kid was relentless. I like the idea that something broken and sharp like glass gets taken in by the ocean and comes out smooth and soft and strong. She picked up a dark blue piece that had been tumbled into a smooth oval. She placed it in the palm of DJ's hand and closed his fingers around it. A perfect pal for your pocket as well. She pulled out a piece from her pocket. I use it when I'm thinking. DJ's eyes widened. He instantly pulled out his favorite rubbing rock he had used since he was in kindergarten. Darlene had found it at the end of the driveway when DJ wouldn't get on the bus. Like my rock. Like your rock. Biddy saw Drake practically drooling off to the side of the two of them. She would be in trouble if Drake were to break sweet Lila's heart. She shot her son a look. He rolled his eyes and continued to watch as Lila and DJ emptied out decorations from the bins, and Randy told stories of each item. Biddy looked as Lila pulled out a book with gold-edged pages. It's a Christmas carol, Lila said, placing the book on top of the dining table and then turning to an illustration. This wasn't the average children's book. The soft tissue paper before the illustration proved that. My favorite Christmas story of all time. Good old Charles Dickens, Randy said. They don't tell stories like that anymore. What's it about? DJ asked about a greedy man named Scrooge who never stopped to enjoy life, Lila said. Is that a first edition? Drake asked. Lila smiled and shook her head. Third. Drake made a face, as though calculating the cost. How about we make those cookies? Biddy said, clasping her hands together. Music played as they went to the kitchen and mixed the ingredients. Biddy helped DJ mix while Lila got out the cookie sheets and greased them. Just like Grandma Linda. With the house smelling of sugar and warm chocolate, the doorbell rang. Would you mind grabbing that? Randy said to Drake. Oh, uh, I'll get it, Biddy said, wiping her hands with the tea towel. She moved her way to the front hall, but Drake arrived at the door first, swinging it open to see Tommy in a Santa hat holding a tree. Merry Christmas, Tommy said to Drake. Tommy Taylor, Randy called out from behind Biddy. What brought you around here? I heard you were looking for a tree. Tommy held a gorgeous balsam fir. You did good, Biddy said and gave Tommy a welcoming smile. Just what was needed. We got a tree. This made DJ smile wide. Will we put on lights? Biddy hadn't seen her grandson this excited about anything, even the map in Randy's office. The pure joy in his eyes made her tear up. This was the grandson she remembered from long ago. Or 
was she just remembering when Drake was a child? Tommy, meet my son and my grandson, Drake and DJ, Biddy said. Drake frowned, and Biddy saw her son eye the man up before extending his hand. Nice to meet you, Drake mumbled. Are you a captain? DJ asked. Tommy looked confused. I suppose you could call me that. Your shirt indicates that you are. DJ pointed at Tommy's t-shirt, which featured the infamous captain of rum. She wondered if DJ was being a smart aleck or serious, but then she noticed him wink at Drake. A secret joke between father and son. She hadn't seen a playful side to DJ before. Tommy didn't seem to notice a thing as he carried the tree into the living room, placing it where Lila suggested. Right in front of the window, Lila said. Randy had tears in his eyes. That's perfect. From the kitchen, the timer went off for the cookies. I'll help. DJ jumped up from his spot and ran into the kitchen. Biddy stopped for a second, looking around her, watching as Drake helped set the tree in its stand like Lila and Tommy had told him to do. She looked at DJ, who stood patiently by the oven, excited for her to arrive. Randy turned up the Christmas music, playing in the background. The magic of Christmas was everywhere. She closed her eyes for just a split second to send a thank you to the universe to show gratitude for this moment. She wouldn't take these times for granted. Thank you. She just barely said aloud. This was the moment where memories were made. Chapter 15 he was standing in a towel, Lila said into the phone. A towel, Harper said back. Lila fell back in her bed, daydreaming of Drake's bare chest. She had never seen a man so sexy in her life. His dark, wet hair, which on any other guy would need a cut, but looked great on him. His long, thick eyelashes made his dark chocolate eyes mysterious. I could not stop staring either, Lila said. Lila heard Harper talking to her cat on the other end of the line. Then she said, Who knew you'd have a thing for cowboys? I know, right? Lila said with a laugh. Please don't tell Biddy. Why would I? And that's when Lila realized Harper hadn't ever told her secrets. And that Lila hadn't told Harper's secrets to Biddy. None of the women in her new circle talked behind one another's backs, expressing their opinions about the other. None of them spoke negatively about the others, ever, or as long as Lila had been hanging around anyway. They didn't feed off gossip or tell things they'd heard in confidence. They didn't start a sentence with what they'd heard. These women didn't do that. I think I'll cool it on the cowboy, Lila said. She didn't worry so much for being silly and honest. Harper wasn't going to judge her. Oh, guess what, Harper said. What? My dad came home from the hospital today, Harper said. Oh, that's great news, Lila said. She had heard Mr. Marin was recovering well from surgery. And he moved into Evelyn's, Harper said. Which means the apartment is open. Lila sat up. The apartment is already open? Well, it still has most of his things, but I packed all his clothes and stuff, Harper said. That stuff is all gone. Lila rushed to her closet and turned on the light. Are you saying I could move in if I wanted to? Lila's heart raced at the possibility. Harper started talking to Joan, her cat, again. Then just as Lila grabbed her newest travel suitcase, Harper said, It's yours! Lila screamed in delight. You're kidding me! She looked around her walk-in, then looked at the time. She grabbed a few items from the shelves and then started racing around the house, taking what she needed and leaving everything else behind. She took her pillow and toothbrush, a heavy down comforter and her Kindle, along with her coffee maker and a mug. Just as she finished with her essentials, she remembered the painting the ugly painting, Joel had called it. 
Usually, he didn't have much of an opinion when it came to art, but he had called it ugly when she'd put it above the mantel. Childish was what he had called the abstract landscape. She thought it was the most beautiful portrayal of Sugar Beach she had ever seen. All the sea colors blending together, molding into one structure like the cliffs in the background. The artist had been a resident at the nursing home. Dementia had taken his mind until he'd painted. It had been the most extraordinary thing she had ever seen. He had painted the beach exactly how his mind had remembered it. Joel had refused to let her put it up. No, it's not something I want to see every day, he said. It looks like a child painted it. She'd put it in the attic. Lila ran up the staircase, all the way to the third floor. Resting against the wall, the painting had been covered with an old beach towel. She flung the towel aside and flipped the painting around to see it again. It was just as beautiful as she'd remembered it. The scene reminded her of being a child and playing at the beach. She stared at it for a long time before picking it up and carrying it all the way to her car. It was the last item she would pack up, she decided. She looked at the big house, filled with things that meant nothing to her, and realized she wanted nothing else. After shifting into reverse, Lila floored it out of the driveway. She almost wished she had said goodbye to the pool. Harper met her at the apartment, holding the key out as though Lila had won something. Welcome to your new home! Lila took the key in her hand. It was the first time she had done something on her own. No one else had made this decision for her. Not her parents, not Joel, not society. Lila Whitmore had her very own place. A place she technically couldn't afford, but she'd figure things out. She didn't care what she had to do in order to live in the apartment, but she'd do what she had to, whether it was waiting tables or cleaning toilets or whatever, because she was never going back. Lila climbed the stairs to the apartment, the smell of freshly baked pastries following her up the steps. Her heart pounded faster the further she climbed. She slid the key into the hole and turned carefully. When the door swung open, a smell of pine and cinnamon filled the air. Lila looked into the kitchen. The room had slanted ceilings and barely any counters. A small round kitchen table sat in the middle of the room. Through the doorway, she could see a tight sitting area, and further down, a bedroom sat in the front. It was the same size as her master bedroom. I love it. She looked at the chipped white cabinets and the worn pine floors. She walked into the sitting room where she pictured a couch full of throw pillows and blankets, candles flickering against the ceilings and wooden beams. She noticed the gas stove in the corner. She walked further into the bedroom, observing an office door. The front windows overlooked Harbor Lane. She could even see the docks off in the distance. Lila spun around to Harper and hugged her. Thank you, Harper. Harper looked surprised. You don't have to thank me. But Lila knew what Harper had done. This wasn't just any apartment. It had been Harper's childhood home. It had been in Harper's family since her grandparents had moved to the island. This wasn't just an apartment. It meant a lot to Harper. Harper didn't stay long, and once she left, Lila spent the night walking through the space, counting how many drawers were in the kitchen, planning how she would organize her clothes in the tiny closet, and what else she needed to collect back at the house. Then she stood in the office. She hadn't realized there had been an extra room off the bedroom the first time she'd walked through the space. A wooden antique desk sat in the middle, with a wooden swivel chair, like you'd see in old films. She had never had her own office. In the big house, Joel had used theirs as a place to hang his photographs and mementos from school. He had never actually used the space, since he had an office at his medical practice. She thought about her diplomas her Juris Doctor that sat in a frame in the attic, her awards from school, and her own mementos. She grabbed a brass hanging hook she'd remembered to pack and walked into the sitting room. After finding the center spot on the main wall, the spot where everyone would see, 
she used the heel of her boot as a hammer to pound the hook into the wall. Then she ran to her car, pulled out the painting, and carefully carried it up to the apartment, making sure not to bang it into the tight hall. With both arms holding each side, she gently climbed the couch and placed the steel wire on the back of the painting onto the hook, slowly lowering the frame against the wall. She got down from the couch and backed up, waiting for the painting to fall on the floor. But it stayed, and she backed up some more, taking in the whole painting. Like one of those magic eye puzzles, the lines blurred as she stood there, creating a scene as if she were there. She could even feel the breeze on her shoulders. And in that moment, Lila suddenly felt free. Chapter 16 Drake would never admit it, but he had been disappointed Lila hadn't come around. The day had dragged as Randy and DJ read Charles Dickens together, each taking turns reading, each analyzing the time period. Charles Dickens had been a child laborer. He understood how poorly the companies treated their workers, especially children, Randy said to DJ, who had an instant interest in the idea of critiquing literature. He uses elements of fantasy to prove his point. But how is that going to change society? DJ said. Scare the rich with the idea that there are ghosts hanging out in purgatory? Randy didn't let the comments slow him from reading. And as DJ complained, he also started to listen more, even asking to read it when Randy took his nap. Why don't you look at the rest of the books Lila brought? Drake suggested. He had a feeling Randy liked rereading the classic. DJ didn't need to be asked twice. He looked at Drake as if to ask if he could look at the books. Drake thought that was a huge improvement from a few days ago. He checked to see where Biddy was. Back in the kitchen, Biddy sat at the table holding a magazine in her hands. He wanted to ask about the man who had brought the tree, but there were some subjects he and his mother didn't discuss. Money and men. He could tell right away that the man had come for Biddy. He had seen plenty of men come to his house, trying to gain attention from his mother, do her special favors, offer to help around the house, pretend to be a cool guy to her kid. You should take a drive, Randy said. Excuse me, Drake said to him. Take a drive around the island, Randy said, sitting up from his position in the recliner. DJ was looking at the map of England in the 1800s. Take my car. Drake shook his head. No, I wouldn't feel comfortable. I can watch the kid. The one who needs to hear the word no? Drake couldn't hold back. The judge looked him over. What can I say? He's growing on me. Drake waited for the but, or the things he still needed to work on. But there were none. Randy stayed quiet after that. You're serious? Mm-hmm, Randy gruffed. The only person who's been driving that thing is your mother. Maybe you could change the oil while you're out. Drake sighed. Guess that was the real reason he should go for a drive. Is there anything else you need? My grandson will usually bring me light reading material, if the mood strikes him. Randy said, peering over his readers. Drake let out a laugh. I don't think the mood's going to strike me. He wasn't buying an old man some dirty magazines, not when his son was in the house. That's a shame, Randy murmured. I have a lot of maps. Drake groaned. Isn't bribery a crime, Your Honor? I heard the Little Miss Christmas is worth the money. Pop slipped a 20 into Drake's hand as he walked by. Ew, Pops, came a light voice. Drake froze as Lila walked into the family room. Well, don't you think maybe you should knock before entering someone's house? The old man said to his granddaughter. Drake couldn't look at Lila's angelic face as he thought about buying a dirty magazine for this old timer. I can show you the maps, she said. 
Drake prayed this conversation would be over. Randy muttered something inaudible as he walked back to his recliner. But Drake took note that he didn't grab his money. Randy still wanted that favor. Where are the keys? Drake asked. For what? Lila looked concerned. Did she not like the idea of him driving her grandfather's car? Ill Ford, Randy said. Drake wondered if she was worried he'd steal it or ruin it. Why does he need your car? She asked. Because I asked him to get an oil change and drive around the island. Lila put her hands on her hips. Pops, that's not Drake's job. He's here as a guest. Well, I don't mind, Drake said. He said he doesn't mind, Randy said to his granddaughter. No, please, Drake. The car is in no shape to drive in this weather. Randy doesn't have snow tires. Lila gestured to the window. A light snow began to fall. He's not from here, and you're sending him out in this weather? Do you want him to die? Drake looked at DJ, almost asking him to come along. He would have been fine, Randy said. Lila shook her head. It's snowing right now. Why can you drive then? DJ asked. Lila looked back out at the snow that had started to pick up and turned to DJ. Because I brought a picnic lunch to have down at the beach. No one has ever been eaten by a shark in a snowstorm on Martha's Vineyard. DJ didn't react to the fact. Instead, he went back to his book and said, Nope. I have your favorite, Lila said, undeterred. He sat up, wrinkling his eyebrows. Strawberry jam and peanut butter? Yep. DJ froze in his spot at the coffee table. Drake could see the wheels working in his head. He held up his hands when DJ looked at him. Oh, I didn't tell her. I also have hot cocoa and marshmallows for the fire. Randy slapped his thighs with his hands. There better be enough for all of us. Fire? DJ was curious. She nodded. Once it begins to snow, you can have a fire on the beach, even during the day. DJ grabbed his tablet and immediately looked it up. But there's a ban on open fires on beaches, even in winter. On public beaches, Lila said. I pack the best peanut butter and strawberry jam sandwich you will ever taste. Have you heard of a little thing called fluff? DJ lifted his chin. No. Imagine a campfire marshmallow's insides mixed with peanut butter and homemade jam, Lila said. Sounds sticky, DJ said. She smiled and nodded. And delicious. Drake looked to Biddy, who made a face. Oh, you New Englanders and that stuff. What's fluff? Drake asked. Biddy made a face. It's disgusting. Lila pulled out a cut-up piece of sandwich. Drake saw the red from the jam, the tan from the peanut butter, and then white. She looked at DJ as he bit into the piece. Drake couldn't believe he was trying something new. His face lit up. That's good! Lila let out a laugh like a fairy princess. I told you. Can I have the rest for lunch? DJ asked. Sure, Lila said. We can even walk from here. DJ looked out the window. The migration did start much earlier in October this year. The chances of any sharks sticking around these parts are close to none, Drake said, walking to the coat hanger. Now, let's go have this picnic. Wait until you see the water in a snowstorm, Lila said nostalgically, as though the endless gray were ribbons of pink bubblegum. Drake thought it was ugly. The moment they stepped outside, he knew he had made a mistake. The wind had picked up, and the snow that came down felt like hard pellets against his skin. He was sure DJ would flip. But DJ didn't seem to mind, and he walked beside Biddy and Randy, who both walked slow. Real slow, considering the blizzard blowing around them. We're almost there, Lila said, as they stepped further down a path. Drake couldn't see the end, only snow. That's when he heard it. Soft at first, but then as the path curved, he heard a 
Boom! He jumped and could see DJ jump as well. Woohoo! Randy called. Welcome back, Mother Nature! Drake could make out the words of what DJ was saying, but couldn't hear any of it. All he heard was the booming of the waves crashing into the cliffs. Lila looked at him, smiling as if she could read his mind. Incredible, right? She yelled, yet he could barely hear her. You can't think of anything else. Boom! Another wave smashed against the clay cliffs. Then another. One by one, the waves pounded the shore. It's called Symphony Cove, Lila shouted. Boom! The spray could be heard even closer. The snow no longer hit like pellets, but now slapped his face in wet clumps. Where's the ocean? He asked. He could barely see Biddy up ahead. It's right below you. Lila held onto a railing and pointed out. That's when the loudest wave he had ever heard smashed into the shore, inches away from him. The spray echoed against the cove. He closed his eyes tight, but nothing hit him. When the next wave came and then the next, he couldn't stop flinching, even though he knew he wasn't going to get wet. The rest of the group went up the path, leaving Drake behind, standing still, holding onto the rail. It was magnificent. I can see why you come here, he said, almost too quietly. He was certain she wouldn't hear him. It's my favorite, just after a storm, she said back, just as softly, as if the snowflakes falling around them padded their words to each other. I come here whenever I need to clear my head. I even study for the bar out here. You're an attorney? He asked, suddenly feeling completely inadequate. Not really, she shook her head. I have a law license, but I don't practice law. Why not? He asked. But he was the last person to say anything. He had a degree in business management, and look where that had gotten him. He was fixing heating and cooling systems. Because I was turned down from my dream job and never quite recovered, she said. I lost my dream job too, he said. She looked at him. What did you do? I worked as a ranch manager for my stepfather. He looked out at the waves, thinking about how different his life would be if Richard hadn't died. What does that entail? she asked. A lot of everything, he said thinking about what had gone into running Richard's ranch. All the paperwork, the licenses, payroll, the managing of employees, the animals, the vet visits, the equipment, the seasons, the market, and so much more. I mostly just miss working for myself. He had heard Richard's children were trying to sell the farm. It had been over two years since Richard's death, and they were all in probate still, fighting with each other like vultures. None of Richard's children wanted anything to do with the ranch or his legacy while he was alive. Maybe that's why Drake had been so bitter about how everything had gone down. The fact that the will hadn't been updated to include Biddy and himself showed how much Richard had cared about them. What do you do now? she asked. He wished so badly he could tell her about working at the ranch. The first question everyone asked was if he rode a horse. They didn't have horses to ride, except as a hobby. Otherwise, they rode trucks or four-wheelers while moving the cattle. Richard didn't have a huge ranch, but it was enough to make a very comfortable life for him and his children and his ex-wife. His toes curled even thinking about it. I'm a heating and cooling guy now, he said. She nodded, but he could see her confusion. Do you like it? He huffed out a laugh, unable to control the bitterness. No, no, I don't. I'm sorry, she said. Don't be. It is what it is. He sounded defeated. Have you thought about looking for another manager position? She asked. He shook his head. I don't even have a tie for an interview. As they continued to walk, Worries kept wandering into his mind about DJ or Darlene or the divorce. A wave would pound it away, and he'd be brought back to the present moment, walking along the edge of the world, watching his son at the beach. 
They were all such a small speck of the ocean's history. Did DJ understand that kind of thinking? Was he in absolute awe like him? When Drake and Lila finally caught up to the rest of the group, Randy, Biddy, and DJ all stood facing the beach, watching as the waves smashed onto the shore. There are no sharks out there today, DJ said, finally satisfied. Drake gave a laugh and looked at Lila. She turned her head to him and smiled. There was something about that smile. The world sounded like it was crashing down on them, but everything right then, right at that moment, made him feel like everything would be okay. He almost reached out for her hand to grab it and pull her into him for a kiss, to breathe her in. A feeling of rapture washed over him. He was glad he was standing on the beach, looking out into the great unknown. A few days ago, he would have been miserable. But as the snowflakes fell and his mother smiled down on DJ and Lila looked out at the water, he was completely okay. Shark! Drake shook his head out of the clouds and the wet gray mess hit him. Shark! DJ pointed to something out in the water. That's not a shark, Lila said, using her hands to block the snow for a better view. There, DJ pointed, but Drake saw nothing other than snow falling into Lila's eyelashes. It's squat, Randy said. Squat, Biddy asked. She's the native tribe's version of a mermaid, Lila smiled. Let's start that fire before we tell the tale. It turned out Lila's family owned the beach, and that's why she could have an open fire once the snow fell. The five of them sat around the flames eating sandwiches, while Randy told folk tales of the original settlers of the island. Water meant everything to the Wampanoag people, and they thought that Squant and other mermaids lived in our oceans. And just like if Lila were a mermaid, DJ was taken in by her magic, the lore of the sea in her voice and breath. And like Moshop, the hero of the tale, he couldn't resist the woman's beauty. DJ stood in the snow, listening to the folktale. Lord help me, Biddy said under her breath, as she sat down next to Drake, facing the flames that rose with the wind. The warmth of the fire felt nice. Hey, smitten. Biddy looked back at Drake, then to DJ. Drake shrugged, trying to be neutral. He didn't want to give away his own feelings. He looked around where they sat. The visibility made it difficult to see if they had walked far from the path or in circles. Is this Symphony Cove? Randy shook his head. He lifted his gloved hands up to point out the cliff's walls. It's another inlet that creates a natural shelter. We haven't named this spot yet. The sound traveled perfectly inside the little inlet. The waves beating against the cliffs and Symphony Cove were muted while inside the shelter. Drake found a boulder to sit on and watched DJ listen as Lila continued to tell the story. All he wanted was to be with her under the water, but no matter how much he tried, he couldn't figure out how to breathe underwater. Lila paused. Then he finally convinced her to take him to the sea so he could always be with her. So she wrapped him up in green seaweed braids and took him to the bottom of the ocean floor. Did he survive? DJ asked. She shook her head. He never woke up again. DJ looked at the fire, contemplating the story. I think the story's trying to tell us to stay out of the water. I think it's telling us to be happy with what we have and to forget about the things we don't, Lila said. Drake thought about Darlene. Was he the man dead at the bottom of the seafloor? Or was that the new guy? Drake crinkled up the tinfoil when he finished his sandwich. That was delicious. It's my favorite, Randy said. I call it the cowboy, Lila said with a smile. Then he swore, even as the snow fell, her cheeks pinked. She looked away when he caught her eye. Dang, she was pretty. It's very good, 
he said. Lila's face grew pinker with the compliment, which he liked. The rest of the picnic went by quickly. The snow continued to get heavier and deeper, and the fire didn't stay lit. When DJ finally hit his limit, they all agreed to walk back. Drake made sure both Randy and Biddy took their time. The last thing he needed was a broken hip, or worse. But Randy, along with his walking cane, seemed to travel the path with no difficulty. I thought you said he kept falling, Drake asked Biddy as they reached the front of the house, and Randy was already inside. He'd been sitting around a lot back then, Biddy explained. Lila shook off the snow from her hat, then brushed it off her hair. It's really because of Biddy's persistence that he gets exercise and has a good diet. He's been happier, too. Drake hadn't been close with any relatives other than his mother. He hardly knew his father, and his grandparents were dead on both sides. All he had was Biddy. But as he watched Lila tell him about how her grandfather was improving because of his mother, he tried to feel happy. Happy for Randy, whose health had improved. Happy for Lila, who got to spend more time with her grandfather. Happy for Biddy, who seemed to be thriving in her new situation. But he didn't feel happy. That's great, he said. Biddy smiled at him, but it was a check-in. He smiled back, and he could see her shoulders relax. And that's when he realized Biddy wouldn't be going back to Oklahoma. He had hoped his mother would come back home like she had originally said she would. He had hoped to have some family for DJ, now that it was just his son and him. He didn't want DJ to grow up with only one person to count on. Drake opened the door and went inside. When DJ warmed up and settled back at the coffee table next to Randy, Drake snuck up next to Lila and asked, Where'd you say that water was? It's under the sink, she said, looking out the window. She bit her lower lip. What's wrong? he asked. I have to drive home. I thought the storm was going to die down, but it looks like it's going to stick around. How far do you have to drive? Drake had driven through plenty of snowstorms in Oklahoma. Sometimes people died just getting lost on their own properties out there. But the island's storm felt more ominous, threatening. The island seemed rather small all of a sudden, as the Atlantic pounded the shore only a walk away. You're staying. Randy said gruffly. Lila's eyes widened. I can't. I just moved into my new place. Oh? Biddy smiled. Charlie moved out? Lila nodded. It's my apartment now. What happened to the other house? Pops asked, confused about the sudden move. I don't know. Sonia's selling it. She's selling? Pops, I thought you knew. Lila looked surprised by Randy's reaction. Where's the guy you always brought around? He asked, piecing together the situation. Drake looked at Lila, whose eyes suddenly dulled. We broke up. And you've moved. Randy looked angry now. All the money that man has, and he sells his daughter's home. I don't want to live there. Lila stood straighter, pulling her shoulders back further. I wanted to move out. He's a cheapskate. Randy continued muttering as he went back to the television set. Never was good for anything other than taking. Lila snuck a look at Drake and forced a smile. He smiled back. How about a water? He asked. Her eyes widened, and a real smile graced her lips. I'd love one. Chapter 17 Evelyn had been resigned with living alone after George had died. It had probably been the hardest thing to accept after he had passed. When she'd moved into Seaview, she'd subconsciously left one side of the closets empty. She didn't know exactly why. She truly hadn't been thinking about living with a man, other than George. Even when things got serious between her and Charlie, she never really anticipated using that extra space for his stuff. It just sat empty. Now, as she looked into her closet, the dream closet she'd had Mateo build her, it felt full, complete. 
Your things fit perfectly upstairs, she said, as she returned to the gathering room where Charlie sat curled up under a blanket, with Stan at his feet. She realized he was sleeping and started to tiptoe to the kitchen. The snow was really coming down. She walked to the kettle and decided to have some tea and maybe even a few of the cookies Renee had left. She turned on the stove and pulled out the cookies from the freezer, placing them on the counter. She walked to the windows, looking out at the water and watching the snow fall. It was a view she had only dreamt about as a young adult starting out. All those years ago, during her summers working at the wharf, she'd write in the early hours or late at night. Charlie had encouraged her to go for it, let loose, and jump at any opportunity. She looked back at Charlie, who slept soundly. She needed to remind herself of what was here now, and not what could have been. Charlie was alive. The heart attack had been a warning. He was going to be okay, if he took care of himself. She grabbed the calendar. They hadn't planned a big wedding, just something small, but now she wondered if she should cancel it, have something even smaller. She didn't want to add to the stress. The wedding didn't even matter to her. All she wanted was to be married, to continue to go down this journey together for as long as they had. Oh, shoot, she said aloud, looking at the dates. She was supposed to have had a dinner party for Biddy and her son. She'd completely forgotten. She grabbed her phone, walked into her library, and closed the doors behind her. She dialed Biddy's number. I am so sorry, she said as Biddy picked up. I forgot about our dinner. Girl, don't even, Biddy said, as easy as can be. I don't expect you to host, especially with all that's happened. I feel terrible. Yes, Evelyn had a lot going on, but she felt guilty that she completely forgot her dearest friend's son's arrival. Let me make it up to you. Oh, no, you have enough going on. Nonsense, Evelyn looked out the window. We'd love to have you. She wondered if Charlie would be up for it, or was she pushing him by inviting people over? Did Charlie even like her full house dinners? Or did he enjoy moments like this, quiet and just the two of them? How's it going over there? Biddy asked. Great, Evelyn said instinctively, but then she changed her answer. Okay. Mm-hmm, Biddy said, her southern drawl making it more of a statement than a hum. I'm not sure how living together works yet, Evelyn said. Her worries felt real when spoken out loud. And I know it's me and my fears, but I... Evelyn thought of Charlie asleep. Had he slept like that before, or was it the heart? Had she been pushing him? Hmm? Biddy hummed this as more of a question, still heavy in her accent, but totally different. I need to figure this out before the wedding. For some reason, Evelyn felt a sense of urgency. Marriage was permanent. She wanted permanent, right? I love Charlie, she said. You do, Biddy reminded her. It's just that I don't want things to change, but I want everything to change. Evelyn couldn't even understand herself. I want to combine our finances, but still be able to have anyone over that I want. She shook her head. It's crazy, I know. I sound completely ridiculous. Biddy didn't have a quick comeback. Instead, she said, Sometimes change is a good thing. Biddy wasn't one for cheesy inspirational quotes, which made Evelyn take a second to recognize what was going on. Evelyn had been so busy worrying that she hadn't noticed that Biddy hadn't spoken since the start of their call. Biddy, how's Drake and DJ's visit going? Evelyn asked. It's great, wonderful. Biddy said, but Evelyn wondered if she really meant it. Don't worry about having us over. You and Charlie have enough to deal with. Please come, Evelyn said, now feeling guilty that she had complained to Biddy. I can't wait to meet your family. It's fine, Biddy said. But it wasn't fine. Biddy had been there for Evelyn through everything. 
She had asked Evelyn to meet her son and grandson, and Biddy couldn't just invite Evelyn and Charlie into someone else's house. And here she was complaining about her happily ever after to Biddy of all people. The woman who had lost everything, who had to come out of retirement and find a new place to live. How could she have done that? I'm so sorry. I'm being selfish. We're good, Evelyn. I know you and Charlie are going through a lot, Biddy said softly. I don't want to cause anyone stress. We'll come another time. The line went silent between them. Well, I better get going, Biddy said. I don't think I'll be able to make the walk tomorrow, but probably Wednesday. Biddy? Evelyn felt something was off. Is everything all right? Yes. Biddy's voice dramatically rose in an upbeat tone. I'm fine. It's okay to give yourself some grace, Evelyn said. I'll be there in a second, Biddy called out. I've got to go, Evelyn. I'll see you in a couple of days. Evelyn could hardly get a quick goodbye out before Biddy hung up. She stared at her phone, thinking about what she should have or shouldn't have said. She quietly returned to the kitchen when Charlie asked from his chair, What's going on with Biddy? Evelyn's heart dropped. Had Charlie been listening the whole time? I'm not exactly sure, Evelyn said. She said she's fine. Charlie pushed down his footrest, and the chair swung in its stationary position. She waited in the kitchen, holding the phone, questioning how loud she was talking as he walked toward her. Did she need to talk to Charlie about this? If he didn't hear, should she worry he'd have cold feet? What are you thinking right now? She asked, hoping if he had heard, he'd confess. I hope you know how much I love you, and love who you are, and love the life we're creating together, he said. She stood there, embarrassed and ashamed she had confided to Biddy about her silly doubts. I'm afraid to invite people over. Why? he asked, as his face pinched up in confusion. Because you just had a heart attack, she said. Plus, you never invited people to your apartment. Because I didn't have the space. He pointed to the gathering room. I hosted in my store. She looked away, feeling like a complete jerk. I like waking up and writing in my bed. She knew it sounded stupid, but it was her process. I like to open the curtains wide and make my espresso right there. You like to sleep in and keep the shades dark. He laughed. Then we'll wake up together and open the shades. He stood and walked to her and took her hands into his. I want you to live your best life. I want you to write and create in your space when you want to. I want to be surrounded by you and our friends and our family just like before. If you want separate spaces, fine. But all I want is to go along this journey together. You promise to stick around? Falling in love in her 20s had been so easy. Doubts hardly ever crept into her head. The uncertainties felt exciting and filled her with a happy euphoria. But now, in her late 50s, she had never been more afraid of falling in love again because she knew the possible ending, losing someone she loved. I promise. The alarm beeped, and Evelyn saw Renee coming into the house, holding George with Matteo behind her. What are you all doing here? Evelyn said, looking at the time. They were both out of work? We have an early Christmas present for you guys, Renee said, putting George down on the floor. He stood, holding onto Matteo's legs, wobbling with his balance. Evelyn reached out, and he dropped to the floor before crawling toward her. Oh, you sweet, sweet pumpkin. Evelyn missed having her little George at the house, but as she watched Matteo carefully remove Renee's coat and ask if he could get her anything, she was glad her daughter had this amazing man to take such good care of her. 
What's going on? Evelyn picked up George. Renee held a wrapped present in her hands and walked into the gathering room. Smiles spread wide across their faces. What are you up to? Evelyn said. Renee didn't relinquish the gift yet. Sit down, the two of you. Together, here. She pointed to the couch, and Matteo pulled out his phone. Uh, you guys came unannounced. Evelyn played with a loose ponytail as she and Charlie sat together on the couch. I wasn't expecting photos. You look amazing, Mom, Renee said. She winked at Matteo, and he pressed record on the phone. Okay, now you guys can open your present. Evelyn pulled open the lid, and inside was a photograph of Renee and George holding two buns in front of her belly. This is adorable, Evelyn said, looking at George's face as he had smiled at the camera. What's on your shirt? She pointed to the coffee table. Charlie, grab my readers over there. Charlie squinted and took in a quick breath, appearing shocked. Evelyn swiveled around to face him. His hand covered his mouth. What is it? Evelyn took the glasses quickly and looked at the shirts. Looks like an oven? She looked at Renee, who had tears in her eyes. Seriously, Mom, she said. You don't get it? Evelyn looked back at the photograph. It's a lovely little picture of the two of you. Two buns in the oven? Renee spun her hand in a circle, as if that would help jog the answer. Evelyn watched the movement, but it had no effect on her understanding. This made everyone else laugh. Is Stan wagging his tail? Yes, you're a baker. Evelyn looked at Charlie for help. What was she missing? I have two buns in my oven. Renee rubbed her belly. Oh, my goodness. Evelyn dropped the frame photograph, jumped up, and took Renee into her arms. Twins? Matteo nodded. We haven't told anyone, Renee said. I can't believe it. What can we do to help? Evelyn said. I'm going to need someone to run the bakery. A manager or something, Renee said. Evelyn watched as George raised his arms up at Charlie. Oh, buddy, I wish I could, but Grandpa Charlie's got a boo-boo. Charlie patted his chest. Mommy kiss boo-boos? George said to Charlie. His teeny voice made Evelyn's whole heart explode. Nana gave me lots of kisses, Charlie said. Cheese, Charlie, earmuffs, Renee said, laughing at her own joke. Charlie appeared horrified at first, but when he saw that Renee was kidding, he lifted his eyebrow playfully at Evelyn, which made her laugh. Things were good, really good. Evelyn didn't want this to change. Even with Charlie being here with her, it would be like this all the time. She squeezed Charlie's arm. We're going to be grandparents again. Chapter 18 Biddy wasn't stupid. The way Lila leaned closer, the way Drake smiled, the two were getting friendly, and she didn't need any more trouble during this vacation. God knows she'd love to see her son end up with a woman half as great as Lila, but it was the wrong place, wrong time. You should cool it on the wine. Biddy whispered, and stop flirting. Drake burrowed his eyebrows. I'm not flirting. I need this job. Drake looked at Biddy, then stood beside her at the counter as she stirred the pot of chili she had been cooking, while he and Lila had canoodled in the dining room after the snowy beach picnic. He crossed his arms. Besides, you don't have to work for them. You could come back to Oklahoma. I'd have to find a new job and a place to stay, she said. You already made it clear last summer that you wouldn't want me to stay with you. Drake looked at her, about to say something, and then shut his mouth. Go on, say it, Biddy said, bracing for the terrible life, terrible mother speech. I'm staying in a one bedroom with DJ, Drake said. The confession hit her like a mallet on her heart. He hadn't told her about the place he had moved into after leaving the big house he shared with Darlene. 
I'll have nowhere for you to stay. You live in an apartment now? Biddy stood at the island, staring back at him. All this time, she thought he was pussyfooting around that wife of his. You mean, you don't have the house anymore? He shook his head. She's still mad about everything. But she had left by then. We sold the house as fast as we could. He paused, rubbing his neck. I didn't really want a divorce, but there was nothing left to our marriage at that point. As much as she had hated Darlene for leaving, she hated her more for leaving her own son. And DJ, what about him? Drake let out a heavy sigh. Let's not go there. Then when, she wanted to ask, but she bit her tongue. What kind of mother left her son? Even from the beginning, she saw Drake holding on to something that had never really existed. Darlene had always been selfish. Biddy wasn't surprised that once the money was gone, so was Darlene. Biddy wanted to reach her hand out, brush his hair away from his face like she had when he was little, and tell him everything would be okay. Instead, she squeezed the wooden spoon and stirred. Just be careful with Lila, she said, changing the subject. I'm being respectful and friendly. Drake shifted down the counter, further away from her. She didn't want this to be a thing or make a big deal. She could tell he thought Lila was a gorgeous woman. Did he know she wasn't going to waste her time with a man like Drake? The salt of the earth kind of man? She had an important name to uphold and a social class she had to hang on to. As much as Lila wanted to change, and she had started, moving into Charlie's apartment, leaving her jerk fiancé behind, standing up to her mother and her friends, she still wasn't going to leave her luxurious life behind. She's got a lot of money, Biddy said under her breath. Her family comes from a lot of money. She looked out at Lila, who talked with DJ and Randy. She appreciated the young woman. Maybe she should just let things be. Lila was a grown woman with her own ideas about her life. But there was more to this visit than having a picnic and looking at some maps. Lila was avoiding something, and Biddy was pretty sure she was using her son as a distraction. Well, maybe a distraction was exactly what the two needed. Her phone lit up with a text message. You coming to the Christmas market? Tommy asked. She would have said yes under other circumstances, but with Drake here, she hesitated. Not sure. I was hoping to see you there. I'll be playing in the square at the lighting ceremony. Who's that? Drake asked. Oh, it's nobody. Biddy ignored the phone as it continued to light up. Drake made a face. You want me to be open and honest, but you can't even be honest with yourself. He snickered, lifting off the counter and walking away. She almost snapped something back, but stopped herself as Lila came bouncing into the kitchen. Thanks for letting me stick around, Lila said, all cheery and a bit tipsy. I love chili, but it's not something I've made before. It's one of Drake's favorites, Biddy said over the pot, hiding her anger brewing inside. All she had ever done was try to give that boy the best life. All that had happened, all that he was upset about, was of his own doing. Darlene had been a mess from the start, and then Drake had baby DJ and was too afraid of his temper tantrums to raise him to be respectful. Just as she whipped around to give Drake a piece of her mind, Lila wrapped her arms around Biddy's neck, holding her in a big embrace. I love you, Biddy she said with a hiccup. Thank you so much for including me with your family this holiday. Biddy snapped her mouth shut. She realized Lila was alone. Where was her family? Her mother hadn't been over to the house in weeks. Well, you're more than welcome any time. Biddy shot a look at Drake, who had long gone to the family room to sit with Randy and watch the game. You'd think they'd have a roof, Drake said, 
as they watched Gillette Stadium get covered in snow. Randy growled something she couldn't hear, but Drake laughed good-humoredly. She stood frozen, watching the interaction. What was she doing? This was a second chance with her son, and she was ruining it. He was dang right about her being dishonest. He owed her nothing. Certainly not her problems or opinions. She didn't appreciate it, so why would she think her son would? First, she needed to give herself some grace. She was going to mess up. Parenting was a hard gig. The bigger the children, the bigger the problems. She'd start fresh from this moment forward and do what she did best. Support the people she loved by feeding them, nourishing them, and taking care of them. If Drake needed her support, she'd be there. But she'd wait for him to reach out for help, not push it on him. She'd step back from disciplining and just be a grandmother to DJ. She grabbed the big bowls from the cupboard and collected enough spoons for everyone, then pulled out her corn muffins from the oven. She made sure DJ had his milk placed on the right in front of his fork. Randy had a cold bottle of a light ale. All right, she called out, popping the muffins from the tin into a bread basket. Time to eat. Chapter 19 Lila caught herself staring at Drake's honey brown eyes again and wished she could stab herself with a butter knife to stop, but she couldn't help herself. Her phone buzzed with texts. Joel had gone to the house, hence the need to have a picnic in the middle of winter on Martha's Vineyard. Thank God for Pops, because she knew she had looked absolutely crazy when she suggested a picnic in the middle of a nor'easter, but Pops was always up for a picnic on the ocean. It's what she loved about him. So it went without saying that her crush magnified when Drake went along without question. No complaints about the weather, no bother asking questions, no urges to go back inside. She had recognized his expression at Symphony Cove. It was pure amazement. She felt that adrenaline rush only from Mother Nature. A rebirth, a reckoning to one's place on Earth. Another buzz from her phone, and she slid it away from her at the dining table. She had settled on a red wine. She wasn't going home, not in this storm. She contemplated going back to the big house and seeing Joel. What would she say? She hadn't told anyone how he continued to text her, just like before. He'd tell her how sorry he was, that he missed how things used to be. He'd send pictures of the good old days and apologize for ruining everything. She didn't respond. But she also didn't block him. She didn't ask if he was going to her parents. She didn't even ask her parents if they had left. She called Andrew only when he called her, and they never spoke about Joel. She hadn't even told Harper about what she'd heard about Palm Beach and Joel's invitation. Looks like someone wants to talk to you, Drake said, nodding at her phone lighting up with texts, then poured more red wine into her glass. He poured the rest of the bottle into a mug for himself. Is it me, or is DJ growing on Randy? Lila smiled at the two peas in a pod. I know, Pops loves talking about the ocean. DJ was a clever little boy, even getting better behaved as the days went on. Family could do that to someone, she supposed. Her grandparents had always been the refuge for her during her hardest times. She sure missed Grandma Linda. She leaned to the other side of her chair and adjusted her legs, and she got a sniff of his cologne. He even smelled like how she had imagined a cowboy would smell. A rustic, musky, earthy scent mixed with sandalwood. Good thing she was sitting down. Drake adjusted in his own seat, and his knee just nicked hers. Her face heated immediately. Sorry, he said, adjusting again, further away from her. Lila got up, grabbing her bowl of chili. I'm going to help clean up. Drake stood up too. He picked up his dish. I'll help. She smiled and walked into the kitchen. We've got this, she said to Biddy, who had started to fill the sink. Biddy looked to Lila, then to Drake. You got this? Lila nodded. Go sit. Drake dropped the dishes in the sink. 
Yes, we've got it. Biddy slapped her hands together. Well, all right then. She took off her apron and walked down the hall toward the laundry room. Lila went back to the dining room to collect the rest of the food and dishes from the table. She couldn't remember the last time she'd had a family dinner like that, or anything else as a family at her parents' house. Joel and her usually ate out. They'd meet up with her parents after their day at the wharf or the country club. She dreaded those nights. She'd wanted the ones where Joel would order in for the two of them and surprise her on the beach. She'd like the nights they'd sit up for hours talking about their three make-believe babies. Two sons and a daughter who looked just like Lila. Her phone buzzed again, dancing on the table. In the family room, Biddy sat next to DJ as he flipped through the pages of another book Lila had brought over. It had been a book of photography, of Sugar Beach's shoreline over a year. All the different scenes throughout the year, the weather changes, the gorgeous sunrises and sunsets, and cool treasures that had washed up on shore. DJ was fascinated. Another text notification dinged. Do you need to respond to those? Drake asked from the sink as she walked in. No, it's just my ex fiance Joel. The two glasses of wine made her speak easy. She didn't need to hide the truth with this stranger. He didn't care. Not like Sonia or her friends. He's a doctor. and My family loves him more than me. She looked at her empty wine glass and reached out for another bottle. Whoa, Drake said. He peeked into the family room. Biddy wants me to slow you down. Slow me down? Lila gruffed out. Her mouth gaped open. I'm a grown woman. I can drink as much as I want. Live where I want. Throw away what I want. She grabbed the bottle and began to rummage through the drawers. Where's the bottle opener? Grab me a beer, Randy called out from the family room. Absolutely, Lila said back to him. Sonia would show her disapproval if she saw Lila drunk. Women of society didn't get drunk, or have flatulence, or do anything fun. She pulled out another drawer and dug through the utensils, looking for a corkscrew. Maybe you should have something to eat, Drake said. He kept looking in the family room. Do you know how cute you are when you listen to your mama? Lila asked him in a heavy Oklahoman drawl she had picked up being around Biddy. She was fully flirting at this point. A smile drew up the right side of his mouth, and all Lila wanted to do was kiss him. Biddy worries too much, Lila said, stopping just shy of touching his juicy, muscular arms. He played along. I know where the bottle opener is. Where? she asked. He pointed at Biddy's purse. Grandmother Barbara, she whispered in shock. She's worse than my mother. She went to the purse and peeked over the top. Then with a stealthy movement, she swiped the wine opener out of the bag and ran back to the kitchen. She giggled loudly, catching Randy's and Biddy's attentions. Drake lifted his finger to his mouth and shushed her. She'll catch us. Then he took the bottle and the opener, stabbed the cork with the steel corkscrew, twisted and popped it off. Grab my mug. Lila looked out into the black night. Everything outside glowed under a full moon, peeking out of the clouds. The last of the snow fell slow, in big clumps, dropping on the ground onto what looked like a white blanket. Let's go back to the beach, she said. She got up from her chair, picked up her jacket, and put it on. You coming? He looked back at the family room. Randy had fallen asleep. DJ's head was in another book. And Biddy worked on a Sudoku. Absolutely. When Lila stepped outside, the world seemed to quiet for her. Even the waves slowed and could hardly be heard other than with a dull roar. She could hear the snow crunch under her feet, but she could barely feel them, and she wasn't cold. The wine had warmed her and numbed her. She stood on the walkway to the beach at the railing that overlooked Symphony Cove. 
The waves had died down, but their force still beat against the rocky shore like powerful drums. She looked up to the stars. Aren't they brighter out here than anywhere else? He shook his head. There's no brighter sky than on the open prairie. As if, she said, facing the water. With the black water reflecting the light, it shimmers like diamonds. She pointed to the water. It's magical. He looked to where she pointed, leaning his hands on the railing. He took in a breath. Sure does make you clear your head. Always. Lila thought about the prairie and the wide open spaces and waves of grain. I bet the prairie is just like this in a way. Yes, it can make you forget about all your problems, that's for sure. He exhaled out a long, low breath. Before my stepfather died, I'd sit, lost in the fields, the wind unrelentless, the noise from the insects screeching, the heat from the sun. I loved it. It always changed my perspective. Do you miss it? Lila asked. God, yes. He sighed. It was exactly what I wanted to do. But when Richard died, I lost my job. So I took the first job that I found to pay the bills, you know. Lila didn't know. She had never been in that position. Never had to worry about where the money was coming from. She had been extremely blessed. I never thought I could earn money. Never thought I was good enough. He looked surprised. You're good at everything. She laughed. I wanted to run my father's business. I wanted Whitmore and Whitmore on the front of his law offices. She trailed off, thinking about how embarrassed she had been when her father had blown up that idea. And? Drake said, waiting for her to continue. And? My father said that I'd make a wonderful wife and mother and that Andrew was the Whitmore he wanted for a partner. Ouch, Drake said. So I spent the last five years pining after this life that didn't amount to anything. She laughed at her pitiful self. And a guy who didn't even want a wife. He's a fool, whoever Joel is, Drake said. I don't know what happened between you two, but I'd never let you go. The wind swept up her hair, and her breath was taken away with it. The waves pounded again and again as she stared into his eyes, lost in the dark, deep chocolates. Without another thought, Lila wrapped her arms around his neck, and instantly his long, strong arms held her in an embrace. She closed her eyes as he leaned forward and kissed her. Chapter 20 Drake didn't mind being alone. He certainly wasn't looking for a relationship. Most of the time, he preferred it. Maybe that was one of the reasons why DJ didn't mind being by himself. But as he sat in Randy's family room, waiting for Lila to wake up, and the fallout that would come from kissing her, he realized he hadn't been around people in a long time. When had he stopped hanging out? Before Darlene and him had gotten married after DJ was born. He had been known to meet his friends at the local dive bar, but since DJ, he hadn't stepped foot in a bar. He had loved Darlene and didn't mind giving up going out with friends. All he had ever wanted was to be a family man, and he'd had a beautiful wife and son. Then, just like everything else in Drake's life, it was all blown to pieces just as things felt right. Darlene had left him, which meant she'd left DJ. Drake had been broken about it, but he hadn't broken down until she called that one night. I can't take him, she'd said over the phone. What do you mean? The house had been sold, and she had moved out months ago into her new boyfriend's place. He doesn't like DJ, she'd whispered, not saying the man's name. He can't stay here. Drake had looked around the temporary apartment he'd managed to get. The house had sold for less than what they owed. 
He had to bring a check to the closing, his whole savings wiped away. He'd snuck a glance at DJ, who had sat at the apartment's furnished round table, reading a book. Drake had gotten up off the queen-sized bed and had gone into the bathroom, locking the door behind him. Darlene, you're his mother. Look, Drake, this relationship is important to me, she'd said. He couldn't believe her. Darlene, you can't be serious. Drake, please, I can't take him. He didn't listen to her excuses. He just hung up. He couldn't hear another word from that woman's mouth. That's when he told DJ about the trip to Martha's Vineyard. We're going to visit Grammy Biddy. When Drake's father had left, Drake had been glad. Life had become easier without the drunk around. But DJ wasn't like Drake. He was sensitive, angry, smart. God, he understood everything, even if he didn't understand everything. He knew the trip was a cover-up the second he'd mentioned it. Her boyfriend doesn't want me there, does he? DJ had asked. Drake could get over the fact she had cheated. He could get over her betrayal. But he couldn't get over the fact she had abandoned her son. Here, you can use these, Randy said, handing DJ his binoculars. DJ's face lit up. Really? Randy gave DJ a nod. Just as long as you continue to be careful. Yes, sir, DJ said. That had been his mistake with Darlene. He had overlooked her bad behavior. Now, as he waited for Lila to appear from her room, he wished he hadn't kissed Lila back. He should have just let her kiss him, take her back home in one piece. But like the knucklehead he was, he had kissed her back and had kept kissing. And man, was she good at kissing. He bounced his knee up and down as he waited for her to leave her room. Would she wake up and regret what had happened last night? Would she remember? Oh, God. He should have listened to his mother. She kept telling him she'd only wanted to kiss. This is just kissing. Nothing else, she'd said, slurring her words. But she had kissed him again and again. And he didn't mind kissing. But as he waited for her to wake up after sleeping off her few glasses of wine, he worried she'd have some regrets. He had snuck her into the guest room after they'd come back from the beach. By that time, she had started crying. He'd tucked her in the bed. She spoke in barely comprehensible sentences, talking about how she loved the smell of bread. It just comes up through the floor. She had mumbled as he'd pulled the covers over her shoulders. Good night, Lila, he had whispered. Good night, Joel, she had blabbered back. Ugh. The memory still made him slightly embarrassed as he waited for Sleeping Beauty to wake up. DJ, who suspected something was wrong with Lila, perseverated on the fact she wasn't up yet. It's still really early, Drake said, trying to avoid Biddy's look. She's usually an early riser, Randy said now sounding a bit concerned, like DJ. Biddy narrowed her eyes and side-glanced at Drake. Well, maybe she's under the weather this morning. Good morning. Lila came prancing down the hall. Her demeanor was bubbly and happy, and she came hungry. As soon as she sat down at the table, she grabbed a couple slices of bacon, two pieces of toast, and eggs before anyone had a chance to offer her some. This smells delicious, Biddy. How do you know it's Biddy who cooked breakfast? Randy said. He gave Drake a smirk. Drake smiled up at Lila, hoping she'd be cool. What was one night of kissing? They were consenting adults who had wanted to kiss. So what? What was wrong with that? But when she looked his way, her eyes bulged out in what looked like horror and true concern. She practically dropped her plate on the table, then stuffed a piece of toast in her mouth and mumbled, It's delicious. I'd wait to give compliments until after you eat, DJ said, pushing around his eggs. 
It's great, Biddy said, nudging DJ with her elbow. DJ didn't flinch like he first had when he had arrived. Had DJ finally warmed up a bit to Biddy? Well, I love any kind of eggs, Lila said to DJ, keeping her eyes directly on DJ or the eggs. So while Drake avoided his mother's stare, Lila avoided any acknowledgement of his presence. She downed a glass of water and took a large bite of eggs. After twenty minutes of awkward eating, Lila got up and announced she was leaving. The snow's cleared, and I should get back, she said in a friendly goodbye. He wondered how much she remembered, because that was another thing she had mentioned in a drunken babble. She lived in a new apartment, and no one had been to visit. She didn't take long to grab her coat and take off. She kissed Randy on the cheek and avoided Drake almost completely until she opened the door to leave. Have a good day, Lila, he said. He didn't want things to be weird for her. He walked to the hallway, just close enough for only her to hear, and said, I had a nice time last night. Thanks for showing me the cove and everything. She looked at him. He could tell she had missing pieces of the night before. The longer she looked, the more she didn't remember, he guessed. Did we kiss? She whispered. He nodded, then gave her his best smile. It was nice. She took in a breath. Oh, boy. She looked behind him. Does Biddy know? The words were like a soft punch to his stomach. He knew it wasn't the right time, but was she embarrassed? He shook his head. Your secret is safe with me. Lila gave him a side eye, watching his reaction. He stuffed his hands into the pockets of his jeans and shrugged. I had a nice time too, she said quickly. Playing with the zipper of her expensive down coat someone would find on the trails of Vail. You and DJ should bring Biddy to the Christmas market tonight. You should come with us, show us around. He suggested it as a way to lighten the mood. Sure, he was cool with everything, but then something inside him hoped she'd say yes. She waved her hand. Oh, I don't think so. Not this year. She turned the doorknob before he could convince her otherwise and was out of the house. He waited while Randy and DJ were finishing breakfast and said, You still want me to get that oil change? Randy grinned wide, shaking his pointer finger at him. That would be great. Drake grabbed the keys and listened as Biddy warned him about the roads. They always have a sheet of ice on them once it snows, Biddy said, following him out to the garage. If you feel like you need me to pick you up, just call the house. Ma. Drake swore she still thought he was 16. I've been driving for almost 20 years. She looked wary. I'll be fine. He didn't waste any time. DJ didn't seem to notice, or at this point, care he'd be left alone with Biddy and Randy. Then out of nowhere, Biddy reached out and gave him a hug. I'm just so glad you're here. At first, Drake stiffened, unable to reciprocate, wondering what the embrace was about. But when his mother didn't let go and pulled him in tighter, memories of her flashed through his mind. Memories of feeling safe and protected and supported. Memories of when anything he did seemed to please his beautiful mother. I love you, Mom, he said, and he meant it with his full heart. I'm here for you too, you know. She squeezed harder, but didn't say anything. She just held him against her. That's more like it, Randy said, scooting through the kitchen with the mug straight to the coffee maker. Biddy let go, stepping back, tilting her head at him. Funny how all he ever wanted was to make her proud. Proud to be his mother. Proud to be his child's grandmother. He shook the keys. I'll be back. Make sure you use your phone to find where you're going, Biddy said. And call if you can't. He looked to DJ at the coffee table, probably on his 24th book by now, and waved. 
You good with Grammy Biddy? And Randy, DJ added. Pops to you, young man, Randy said, walking back into the family room with his coffee. Biddy popped a smile. Where's that bakery you keep talking about? He asked her casually. Right on Harbor Lane, by the ferry docks where you came in, Biddy explained, walking back to the kitchen. He waved one last goodbye, and for the first time in a very long time, he was completely alone as he sat in Randy's Buick sedan. It had roughly 16,000 miles and a full tank of gas. Randy probably didn't even need an oil change. He pressed the start engine button, and as he looked behind him, he said, Thanks, Randy. He pulled out of the garage and swung a left. He headed down toward the harbor, where he and DJ rode the ferry in. He followed the winding roads around the island, snow covering every surface with the fluffiest white crystals. The sky had never seemed as blue, and even the Atlantic sparkled from the bright sun. The roads and sky were clear. There was a bakery he wanted to stop by. Chapter 21 I kissed him! Lila put her head between her hands as she sat at the table on Harper's boat. You kissed Biddy's son? Harper's eyes widened as she sat down. Don't say it like that. Lila couldn't believe she had kissed him. What had she been thinking? Biddy had even warned her not to do anything. I'm so embarrassed. Why? Harper asked. Because I drank too much, kissed a stranger, and my family's going to kill me. I won't tell Andrew, Harper said. But Lila had her doubts. Harper told Andrew what she dreamt about and what she had for breakfast. I should have just stayed home. Lila slammed her forehead on the table. Boo, Harper said, getting up and out of the bench seat. You need to kiss more. Lila looked up. Are you crazy? Harper made a serious face. I'm absolutely 100% not crazy. I think I cried last night about Joel. Her stomach sank. She couldn't remember if she had or not, but her swollen, puffy eyes led her to believe it was more of a pathetic sob. I'm so embarrassed. It's fine, Harper said. Go back to your apartment, grab a bottle of wine, get into your loungewear, and we'll have girls' night. Lila shook her head. I can't even think of drinking. She knew she had talked about the apartment last night with Drake. Negatively, too. It had been a hard balance to be excited about a place Harper had grown up in, but also not feel like a complete loser at the same time. The apartment represented her new independence. But the apartment also represented the worst time of her life. She didn't want to go back there. All she wanted to do was run away from it. She didn't want to face the truth of her situation. Even after her display at the luncheon, no one had checked up on her. Not one of her friends had called to make sure she was okay. Not one of her mother's friends, who had watched her grow up. Her mother didn't seem to worry about anyone but herself. Andrew, who was always busy, had promised he'd check in after the holidays. She didn't need people after the holidays. She needed someone now. Her grandmother would have come, with brownies or some kind of cake. She'd have brought a blanket she had quilted or crocheted. She would have told her to get new curtains. She'd have helped to make the place a home. Do you think you could come with me to my old place and help me pick up a few things? Lila asked. Harper looked surprised. I thought you wanted it all to burn. Lila did. She really didn't want anything from the house that reminded her of Joel. But there were things that reminded her of her. Pillows, blankets a few pieces that she'd bought that she still liked. I just want to pick up a few things of mine. Lila thought about the items her grandmother had given her before she had died. Things that wouldn't mean anything to Joel, but were important to Lila. Handmade oven mitts she'd made with her grandmother when she was a kid. Embroidered towels Grandma Linda had made when Lila had gone to law school. And more. 
I walked here, Lila said. Want to come with me to get my car? Only if we grab a scone on the way, Harper said. Deal, Lila said, sliding out of the booth seat of the boat's table. I'll be back, Joan, Harper said to her cat, who lay on top of her pillow. See you, Joan, Lila said. Then a thought sprung into her head. I could get a pet? Harper nodded. Yep. Lila had never had a pet before. Her father had been allergic. Joel hadn't wanted one because they were too much work. But Lila had always wanted a dog, or even a cat. She had volunteered at the shelter, but she never got over the terrible feeling of having to leave them behind when she could have taken them home. I could foster, Lila said remembering how hard it was for the shelter to find the families willing to take the animals. You could, Harper said as they walked down the dock. Now we're just a walk away from each other. Lila smiled. All the years she'd grown up on the island, she rarely left her little neighborhood the locals referred to as Cliffside Point. She looked down the docks to the main road that went through the tiny village of Eastport. The stores all had the traditional gray clapboard and white shutters. Each of the buildings were decorated for Christmas. Lights and garland hung from the porches and around the windows, winding around railings and lampposts. The window boxes had evergreens with a whimsical nautical touch of shells and starfish instead of the usual glass ornament balls. The island felt quiet, with just locals bustling around Harbor Lane, the stores all setting up shop on the sidewalks for the Christmas market. The town shut down the main strip to only foot traffic. I'll have a front row seat this year, Lila said, thinking about the front window of the apartment that looked down on the festivities. You'll be able to see the whole parade, Harper said, happy to share the ins and outs of living above the bakery. A whiff of freshly baked bread and confectioner's sugar wafted into the air as they reached the front of the building. Lila ducked as soon as she saw who stood in line inside the bakery. Oh, my God, she ducked behind Harper. What is it? Harper asked. It's Drake, Lila hissed. Harper moved closer to the picture window to look inside the bakery. Are you talking about that man in line? Lila peeked over Harper's shoulder. That's when Drake turned around and began to walk out of the bakery. He didn't seem to notice them. As he walked out, Lila dashed around the side of the building and dove into a bush. Your cowboy is hot, Harper said. He's not my cowboy, Lila shushed back. She peeked through the branches, snow dumping on her head, making her headache even more miserable. He's going around the back, Harper said, standing up more on her tiptoes. She peeked around to the front of the building. Is he going to visit you? Lila looked up at the apartment. Maybe he parked in back. Harper walked the other way, toward the back of the building. No, I think he's going up the stairs. Lila ran out of the bushes to the edge of the building, listening as cowboy boot heels pounded up the back staircase to the apartment. Maybe he wants to kiss some more, Harper whispered. Maybe he wants me to leave him alone. Lila thought back to when she had visited Harper in that exact place all those months ago. She had confronted Harper, thinking she was the other woman. She hadn't suspected her best friend at that point, but she had a feeling he had been with other women. She had thought that was the worst moment of her life, but that had been only the tipping point. Things got much worse. It wasn't only his trainer and assistant, but Abigail, her best friend, too. You should go up there! Harper said excitedly, nudging her with her elbow. God, she wished she was more like Harper. She took life as it came, riding it like a sailboat on the open water. No matter what came at her, she didn't seem to get deterred. I can't go up there, Lila said, backing into a hiding space. Why not? Harper asked. Lila stood like a statue, unsure. I don't know. They both listened as they heard him knocking, a muffled voice, a few seconds of silence, and then footsteps down the wooden stairs. He swung the back door open and headed toward a car she recognized. 
He's driving Pop's car, she whispered to Harper. He drove out of the space, down the alley toward the other end of the parking lot, and left. His hands were empty, Harper said, running around the back of the building. What? He was carrying a box and a Christmas bag before. She yelled behind her, but she kept running up the back steps to the door. She waited as Lila followed behind with a key. Harper pointed to the package. Open it. A white pastry box sat in front of a Christmas gift bag. White tissue paper tufted out of the opening. Lila picked it up, looking at the small tag tied to the handle. It doesn't have a name, she said. She peeked inside the bag but saw no card, nothing but tissue paper. Open it, Harper shrieked, clapping her hands. Lila realized her hands were trembling. She pulled out the tissue papers and tossed them to the floor. Her heart stopped as she looked inside. There, sitting at the bottom of the bag, was a white box. On the top, handwritten in a clean print, said, Merry Christmas. She pulled the box out of the gift bag and let it drop to the floor before opening the top. A glass ornament, one that she recognized from a local store, was hand-blown with reds and greens and golds swirled together around the glass ball. It was absolutely beautiful. Your first ornament, Harper said, getting a better look. I bet it's for Mrs. Mansfield's place. The small art gallery held mostly local homemade pieces, things her mother and friends would turn their noses at. Let's go get more, she said to Harper. Harper smiled. Okay. The local shop sat right across the street from the bakery. The local artists, usually people who painted or sculpted, weren't from fancy art schools or had features written up about them. They sold their pieces at local art shows or farmer's markets. In the art world, they would be novices, even though Lila couldn't tell the difference in talent. Some of the local artists had true talent. They may have mostly just painted the landscapes the tourists wanted, but their talents were undeniable. She unlocked the door and set her new ornament on the kitchen table Charlie had left, an old round oak table that Sonia would have burned before decorating. She took the glass ornament out of its box, grabbed a wine glass, and set it inside. I'm going to need a tree. The pastry box had been filled with Christmas cookies, which Lila brought along with her and Harper as they talked with Mrs. Mansfield. A very handsome man with a southern accent bought it, she said to Lila. She lowered her voice. Very handsome. I'd like the rest, Lila said. Well, we have what you see on the display. Lila walked to the wooden Christmas tree made from driftwood. Branches, softened by the salt water, stretched out, with glass ornament balls hanging from each of them. I'll take them all, Lila said. Then she pointed to one of her favorite watercolors a woman from the other side of the island painted. I'll take Elaine's watercolor as well. Mrs. Mansfield smiled. That's a gorgeous piece. Is this a Christmas present for someone? Lila nodded. For me. Mrs. Mansfield looked surprised. Well, good choice. I'll wrap them all up for you, Ms. Whitmore. Lila winced. She didn't want to be known as a Whitmore. Lila. It's just Lila. Yes, Lila. Of course. Mrs. Mansfield smiled again, then went to the back and collected small white boxes with tissue paper. Lila stood in front of the painting. She had been a frugal trust fund baby. She never did something this spontaneous, like buy a bunch of glass ornaments or a painting. But she would spend it on Joel, his company, his art hanging in his lobby, his office, and usually she only would if she got approval. Well, she no longer needed approval. The money had come from her grandmother, not Sonia or her father or Joel. Her money was now hers, and no one could tell her what to buy or where to live. Where are you going to hang it? Harper asked. Right above the mantle, Lila said. Harper nodded with appreciation. That's the perfect place for it. I don't even have a hammer, 
Lila said. She usually asked Joel. Mr. Thompson should sell starter toolboxes, Harper said. You know, for people moving into their first place. The essentials. That's a great idea. Mrs. Mansfield walked over to the women with the painting in a large box. I put in two pieces of backing paper along with some bubble wrap. Great. Thanks, Mrs. Mansfield, Lila said. Good luck, Lila. Mrs. Mansfield gave her one final smile. Lila didn't know the older woman very well, but she took the comment as genuine. You have a really nice place here. She gave Lila a nod. Yes. Come back in the spring when new art comes in. Lila held up the painting. I'll be sure to tell everyone where I purchased this. You should stop at the hardware store on the way to your new apartment, Mrs. Mansfield suggested. I think I'll be okay, Lila said to Harper as they walked out of the gallery. I don't need to go back to the house. Well, let me know if you do, Harper said. I'm happy to go over there and get something if you need it. Lila nodded, but she had everything she had wanted and decided right then to make a fresh start and move on. She needed to be Lila, and only Lila. Harper headed back to the boat, and Lila marched upstairs to her new apartment and created a list of things she wanted for the place. A new couch, maybe a sectional. Then she looked around the room, noticing how it was set up, how many windows there were, where the gas stove sat in the corner, and where the best place she'd hang her new painting. Then she added drapes and a hammer and nails and a toilet plunger to the list. She thought about how the bedroom needed a rug. She rushed to the bedroom and looked out the front windows. The Christmas market would be set up by now. She looked out at Harbor Lane, the sun setting off in the distance over the water behind the buildings. Twinkling lights and music played below. The local stores were setting up tables full of Christmas gifts to buy. Lila had always volunteered before, and complained about the whole thing. But looking from above, it was magical. The whole village had been decorated in Christmas as if it had always been that way. From below, she could smell bread through the floors. Then she saw Renee with Matteo, and George holding their hands in between them. A pang in Lila's heart made her sit and stare. That could have been her. No. That was never going to be her. She thought about Drake, how great a father he was to DJ, and how hard he was trying with Biddy. What kind of woman would let a man so protective, so thoughtful, and so handsome go? It was none of her business, she supposed. She looked out at the sky as it turned shades of pinks and purples. Pink at night, sailor's delight she said to herself. She stood up. What was she doing feeling sorry for herself? She wasn't dead or sick or mentally broken. Sure, a guy broke her heart. But what if she had gotten the marriage and the child? She'd be miserable like her mother. Confronting the truth that day with Harper had been the best thing she had ever done. It started the journey she was on. Maybe not the luxurious and sophisticated journey her parents would have liked but hers, and hers alone. With a pen in hand, she started a new list, a Christmas list with everyone she could think of. Pops, Andrew, her parents, Harper, the ladies, DJ, and Drake. She was about to write Mom and Dad, but stopped herself. Christmas was a time for family. Maybe Abigail made up the story of Joel going to Palm Beach. Sonia acted as though she had no idea. Maybe Lila got it all wrong. She picked up her phone and stared at her mother's number. She was guilty of jumping to conclusions. Maybe Joel wasn't going. She dialed Sonia's number. Lila, what's wrong? Her mother said. Lila realized she hadn't called her mom in a long time. Oh, nothing. I was just calling. She bit her lip as the question hung in her head but there was no point holding back now. Have you left for Florida? There was a long silence on the other end, 
she could envision her mother standing in the big, empty house. No, I've decided to stay home. Sonia's voice sounded like a knife chopping against a cutting board. You're not going? What about Dad? He's already there, she said, cold and hard. And you're not going? Lila didn't understand. I heard you're not going, Sonia said, from the real estate agent. Lila took in a breath. Oh. Sonia tisked on the other end. I also ran into Joel at the house. Lila waited for Sonia to give her an update. He told me you moved out. Sonia cleared her throat. Apparently, everyone knows what's going on with my daughter besides me. Instantly, guilt flooded over Lila. I'm sorry, I should have told you. Lila hadn't meant to leave Sonia out, but the truth was, she didn't want to have to defend herself any longer. She was exhausted. Honestly, you didn't seem to want to support me. I always support my children, Sonia snapped back. Just because you don't like the way I do it doesn't mean I'm not supporting you. Lila could feel herself shut down, her mother's dominance weighing on her shoulders. The need to apologize, to get forgiveness, clawed at her. It would be so easy to just apologize, take the blame and start right back where they were before. She looked out at the market through the window. People started gathering on the streets. Families and friends of Martha's Vineyard, who were crazy enough to stay on the island all year. Each of the stalls had been decorated with lights and Christmas decorations. Tommy and his band played Christmas music in the gazebo by the dock. With the newly fallen snow, the small village looked like a storybook. That's when she saw him. Those big brown eyes looking up at her apartment window. I've got to go, Lila said. But feel free to come over and we could go to the bakery or whatever. Lila! Her mother snapped out her name, not finished with the conversation. Bye. She hung up the phone and watched as Drake walked beside DJ and Biddy. The three all headed toward the bakery. She stepped back in the shadows of her apartment, trying not to be seen. She tapped her phone with her fingers, wondering what she should do. Drake's present had been one of the most romantic gestures ever given to her. Yet... She couldn't figure out what it might mean. She thought about Biddy, and how she would feel if she knew they had been kissing under the stars wrapped in a blanket of snow. The whole thing had been very romantic. But the circumstances that brought them together were blaring right in front of her. Drake was going through a divorce. Lila was going through an early midlife crisis. It shouldn't be romantic. She didn't have the heart to go through another romantic catastrophe. But when she snuck a look again, his eyes caught hers. Her breath swept up in her chest as her heart pounded. Her hand fell against her chest as she tried to catch her breath. That cowboy did something to her. She ran to the mirror. She hadn't put makeup on or done anything special with her hair, other than throwing it up into a bun. She wore a baggy sweater with a pair of plain jeans, but as she looked in the mirror, ready to hide, she felt prettier, not so fake. She rushed to the door, grabbing her list on the way. She'd say she decided to shop after all. But as she opened the door to her apartment, she saw three figures walking up the staircase. Surprise, Biddy called out. Your apartment is approximately 500 feet from the water's edge, DJ informed her. Drake smiled at her from behind them. We thought we'd come visit the new place. Biddy handed over a white pastry box along with a book. Renee wanted you to have this, and Randy wanted you to have that. She looked at the copy of Charles Dickens. You guys finished? DJ nodded. And everyone lives happily ever after. He sounded annoyed. Everyone in Star Wars lives happily ever after. Yes, but those stories are fantasy and set in the future, DJ rationalized. Charles Dickens writes realistic fiction, and children are still working in factories. Drake placed a hand on his shoulder. 
We also brought you something for the apartment. Yes, I got it. She turned to gesture toward the room, but realized he wasn't talking about the ornament. Biddy's eyebrows wrinkled, and she looked back at her son. He smiled wider, handing over a small package wrapped in Christmas paper. DJ picked it. She could tell right away it was a book. It's a history book of Martha's Vineyard, DJ blurted out. She smiled as she read the title. DJ stepped up to her door and took the book from her hands. On page 73, it talks about the Wampanoag god Moshup, but doesn't discuss the mermaid woman you talked about, he explained, flipping to an illustrated page of the image of Moshup. It's beautiful, she said, and she rubbed DJ's back with her hand. I'm going to leave it on my coffee table. She could almost see him itch to see inside. Would you like to put it there? It's the room right through the kitchen. Biddy followed inside with Drake behind her. What a beautiful painting, Biddy said. Drake stayed behind by the door, his hands in his pockets. The energy wasn't weird or uncomfortable, but she hesitated to say anything. How's the new place? he asked. It's different, but I'm starting to get used to it, she said, looking around. There were only a few things that were hers in the space. But she would slowly make it her own. Well, we won't keep you, Biddy said, dragging DJ from the coffee table. You know, Lila said suddenly, I was just about to hit the Christmas market to look for Christmas gifts. Funny, Drake said. We were just about to go check it out. Biddy clapped her hands together at the coincidence, but Drake lifted the left side of his mouth in a grin as he stared at her. You have to come with us. Her heart sped up as he kept his eyes on her. That sounds great. Chapter 22 When Andrew told Harper about Joel's invitation to his parents' Christmas, she immediately thought about her own mother, Tanya. She wasn't much of a mother, but she'd never hurt her on purpose. Do your parents know what Joel did to her? She asked Andrew on the phone. She felt sick to her stomach that she'd left Lila alone that afternoon. She was probably falling apart, and Harper had gone home to play with her cat, who didn't even like her that much. I'm such a bad friend. Stop. You didn't know. Andrew reminded her. But to invite Joel to Christmas? She couldn't imagine what a slap in the face that must have felt like to Lila. Especially with all this business about the house. No wonder she left everything when she moved. I know, Andrew said. I'm going to come to the island this weekend and stay until Christmas. Harper's heart skipped a beat. She loved when Andrew came to the island for an extended period of time. Are you going to stay at your pops? She asked. Because Biddy's son and grandson are staying. Oh, that's right, Andrew said. I'll stay at my parents then. You could always stay on the boat with me, Harper offered. Andrew laughed. I'm afraid Joan and Charlie will plot my death if I stayed. Baby, Harper teased. But she appreciated Andrew respecting her father. Charlie wouldn't like the idea of her boyfriend spending the night, even if she was an adult. It was old-fashioned. All her friends had lived with their partners, but she liked the idea of going to bed excited to see him again. She wanted to always feel that. I'll see you tomorrow, Andrew said. Tomorrow. Harper didn't waste another minute before leaving the boat and heading over to Lila's place. She texted, I'm on my way but didn't wait for a response. She marched up the dock to Harbor Lane, confronted by all the holiday shoppers. Merry Christmas, Harper, Mr. Thompson called out from the hardware store. Mrs. Mansfield told me you and Ms. Whitmore were looking for a starter toolbox. Harper thought about the art gallery and what she had said. News certainly traveled fast on the island. Yes, we were. Merry Christmas, he said, handing her two red metal boxes with his logo on the front. Mr. Thompson, let me pay for them, she said. If you start using them, you'll be buying plenty from my store. 
he winked. Come in for anything on your next project. Harper held up the long, skinny boxes. Thanks, I will. He gave her a nod and waved as she continued to walk to Lila's. Harper couldn't wait to show Lila, who needed some more Christmas cheer. She squeezed the toolbox's handles as she thought of Joel showing up at her parents' house for the holidays. Before she had time to turn around, as Harper started to climb the stairs to the apartment, Lila's mother climbed down. Oh, hello, Mrs. Whitmore, she said formally. She hadn't spent more than a dinner with Sonia Whitmore. Harper, it's nice to see you again. She didn't move from the steps. She's not home. Harper looked at the woman, dressed in a camel cashmere coat, fitted against her slim figure. She wore high-heeled boots that seemed completely impractical with the recent snowstorm, but shined the Christmas lights in their black leather. Her silk scarf was a dark evergreen color with blood-red polka dots, a chic expression of the holidays, but it felt fake and commercialized. Oh, shoot! Harper held up the toolboxes, feeling completely uncomfortable in Sonia's presence. Well, let her know I stopped by. You might be better off telling her yourself, Sonia said. She's not really talking to me. Harper groaned inside. She didn't know exactly the relationship between Lila and her mother, but she did know she was Team Lila. Well, I'll be going, she said, unwilling to talk. Could you let her know I stopped by? Sonia said, stepping down another few steps. That's when Harper noticed Sonia wringing her hands. Is everything all right? Could something have happened to Randy? Sonia inhaled heavily, her eyes directly on Harper. I'm afraid I've upset my daughter. Harper couldn't help but cringe. She did not do well in situations like this. I should probably go. I know she's hurt about Christmas, Sonia called out to her. She thinks I don't support her. But I'm just trying to do what's best for her. Harper clenched her jaw shut. She hadn't known Lila all that long, but it didn't take a genius to know that Sonia was only looking out for herself, the person she had always looked out for. Look, Mrs. Whitmore, Harper spoke slowly. Maybe you should call Lila and talk to her about this. I know she thinks I'm being hard on her about everything. Sonia didn't quit. The right thing to do was to walk away with a nicety and disengage with her boyfriend's mother. She didn't know the relationship well enough. There were always two sides of the story, her father would say. But the little island girl inside her, who got pushed around by bullies, wouldn't let another bully get away with gaslighting the situation. She just wants a mom, you know? Harper said before she could take it back. She didn't need to hear it from Lila, because she knew what it was like to not have a mother in her corner. To have a mother think of herself and only herself. Sonia's face darkened in shame. Yes, well, I'm trying. Harper saw a gift sitting on the doorstep. You should come back and give it to her yourself. Sonia looked behind her at the gift. She rubbed the bottom of her coat before placing her hands back together. Yes, maybe that's what I'll do. Harper could feel her own hands tremble from restraint. She had so much she wanted to tell the woman, like, Wake up! You've got this great daughter in need of support. Stop being a selfish narcissist and think about someone else for a change. But she held back out of respect for Andrew and Lila. Merry Christmas, Mrs. Whitmore, she said. Sonia gave her a nod. Yes, Merry Christmas. Harper turned around and then remembered the toolbox for Lila. Oh, would you mind giving this to Lila? What is it? Sonia reached out and took the metal box, her arm dropping from the unexpected weight. Mr. Thompson gave us starter toolboxes for our new places. Harper lifted her box up. She bought a new piece of art and needed a hammer and a nail to hang it, so Mrs. Mansfield told Mr. Thompson over at the hardware store about how we needed a toolbox. Sonia held the box. 
How thoughtful. Harper almost took it back, wondering if she should leave it with such an evil woman. But then she saw Sonia's face deepen in sadness. She may not have a ton of sympathy for her, but she never liked seeing someone in pain. She's probably at the Christmas market, Harper said as she left the stairwell, pushing the door open to the cold air. She's looking for stuff to decorate her new place. Harper knew her childhood home, the place where Lila now lived, had been a downgrade for her, and that Sonia Whitmore was embarrassed that her daughter lived there. The differences between Harper and Lila's upbringing seemed glaring. You're good for Andrew, Sonia said suddenly. He's happy being with you. Harper didn't know if this was a way to get in her good graces. She didn't respond. She held up her hand for a goodbye wave. You're also a good rider, Sonia threw out before Harper could get out the door. Harper groaned in her head as she figured this was Sonia's way of connecting. Thanks. Please tell Andrew that I'd love to have Christmas at the house, she said. Andrew had gone ballistic when he'd heard about his father inviting Joel. Inviting Joel is not only a slap in the face to Lila, but it's also a slap in the face to my mother, he'd said. Harper didn't feel for a woman who didn't seem to care about her daughter's feelings, but she kept that to herself. Andrew loved his mother, and who was she to make him feel bad about her? But she didn't have to make Sonia feel good either. I will she said, and with that, she left. Chapter 23 If Biddy hadn't been at the Christmas market with Drake and DJ, she may have picked up some of that hot cocoa and Bailey's and sat down and listened to Tommy's band play Christmas songs as the island of Martha's Vineyard shopped in the cold. But she was with Drake, and her son seemed to have a bit of an issue with listening to Tommy's band play. Who's this guy again? He asked after Tommy smiled and waved to her. He's a friend. Biddy didn't go into more detail. She could see by the look on his face that he already didn't like Tommy. A singer in a band, he mumbled. She ignored his comment, watching DJ flip through another map he found at the kiosk by the ferry dock. They had stopped to get a treat and listen to the music, until Drake realized who played. Do you have something you want to say? She said back to him. Nope, he said. She gritted her teeth as Drake pretended like nothing was wrong. Yes, she had promised herself to try to start over with their relationship, only being supportive, not judgmental. But she just couldn't deal with his tone of judgment against Tommy, who had been nothing but a stand-up guy. I like him, Biddy came out and said it. I like him? and would like to get to know him better. But I've stopped because I was afraid of what you might say. Drake's mouth dropped. What I might say, you never seem to care about my feelings with men. The blow hit harder than she had expected, and tears flashed in her eyes. Drake could see he had crossed the line. I'm sorry. She blinked the tears back, hard. Your little comments about my choices in men are hurtful. I see the looks. I hear the singer in the band comments. All in front of DJ. He's a singer in a band. Drake tried to play as if he was just merely making an observation. But he knew darn well what he was doing. I'm a grown woman who can do what I want. Date who I want. Drake looked at her. I want you to be happy, but you in a relationship is always putting the man first, never Biddy. You didn't even put yourself first after Richard died and left you with nothing. She could feel her rage building. How could you bring this up again? What are you fighting about? DJ asked, suddenly paying attention. Nothing, they both said back. And like an angel... Lila appeared from checking out a booth of handmade jewelry. Hi, guys. Biddy saw Drake's whole demeanor change, and the fight that was about to come to a boil now simmered. 
The rest of the night was a disaster for Biddy. She couldn't stop the fight going on inside her head, no matter how beautiful the harbor looked lit up in Christmas. Biddy went straight inside as soon as they got home. Randy was still up watching television with Andrew. She did a quick introduction of the men, but let Randy do the rest. Good night, gentlemen, she said as Drake ignored her. So early, Randy said as the football game played in the background. She gave a nod and walked out. Once in her room, she picked up her phone and thought about texting Tommy. She was so mad she could spit nickels. How dare her son talk to her like that? But the truth was, she had allowed Richard's children and ex-wife to walk all over her instead of fighting them. Who cared about Richard's reputation when he was dead? She didn't know that by losing the ranch, Richard's sons would push Drake out. She had thought Richard's kids thought of Drake as another brother. She had no idea they'd wanted them out of the family. She had believed them when they said they'd help take care of her and Drake after Richard had died. She hadn't thought she'd need a lawyer. Richard always said he'd take care of her. But he had lied, and she did nothing about it. Just left. Her throat squeezed in pain as she held back the sobs trying to escape her chest. Drake was right. She had put men before herself. Men before her son. She'd thought after escaping such a horrible man like Drake's father, any man was better, that Richard had been better. But look where she was. She'd given everything up for him. To take care of him when he was sick and dying. To get nothing from his promises. She cried into her pillow so no one could hear her. But then there was a soft knock on the door. Ma, Drake said. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Biddy didn't move, holding the pillow against her chest. I love you, Ma, he said through the door. You are the best, Mom, and I don't mean to take that away. I just want you to be happy, that's all. She hiccuped a breath, but didn't speak. She'd give away that she was really a blubbering mess, which would only worsen the situation. Ma, he said, his sweet voice coming through. I really love you. More than all the horses in the world. Thanks, darling, Biddy choked out. I love you more than all the horses in the world, too. The simple phrase had been one her daddy had said to her. She could hear Drake leave the doorway and walk down the hall. She was acting like a child hiding in her bedroom, crying over the truth. She had been bad at men. She had never picked right. So why wouldn't her son be wary of a newcomer? What was the trigger there? Biddy tried to sleep. God knew she needed rest to clear her head. But when she was done tossing and turning, she crept out of her room, past Drake and DJ sleeping on the pullout, and into the kitchen. She knew Randy would be up, sitting in his chair. You're up early, he said, looking at the clock. It wasn't even past 5 a.m. I was hoping I'd catch you alone, actually, Biddy said. Hmm, he rocked in his chair. You picked the right time, I suppose. She nodded. I have a couple of questions about the law, and I was hoping you could give me some insight. Randy looked inquisitive. He had asked plenty about Biddy's situation, but being Biddy, she had never talked much about her past, and nothing negative about Richard or his family. Mostly because she wanted some line of professionalism, but also because she had been embarrassed. Here on the island, she liked to pretend she had been this tough lady from the prairie. But really, she had the strength of a single piece of wheat. What do you need answering? She told him everything from when she got married to Drake's father to meeting Richard in the hospital, their decade-long marriage and how he had promised her a comfortable life. They took everything, she said. Just one year of living expenses. Randy had asked clarifying questions every once in a while. 
I'm not sure what the laws are like in the state of Oklahoma. There's usually a time period where a wife of the deceased can contest a will, if not mentioned or updated, to include the marriage. He pointed to the laptop he allowed DJ to use. Let's look some things up together. By the time Drake and DJ woke, Randy had figured out a few important things. One, Biddy, as Richard's surviving spouse, would be due half of Richard's inheritance. Two, she could also stay and reside in Richard's property until her death. Three, she had only three months to contest the will's status after probate. You'll need to hire an attorney who knows Oklahoma law, Randy said as he closed the computer. It would be good if you hired someone who's well-versed in your state's statutes. Biddy listened as Randy talked legal jargon, but something churned inside her that she hadn't felt before, an urge to fight for what was rightfully hers. I'll make some calls to see who would be good for that kind of thing out there, Randy said. I don't have any money, she said. Don't you worry about that, Randy said, almost waving off her worry, but Biddy had had enough of men waving off her worries. Look, I appreciate it, but I can't have you doing that without me paying for it, Biddy said. I just can't. Pay for what? Drake said, coming in with DJ. DJ, who was all sleepy-eyed, came straight into the family room, rubbing his eyes, and got in his position at the coffee table. I have twelve pages left. You want some breakfast? Biddy asked. Actually, we can't stay long, Drake said. He rubbed his hands together. I booked a flight, and we're headed back today. Really? Randy said. What? Biddy's hand went to her mouth. Because of last night? Drake shook his head and gave Biddy a smile, one she hadn't seen enough to decipher whether he was telling the truth or not. I have a job interview. Biddy didn't say anything. Randy smacked the arm of his leather chair. That's fantastic. Drake nodded. My boss is looking for someone to help with managing the guys. It wasn't much of an increase in pay but every little thing helped now that Darlene had gotten most of it. Drake, you don't have to go, Biddy said. Even if the news was true, that wasn't what Drake wanted to do. You should stay here, at least until the holidays. Randy made a face. He didn't understand what was going on. He didn't understand that people where she came from didn't chase dreams. They chased a paycheck. They chased money to get through the next week. They didn't give to charities or volunteer at them. They accepted those charities' help and held gratitude for what they did have. If she could convince Drake to stay, maybe he'd see life could be good. They could figure things out together. She'd be a better mother. She could help with DJ. Please, stay until at least the new year, like you had planned. I need to go back he said. Then let DJ stay, she protested. He's doing so. She stopped herself and saw Drake's face fall. That was exactly the kind of reason why Drake was leaving. She finally got it. She looked at DJ, who still stared at the book. Did he know what she had thought of him? Would he leave and remember his Grammy Biddy as that batty old mean lady? Then leave tomorrow, so we can at least have an early Christmas tonight. She was begging at this point. He looked at her, then to DJ, who looked up from his book. He had been listening all along. Fine, we'll leave tomorrow, Drake said. But then we're going back home. Chapter 24 Drake called early in the morning. Lila, who had already been up, daydreaming about the night before, immediately answered. Good morning, she said. She almost teased him about missing her, since they had only just left each other the night before, when they had walked the Christmas market together. She would have kissed him again if it hadn't been for Biddy and DJ, and she knew, by the way he had glanced her way or smiled when she'd caught him looking at her, that he had wanted to kiss her too. 
I have a big favor to ask of you, he said over the phone. What's that? She wondered if he wanted help with DJ, or maybe he wanted to hang out. She could take him to the city one of these days, take DJ to the science museum or the aquarium. He'd love the aquarium. I need help. What? she asked. Could you help me find a Christmas gift for DJ? Her heart pumped with a strange bliss. You know, I was just thinking we should go to the science museum soon, and I bet we could find something. Lila, I need the present by tonight. He paused. Because we're leaving tomorrow. Leaving? She couldn't help but let out her surprise. What for? He sighed. I have an opportunity to get a management position at work. But you don't want to do that, she said. You want to ranch. I have DJ to think about, he said coldly. I'm all he's got. He's got me, Lila said. And Biddy. Lila, please. I need to go home and not feel any more guilt. He sounded desperate. Please, can you help me? I'll pay you back. I just can't leave without him noticing at this point. Sure, I can do that for you. Thanks, he said sincerely. She took in what Drake just said. She wanted to make him reconsider, tell him how much she would miss him. But she chickened out as he said goodbye. She sat in shock when Drake hung up. What was the universe telling her now? She looked out at the street. Drake had told her what DJ wanted. She had to find the absolute perfect Christmas present. So when Biddy called her 30 minutes later to put her in charge of getting the gang together, she knew she needed help from the Christmas elves named Renee and Harper. She ran through the back door of the bakery and found them sitting around George, watching him eat an eclair. We're having Christmas tonight at Pops. Tell the ladies. Dinner is at six. Tonight, Renee made a face. I'll have to check with Mateo. Biddy's son is leaving tomorrow, she said in a panic. And we have to send them off wanting to come back to the island. Please. Harper smirked and gave a wiggle of her eyebrows. Does this have anything to do with the handsome cowboy? Absolutely. Lila slowed down and spoke carefully. But I'm really doing this for Biddy. Harper gave a nod and patted her on the back. Okay, then, how can we help? Renee texted Mateo and then told Lila, We're in, and I'll bring dessert. Lila threw her arms around both of them. Thank you so much. And tell Wanda and Marty and all the rest, she said. There was so much to do. I can bring some wine from my Aunt Martha's collection. Harper had inherited lots of liquor and wine from her great aunt, but she didn't seem to be going through them very quickly. Do you think you could get a hold of Tommy? Lila said. I'd like him to come as well. Did you run all this by Biddy? Harper asked, lifting an eyebrow as if to say she knew she hadn't. Lila didn't need to run it by Biddy. She knew what she'd say with Drake being there. What Biddy needed was to show Drake the woman they saw, the vibrant, lovely woman who devoured life, the Biddy that grabbed the bull by the horns. She wasn't a woman who tiptoed around a man, not anymore. She was someone who had your back. Could you reach out to Tommy, please? Lila asked again. Okay. Harper then walked over to her, lowering her voice. I saw your mom at your place last night. My mom went to my apartment? This completely shocked Lila. She didn't even think Sonia knew where the apartment was located. Her mother stayed out of the tiny harbor village, where the ferry of common folk came to the island. Unlike the private plane ride Sonia took from the small airport. Harper nodded. Do you know what she wanted? Lila couldn't imagine her mother standing outside her little apartment, talking to Harper. Please tell me she wasn't rude. Harper reached for her arm. I heard about Christmas. What was Harper talking about? Yes, tonight at six. Harper's face scrunched together. No, in Palm Beach. Oh, Lila laughed. 
She should have realized nothing was secret on this island. That's awful, Harper said. I'm so sorry. Lila shrugged. It's fine, really. Now I can spend that time with Pops. And us, Harper quickly put out there, just like Lila had with Drake. But then she understood what that meant. You're not going? Lila asked. Harper and Andrew had made big plans for the trip. Harper had never been to Florida. She had planned all these sightseeing adventures. But you planned on seeing Ernest Hemingway's house. Harper slanted her head to the side, the way she did when she was worried about Lila. Renee is having Christmas at her and Mateo's house. Come with Randy. Or Andrew and I can be in the apartment with you. After all, I've spent almost all my Christmases there. Lila smiled. Come, Renee said. Right, George? George clapped his hands, sitting on top of the counter as his mom kneaded dough on the large island in the bakery's kitchen. Come, he called out, which made the women laugh. Lila nodded. Okay, but you all have to come tonight. I'll get in touch with Tommy, Harper said. Lila hugged Harper, then rushed out. I've got to go. Lila didn't waste much more time. She had a big job to do, which Drake had entrusted her to accomplish. She took in a deep breath and dialed Sonia's number. Lila, she said. Hello, she said back. Did Harper tell you I stopped by? Sonia asked. Yes, Lila blew out, annoyed. You could have called or texted. I've been calling and texting, but you haven't responded, Sonia said. Lila recoiled when she heard the word but. I'm going to go now. Wait, Lila, please. I want to talk. Sonia sounded resigned. But are you going to complain about my life the whole time? Lila asked, because she really didn't want to hear it anymore. That's all you've been doing lately. Silence could be heard on the other line. Eventually, her mother said, I'm actually very proud of you. Lila scoffed at that. You're proud of me? Yes, Sonia said. You stood up for yourself, and that's not easy with your father. At one time, Lila had been a daddy's girl. When he was home, which wasn't often, she'd find him wherever he was in the house. My little shadow, he'd often call her, and she'd stay right by his side until he'd shoo her off. He hadn't talked to Lila since the breakup, since he told her to act like a lady and marry Joel. Yes, well, we know who he loves most, Lila said, waiting for Sonia to defend him to tell Lila she should be grateful for her father and what he's given her. I don't agree with your father's behavior, Sonia said. What? Lila wasn't sure she'd heard her right. Yes, well, I don't always appreciate what he does. Her mother's voice sounded weak and wobbly. Lila didn't know what to say. She had never remembered a time her mother ever spoke negatively about her father, not even in the darkest times. Your father has always done what he wants and doesn't really think about anyone else. Sonia's voice was bitter. Lila had felt that same bitterness when she'd stayed with Joel, pretending not to notice his behavior. She had been bitter not because he was so blatant, but because she had been such a fool. She knew better than to believe him. He'd proved it time and time again. She should have seen the signs long ago because she'd known them from her father. The missed phone calls, the never being around, the always having last minute meetings out of nowhere, the vague responses, that kind of behavior. Lila went back and forth in her head as the silence continued. You should come Christmas shopping with me today. You're going Christmas shopping? Sonia asked, sounding surprised. Here on the island? I'm just getting a few presents for a Christmas party for Biddy, her son, and grandson at Pop's tonight. 
She waited for the usual speech of not fraternizing with the help. But instead, her mother said, Okay, where were you planning to go? Lila's mouth dropped in surprise. No harsh remarks? No disapproving speech of behavior? Sonia Whitmore didn't have something critical to say about her daughter's choices? I'm really hoping to make this special for them, Lila added. What are you thinking of getting? Sonia asked. I want to buy this tool they use to find fish, Lila explained. It's a sonar device that can identify what's on the ocean floor. You'll need to get off the island in order to find something like that, Sonia said. Lila had thought of taking the device off Pop's boat, but decided better of it. I think I can find a small fishing one at the hardware store. She had seen a few hanging up there. The nice man who gave you a toolbox? Lila smiled, thinking of the small starter toolbox left on her front door. Yes, Mr. Thompson. I'll meet you there, Sonia said. And Sonia did. The two women talked to Mr. Thompson, who talked to a friend of his who had a used fish finder he no longer wanted. It's practically brand new, he said. He lives over on the other side of the island. Lila took down the address and looked it up. It's like a ten-minute drive. Well, you shouldn't just go to some stranger's house by yourself, Sonia said. Would you like to come along? Lila asked, instead of reminding her mother she was a grown woman. Sure, Sonia said. I'll drive. Without her GPS, Sonia drove through the island like an expert, taking all the back roads to the man's house, that sat a bit inland, but within the salt marshes of the northern side of the island. They drove down a dirt drive lined with stone walls and old maples. In his front yard, there were two cars, a restored Chevy truck that looked like one from the 50s painted red. Sitting beside it, another truck, but modern. Beside the gray clapboard cape, sat a sailboat covered in blue wrapping with just a dusting of snow. This place is incredible, Lila said, getting out of the car, but Sonia didn't move. You coming? Sonia nodded, but slowly got out. The sun shined brightly down on them as they walked up to the house. Hello? Lila called out as she knocked on the front door. The door opened, and a familiar tall man with gray hair stood in front of them. Tommy! Lila's mother froze, eyes wide open, her hand suddenly clutching her collar. Lila's mouth dropped at the coincidence. Tommy! You're the woman asking about my echo map? Tommy said to Sonia. Hello, Tommy, Sonia said. I'm the one who called. Lila couldn't believe her luck. Has Harper been able to reach you today about Christmas with Biddy tonight? She did, he said, nodding, but he was looking at Sonia. Great. Dinner's at six, but you're welcome to come when you can. When Tommy didn't answer, Lila tried to read the very weird vibe happening between her mother and this guy. It's good to see you again, Sonia. Yes, of course. Her mother extended her hand. My daughter's the one who's interested in your, uh, echo map, he finished for her. You have a gorgeous property here, Sonia said to him. He grinned as he opened the door wider. We'll come in and get out of the cold, he said, gesturing his hand inside. Let me show you what it can do before I take your money. Sonia hesitated to come inside, almost timid, but she ended up following Lila. Tommy's friendly demeanor and having the actual product ready to show made Lila comfortable following him into his house. Plus, he knew Biddy, after all. He wasn't some serial killer. This is the monitor. Tommy handed her what looked like an old-school portable television set. It has preloaded charts of all the waters in North America, but you can also buy updated charts or subscribe to blue charts for more updated bathymetric maps. And this will show the ocean floor? Lila asked. Without a transducer? It'll work almost like a GPS, using charts and maps, 
he explained. But if you're looking for accurate live data, you'll need to use the transducer. Sonia admired the man's quaint home. Your place is lovely. Lila was surprised her mother would like the small house. She had to admit she loved the interior. The ceilings were low with wooden beams. Pictures and tchotchkes and artwork covered the small space. Practically every inch filled with some piece of artwork. Yet it didn't feel cramped and overstuffed. She felt warm and cozy. A yellow lab lay in front of the fireplace, which even had a small fire crackling in the background. She felt like she was living in a Norman Rockwell painting. My late wife did the decorating, Tommy said. I'm so sorry, Lila said. He seemed not much older than her own father, awfully young to be a widower. She was a spitfire and wouldn't want anyone to feel sorry for her, he said. Now, tell me what you ladies are going to use this for. There's a young boy who's really into bathymetric maps and oceanography, Lila explained. She had an urge to explain her relationship, that he wasn't just some young boy, but DJ, the smartest young man she had ever encountered. He's going to save the ocean someday. He folded his arms against his chest. Does he have a boat? Lila shook her head. I thought he could use it to see and measure where he wants, using the tool. Maybe someday he can use it for its true purpose. I've hooked it up to a kayak before, he said. Best if you use the transducer to get actual live data, but definitely can be used as a GPS monitoring device. Is there anything else I should know about this tool? Lila asked. She'd have to take Tommy's word for it. Nope, I don't think so, he said. But feel free to call me any time if you have any questions. I will, Lila said, pulling out her wallet. You said you would take a check, is that right? He gave her a nod. Good luck, he said as they left. Make sure you say hello next time I see you. He looked directly at Sonia when he said that. When they got back into Sonia's car, Lila waved to him as he watched them pull out of his driveway. What was with you two? She asked Sonia as she reversed into the road. Nothing, Sonia said. But she didn't look at Lila. But Lila saw Sonia sneak a look out the side window at the house one last time before driving away. She wouldn't push it at this point, but something was going on with her mother. By some huge miracle, Lila had been able to get everything she'd wanted and more. Sonia insisted on wrapping at the house, which turned out to be a great idea. She had a whole room of wrapping paper and gift boxes and bags with bows and ribbon and string. She helped fold and tape and inscribe. I could make some calls and really make this kid's night, Sonia said. Lila looked at her mother, wondering what Sonia Whitmore would do. She didn't do little. I don't think Biddy and her son are into extravagant Christmas celebrations. Lila said. It wouldn't be unheard of to see fireworks or hired actors to play Mr. and Mrs. Claus. Sonia never did anything small. I was thinking maybe get him a private ride with the ferry captain, Sonia said. I could call in some favors. Lila thought that was a great idea. DJ would love that. Lila pulled the last of the ribbon over her scissor blade and looked out at the gifts. She had found a pillow seat that DJ could use when he sat at the coffee table. She had spotted a perfect piece of jewelry that said Grandma on it for Biddy. She'd gotten Pops a new set of wool-knitted gloves and a hat. For Drake, she had found something she wasn't sure he'd like, but she took the chance anyway. This is very nice of you, Lila, Sonia said. Then she reached out and squeezed her hand. I meant what I said. I'm always proud of you. Lila smiled at her mother. Even though she promised not to bother asking again, she decided to do it one last time. Would you like to come and join us all at Pops? Sonia thought about it, and Lila prepared herself for disappointment. But then Sonia said, Sure, I'd love to. 
Chapter 25 Drake wished he hadn't agreed to stay for one more day, because one more day would make it that much harder to leave. That much harder to do the right thing, which was give his mother space. But Biddy declared a Christmas emergency, and suddenly the whole island was coming for dinner. She had been right, of course. DJ deserved the Christmas he had promised him. The truth was, he didn't need to leave. He didn't have a shot at the management position. But he knew him being gone was the best thing for everyone. His mother was happy here. She had said as much. She didn't want to go back to Oklahoma. She'd rather stay with a stranger's family than come back. And could he blame her? As weird as he thought the situation was before coming, he had to admit Biddy had a good thing going. Randy seemed easy to work with. He also provided Biddy with an amazing little apartment. She had friends she met every morning to walk with, a guy who clearly liked her, and all these women like Lila who loved her. Why would she want her son to drag her back to the place she had ran away from? And him being there on the island had brought a level of anxiety and stress to her life that he couldn't fix. No, the right thing to do was allow his mother to grow into her new life and be happy. Biddy Lightfoot, of all people, deserved happiness. He had called Darlene to let her know when they were due back, but she hadn't picked up and she hadn't returned his call. He guessed she didn't need to tell him that DJ wasn't invited to Christmas again. The morning was spent in a flurry. DJ insisted on pulling every book from Randy's office he wanted to read before they left. He approximated he could spend about two seconds per page to scan. In 2.3 seconds, it really isn't considered reading. It's more scanning, DJ corrected Drake, when he'd used the word read when trying to convince him that it was impossible. Drake hadn't noticed until then that it had been a few days since DJ had corrected him, or broken down with a tantrum. He hadn't freaked out on Biddy for giving him a hug after breakfast, or argued with Randy when he had implemented a one-book-at-a-time rule instead of his usual pile of books. When lunch rolled around and Lila hadn't texted or arrived at the house, he worried she might have changed her mind. Maybe demanding her to get a Christmas gift hadn't been a good idea. Had he sounded chauvinistic by asking her to do that? As if he thought she had nothing better to do? All he wanted to do the night before was to take her in his arms and just hold her, smell her beautiful scent, and look into those calming eyes, brush her hair with his fingers, and pull her chin up to his lips. He'd wanted to kiss her right there in front of everyone. But then the memory of her calling him Joel that night had reminded him of Biddy's warning. Stay away. She had warned him about Darlene, too, and he'd chosen to ignore it, and look where that got him. Lila clearly wasn't over the pretty boy in the pictures. He had seen the house she'd lived in before the breakup. She expected a certain type of lifestyle he couldn't provide. When he got off the phone, he heard voices coming from the family room. He walked out to see DJ talking to a man and a woman. DJ was reading from his notebook, where he had created a list of questions for Lila's brother, the journalist from the Boston Globe which, according to DJ, was a big deal. Do you know why Massachusetts Clean Energy Center stopped their support for the Met Ocean Project? DJ asked him. Drake couldn't help but smile at his son's confidence. He may be nine, but he knew what he was doing. No, Andrew Whitmore said. He leaned forward, head tilted at DJ. Do you think there's a story there? Well. It seems absurd that the Mass CEC identifies that more assessment and data collection is needed for more clean energy offshore, yet they stopped supporting one of the area's longest monitoring campaigns. If you ask me, I think something fishy is going on there. DJ made a face, clearly amused by his pun. Drake noticed Randy looking at DJ like a proud grandfather. I told you he had a story. Andrew shook his finger at DJ. You know, the Globe publishes a section called the Op-Ed. You should consider writing an editorial about that. 
The debate for clean energy and offshore use is a hot ticket right now. DJ's face lit up. He looked at Randy with a new determination. I've done plenty of my own research. Andrew nodded his head at the young man. If you need help with anything, give me a call. But only for the writing stuff. I'm not that good with the sciencey stuff. Andrew passed a business card to DJ, who looked at the card and agreed with him. I can tell. With that, Randy let out a holler of laughter. Andrew and the woman beside him laughed as well, which relieved Drake. He looked around for Biddy, but didn't see her. He decided there was no hiding any longer. He walked into the room and began to introduce himself to Lila's twin brother. I'm Drake, Biddy's son, he said as he came into the room. He held out his hand to the woman first. She stood up along with Andrew and extended her hand. I'm Harper. Andrew, Randy's grandson. Andrew shook his hand as well. Lila's twin brother, right? Drake asked, but he knew he was right. Yep, she's older and bossier, he said, winking at DJ. I don't think age should automatically give a person more authority and respect, but Randy says I'm wrong, DJ said, who didn't mean for this to be funny, but everyone laughed anyway. What's all that about? Biddy asked, coming in from the laundry room, and Harper moved from Drake straight to Biddy and gave his mother a huge hug, as if they were longtime friends. We just met your son and grandson, Harper said jovially. Oh, Andrew, will you grab the rest of the stuff in the car? Do you need help? Drake asked. Sure, that would be great. Andrew smiled at Drake, and he could immediately see the resemblance between him and Lila. He wondered if having a twin would have been helpful growing up. The two men walked down the front walk to a very fancy German luxury vehicle. Drake remembered how Biddy had said the family had a lot of money. Another reason to leave. Lila didn't date guys like him. She dated doctors, not HVAC repairmen. Maybe a few years ago, she'd date a ranch manager, but she definitely wasn't going to be interested in a blue-collar guy going through a wicked divorce. Andrew popped the trunk, which held wrapped presents and bags of groceries. We went shopping, Andrew said, leaning over into the trunk to grab the bags. Harper went a little overboard with the appetizers. And the wine? Drake picked up a whole case filled with bottles of wine. Andrew laughed. Those are her great aunts, and she's been bringing those everywhere we go because she has nowhere to store them on the boat. Drake gave Lila's twin a smile and followed him back inside. When they walked back into the house, DJ was sitting next to Harper, holding a book in his hand. Yep, I wrote that, she said to his son, who seemed to question her credentials. Even though you don't have a degree in English or literature? DJ asked. DJ. Drake sounded his warning as he walked to the kitchen with a case of wine. He listened for DJ's next rude remark, but then he heard something he'd never expected. DJ apologized on his own. I apologize, he said. I was being rude. Drake peeked back into the family room. Had he heard his son right? He watched as DJ gave Randy a nod, as if the lessons had finally registered with him. Then DJ said, I know I have to respect my elders. This made everyone erupt in laughter, except for DJ, who didn't seem to understand what was so funny. I think Pops found his new sidekick, Andrew said. This kid's all right, Randy said. He's got a good father, that's why. Drake didn't know if Randy had really meant it, but something in his words made Drake feel good about being DJ's dad for the first time in a real long time. Randy wasn't just the grumbling old man he had once thought, but an honorable man who loved his family. Maybe Drake should stay. Was there really anything back in Oklahoma waiting for them, besides heartbreak and misery? Just as he second-guessed his decision, Lila came walking through the door, her arms filled with wrapped gifts. Merry Christmas! Another woman, also bearing gifts, came inside behind her. Mom? 
Andrew said from the dining room. Sonia, Randy said. Lila, what a great surprise. Drake's heart skipped a beat when Lila looked across the room, right at him. With the golden rays of the afternoon sun coming in from the windows, she looked like a Christmas angel in her white sweater. As she kept her eyes straight on him, he could focus on nothing else but her. And as she kept her eyes on him, he promised himself he'd kiss her one last time. Then he'd leave. Chapter 26 Biddy had never felt so full in her life. After dinner, and many, many pastries later, everyone who came for Christmas dinner moved to the family room of Randy's house. Never in a million years would Biddy have imagined her Christmas to be spent like this. But there she was, sitting with her closest friends, her son and grandson, and her employer's family. She was beyond grateful. How are you feeling, Charlie? Biddy asked, feeling a bit guilty she hadn't checked in as much. I'm sore, tired mostly, but good, he said, giving her a reassuring smile. Besides, Evelyn won't let me eat anything that's not organic, grass-fed, or fun. And now Renee's in on it. I've started baking a new line of healthy alternatives for the bakery, Renee said, overhearing Charlie's complaint, but not at all bothered by his accusations. It's doing really well. You've created a great cohesive atmosphere with the bookstore and bakery, Sonia said. I think you two have something really special there. Have you thought about a franchise? Maybe set up in the city. Tons of college kids would love to hang out in a place like yours. Renee shook her head. That's going to have to happen way down the line. She looked at Matteo and then squealed out, I'm pregnant. The room exploded in joy. Biddy let out a holler and clapped her hands against her chest. How wonderful! It's twins, Evelyn said, and then blushed. Oops, sorry. Wanda let out a shriek. Twins! We were keeping that a secret, Renee said, pointing at Evelyn, who apologized again. Everyone started talking at once. Even DJ started talking to Lila and Drake about the news. Biddy looked on as Drake laughed with Lila at something DJ said. She wondered if her son knew he had feelings for the beautiful woman, or if he was in complete and utter denial. Either way, her heart swelled and broke at the same moment. Guess that's why it's called bittersweet, she thought to herself. Just as she went to sit with Drake, the doorbell rang. Well, look who it is, Randy called out as Tommy stood in the doorway holding a gift in his hand. He looked at Biddy, who stood frozen in shock. What was Tommy doing there? I was invited by your friends, he said, handing her the gift. She took it and waved toward the family room. Everyone's inside. There was hardly enough room for the people present, but Andrew managed to grab another dining room chair and offered Tommy a seat. Tommy, Randy called from across the room. It's good to see you again. He nodded at the crowd. Merry Christmas, everyone. Tommy, Sonia said, not hiding her shocked look. What are you doing here? Sonia. Tommy appeared equally surprised to see her. I was invited. Biddy looked between the two. She remembered Sonia had hired him to play at Sonia's party back in late summer, but the look felt like something else, something only the two of them understood. As conversation flowed again and Biddy couldn't decipher what Drake thought of the surprise arrival, people began to shuffle around the room, and suddenly DJ stood beside her. Grammy Biddy, can we open presents now? He asked. Biddy looked at the clock and nodded. He had waited long enough. Why don't you ask Randy to start? Biddy stood off to the side, behind the group, as Lila and Harper passed out presents to everyone. She had to admit, Lila had pretty much nailed the day. So much cheer filled the space. Thank God for the women in that room. Otherwise, the day would have been a disaster. All she had done was secretly cry in the bathroom, 
pretend nothing was bothering her, and sneak hugs from DJ and Drake all day. She didn't want them to leave. She wanted them to stay where they were, stay with her. They could figure things out together. She thought about Drake's offer to go back to Oklahoma with him. It would mean starting all over again. She'd have to find a more demanding job, one that paid less than Sonia Whitmore, and a new place to live. She couldn't live off her son and grandson. Parents weren't supposed to burden their children. Beautiful tree, Tommy said to her, as Lila had baby George start opening presents. Thank you, Biddy said, watching as Lila explained the order of how presents are opened. Youngest to oldest, Lila said, winking to DJ. Sorry, Pops. DJ squeezed his fist and said a little, yes, to himself. How have you been? Tommy asked. She wanted to smack herself for blowing Tommy off. He had been nothing but kind to her, sending her texts, inviting her out. Even after her silence, he had continued to be kind. I've been good, she said. She looked out at the room. No, that's not true. She gave a half smile, too tired to lie anymore. I've been trying to work some things out in my life, with family. She looked at Drake, watching DJ explain a toy to George, who proceeded to grab DJ's nose. The whole room laughed at the two boys. He likes you, Evelyn said to DJ. I've missed our time together, Tommy said to Biddy. No pressure. I know you've had family. Biddy thought of Drake's father. The smooth talker, her sister had once called him. It had been completely true. He could talk his way into and out of anything. Biddy hadn't seen any red flags until it was too late. Was Tommy's overly nice demeanor a red flag? Was Drake right that she had blinders on and put men before her own well-being? How do you know Sonia? she asked. Was the look he had exchanged with her something more? He looked to Sonia, who sat next to Randy. He shrugged his shoulders. Just old history. As far as I've heard, she's happily married. Biddy didn't press for more, even though she wanted to know what kind of old history. It wasn't her business, and she wasn't offering her old history. How has the visit been? he asked. Good, she said. Tommy didn't press. So what are you doing for the real Christmas? Tommy asked. Biddy shrugged. I'm not quite sure now. Things have obviously changed. Biddy wasn't worried about her plans. She knew she had somewhere to go. Between Evelyn, Wanda, and Randy, she'd have somewhere to be. Then there were the girls, Renee, Samantha, and Harper. What if you spend it with me? Tommy asked. She smiled. The idea of spending a day with Tommy sounded nice. She enjoyed Tommy, and really thought that maybe he could be one of the good ones. The ones she kept reading about in Evelyn's books. The ones that her friends had found. But she knew who she wanted to spend Christmas with. And they were leaving the island. Sure, that sounds nice but she focused her attention on the gift opening and not her heart breaking as the minutes counted down. Tommy looked out at Drake and DJ, then back to Biddy. You okay? She let out a laugh. I'll get there. Tommy nodded and rubbed the top of Biddy's arm gently. And without another word, he moved to an open spot in the family room. She could feel his touch linger on her arm. Evelyn walked toward the restroom, stopping beside Biddy and squeezing her hand. I'm so glad I got to meet Drake and DJ. I feel terrible it's only now. Such a shame they're leaving. Biddy held onto her hand, tears burning the backs of her eyes, threatening to fall at any moment. Evelyn could see what was happening. Let's go to the bathroom, shall we? They walked together to Biddy's apartment behind the kitchen and into her bedroom's bathroom. Evelyn shut the door and said, Talk to me. He's leaving, 
and I haven't fixed anything. The pressure of time running out felt like a vice against her chest, squeezing, pushing it closed to the point she could no longer take a breath. I'm so scared I'll miss it all, and he'll be indifferent with me again. Evelyn sat Beatty down on the tub's edge and rubbed her back. She had nothing to say, because it was true. Should I go back to Oklahoma? Biddy asked. Evelyn shook her head. Only if that's what you want. I'm broken up about it. Biddy felt like her heart had completely deflated. I'm losing my family, no matter where I end up. Biddy's bottom lip trembled. Her fresh start and finding her independence again after Richard's death had been everything to her. Her and her newfound friends had developed a sisterhood she had never experienced until now. They meant everything to her. And now, even Randy and his grandchildren were becoming important people in her life. But Drake and DJ were her flesh and blood. She would do anything for them. And they needed her more than she needed friends and a boyfriend. I think I'll go back, she said. Give my notice. Have them stay here, Evelyn said. I don't know if they can. Biddy had to imagine there were laws about children moving across country without one of their parents. We can help, Evelyn said. Biddy noticed the pronoun we. Evelyn had switched it from Biddy's I. Biddy thought of Tommy. She had thought after Renee and Mateo's wedding that she might have a we, but she stopped herself before the excuse came out. I'll stay until the wedding, but I'll plan to give Randy and Sonia my notice, Biddy said. Evelyn put her hand on her heart, tears brimming on the edges of her eyelids. I love you. Boy, am I going to miss having you here. Biddy knew what she meant. I'm really going to miss our walks. Their morning walks had solved almost all of Biddy's life problems at one time. The three women had all been faced with life's rock bottoms together. Evelyn losing her husband, Wanda finding out about her cancer, and Biddy lost like a ship without a sail. Now she had purpose and friends and happiness. I'm going to miss you, she said to Evelyn. Evelyn squeezed her harder. Always my soul, sister. Chapter 27 Lila sat on the family room floor next to DJ and in front of Drake. Pops and Andrew sat on her side, and Sonia, who chatted Renee's and Mateo's ears off, sat across from her. Biddy, whose eyes were puffy and red, still laughed with joy when DJ opened his gifts. DJ loved them all, getting more and more excited with each one. There's more, he said, surprised when Harper passed the rest of the gifts out from under the tree. That one's for me, Randy said. Randy inched up in his chair to watch the young boy open his gift. Lila's heart melted when DJ's face brightened in complete delight. The National Audubon Society's binoculars! Lila turned to look at Drake. His eyes filled with moisture as he looked at his son. Lila had never been more attracted to him than in that moment. A father so in love with his son, he wept at his joy. She looked away before she wiped her own tears. That's really nice, Randy. Thank you, Drake said to Pops. And then, out of nowhere, to everyone's surprise, DJ jumped up from his spot next to the coffee table and into Randy's arms. You're welcome, Randy said, embracing the young boy. Lila's heart felt tender in this moment. She didn't want Drake and DJ to leave. Her heart broke for Biddy. She didn't want the house to become quiet again. Not just for herself, but for Pops, too. He hadn't been this active in a long time. She could tell he enjoyed having Drake and DJ around, just as much as she did. She couldn't even look at Biddy sitting on the couch. Lila handed the last gift to Drake. Who's this from? DJ asked, looking at the sides and bottom of the gift. Me, Drake said. But Lila helped me get it for you. 
Lila's heart pounded in anticipation. She knew he was going to love it. DJ sat up, taking the gift into his hands, instantly dropping with the weight. What's in this? He said, pulling the paper off with a tear. His eyes shot open and his mouth dropped. A Garmin Echo Map and Chart Plotter! DJ pressed the power button on and watched as the eight inch screen lit up in his hands. I can't believe you bought this! DJ went directly to Drake, showing his father all the features. Drake showed as much enthusiasm as DJ did, and it was hard not to. The whole group laughed as DJ explained how it measured, animating with his hands. He turned and faced Lila, eyes penetrating with gratitude. Lila swore she could feel his energy. Thank you. You're welcome, she said. Their stares held, and for a split second, the rest of the room seemed to disappear. He nodded once at her, keeping the contact between them. Her heart sped, and she had to remind herself to take in air. Here, she said, handing him the small gift. I don't deserve a gift after what you did for me today. He started to hand it back to her, but she stopped him. It's not that big of a gift, she said, pushing the gift back to him. Open it. Drake pulled the paper off, removed the top to the box, and pulled out a silk tie she had found with a sailboat embroidered on the back. He met his eyes with hers, and she could feel his gratitude. Thank you. This is perfect. Did you see I can even look up lakes and ponds? DJ said to Drake. Drake didn't glance away until DJ grabbed his arm, which, at that point, Lila was relieved. She had to take a breather because she was quite certain they'd had a moment. When Randy finished opening his gifts, being the oldest in the room, people started gathering their things and leaving. First, Wanda and Marty. Then Mateo, Renee, and George. Congratulations again, Lila said. Renee hugged her goodbye. Thanks for including us in this. It was a really great time. After that, Andrew drove Harper home. Lila started picking up when she noticed Drake watching Biddy and Tommy talk in the dining room. Did I tell you it was Tommy's echo map? You know, DJ's gift? He shook his head, picking up a scrap of wrapping paper and putting it into the trash bag. Pops and Tommy go fishing a lot, she said. She had a feeling Drake might be a bit apprehensive about the relationship forming in the other room. He nodded and picked up another empty box beside the couch. I haven't seen her this happy in a long time. Lila smiled, glad Drake finally saw what they all saw. Biddy was happy here, and he could be too. This island can be magical. He faced her, his spellbinding brown eyes staring back at her. You're magical. Her heart skipped a beat. What you did for me tonight, what you did for DJ. He stopped talking and kept staring at her, his lips parted slightly. He stepped closer to where she stood. She looked around the room, but no one seemed to notice the two of them standing next to the Christmas tree. DJ was focused on his new echo map. Biddy and Tommy were in a heavy conversation at the dining room table, and Randy rocked in his recliner with his eyes closed. Thank you for everything, he said, his voice barely over a whisper as he stepped even closer. She could feel his warmth. It was nothing. She held his stare as he came closer, and he kissed her softly under the twinkling of Christmas lights as Nat King Cole sang in the background. Standing on her tippy toes, she wrapped her fingers behind his neck as they hid in the evergreen. I wish you could stay, she said when they separated. He looked down at her, gently brushing a strand of hair behind her ear. I wish I could too. I heard Oklahoma is beautiful in the spring, she said. But he didn't say anything in return. Instead, he pressed his forehead against hers. Maybe we can come back this summer. But Lila didn't want to wait until then to see them again. She didn't want things to end. 
what if you found a job here on the island? I can't stay here. He shook his head. DJ's mother is out there. She wished so much that things could be different. He took her hand in his. How about one last walk under the stars? His eyes were filled with sadness. This is it, she thought. She was the happiest she had ever been, and it was about to end. They didn't talk as they walked to the cove, just held hands, listening as the waves crashed onto shore. Lila kept looking up at the stars. At first, she wished for a storm to come so they couldn't leave the island. Next, she wished for them to change their minds and want to stay. But finally, she wished for them not to forget about her and to come back to the island. She laughed when she saw Drake frown at her, but she couldn't help but let the tears come. I'm going to miss you. The look on his face said it all. Her heart dropped. I'm going to miss you too. They slowed as they reached the house. Lila dragged her feet, dreading this moment. How could she tell Drake everything in her heart? So much had happened since he had arrived. She didn't want an awkward goodbye. She didn't want it to end before it even had a chance to begin. Would it be too forward to invite herself to Oklahoma? She could go out and spend the holidays there. No one needed her here. She wasn't tethered to this island. I hope you don't forget about me, she said. She looked into his eyes, pleading for him to know what she was thinking. Are you kidding? He smiled at her, cupping her chin in his hand. You're unforgettable. He drew her up for a kiss. When he froze short, his hands dropped, and he shifted his position away from her as lights from a car came into the driveway. At first, she thought it was Andrew, but her stomach sank when she realized who it was. Joel opened the car door and stepped out. He must not have seen her and Drake because he headed toward the front door. That's the guy, isn't it? He asked. She couldn't believe Joel came here tonight, of all nights. What was he doing? Why would he show up at Pop's? I, I don't know what he's here for, she said. She didn't move, even though she could barely feel her toes. Drake didn't move either. They stood there as they heard the doorbell ring and a commotion coming from inside. Well, hello, Joel, she heard Biddy say. She couldn't hear his side of the conversation, but she could picture it. Biddy drawling out her southern accent, giving Joel a piece of her mind. You sure you don't want to talk to him? Drake asked. She shook her head. She didn't know what she wanted at that moment, but it wasn't to talk to Joel. I'd rather be out here with you, she said. Drake exhaled, his breath incandescent in the night sky. He took her hand in his when Joel came back to his car and stopped dead in his tracks. He saw them now. Lila, Joel stepped closer. I've been trying to get a hold of you. Lila didn't move, but she let go of Drake's hand. Instinct, maybe. Or the strangeness of having Joel, the man she had thought she loved, standing in front of Drake, a man she was certain she did. The awkwardness mixed with anger, and even a bit of anguish. How could Joel come and ruin something so special for her? What are you doing here? She didn't even know why she was asking. There was no reason that she would find acceptable. Joel shot a look at Drake who watched the interaction quietly beside her. Who's this? Joel asked. Lila didn't answer. I don't remember inviting you. I came to talk to you about the house, Joel said. Joel kept flicking his eyes at Drake, who stood still, but up until now, Lila hadn't noticed how big and manly he looked compared to Joel. Drake stood tall, with broad shoulders, his hard physique of physical work, where Joel looked light and lean from running long distance. Drake really did look like a cowboy standing across the driveway from him. That's when she felt his hand on the small of her back, gently letting her know he had her back. I told you, I don't want anything, she said. I'm buying the house, 
Joel said. What? She hadn't expected this. Your father is selling it to me. Joel looked pale. Yes, it was the winter in New England, where they went days without sun. But he looked tired, with deep, dark circles. She guessed that was what happened when you had no soul. Enjoy the pool, she said, heading up the walkway and straight into the house. She didn't even look back, just opened the door and stepped inside the house. She turned around, waiting for Drake to follow. She wasn't going back out there. She'd do or say something even more stupid. God, Joel drove her crazy. When a minute went by and Drake still hadn't come into the house, she wondered if he had left with Joel. But then she saw him, walking up to the house, his hands stuffed into his coat pockets. He looked up at her with a smirk as he opened the door to come inside. She smiled at him. What's so funny? He kept his grin, but took her in his arms, twirling her around and into a dip. He kissed her hard, big, and didn't seem to mind that everyone in the house could see them. She looked up at the mistletoe that hung above the door. Merry Christmas, Lila. Chapter 28 Drake woke up with a major headache, and DJ reverted back to his old self. I'm not going home, DJ said to Drake, sitting on the family room floor, still unpacked and in his pajamas. He sat in his usual spot next to the coffee table, a new book opened in front of him. You need to get up off the floor and pack your things. Now, DJ. Drake didn't have time for this. They needed to catch the ferry to get to the airport in time. We need to get going. I want to stay here with Grammy Biddy and Randy. DJ didn't move. I'm going to count to five, and if you don't get up, I'm going to leave your echo map behind, Drake said. And we're flying home. DJ crossed his arms against his chest. I'm not going back with you. DJ, one. His jaw clenched as he waited a full second. Two. I'm not leaving with you. DJ's voice had raised. I want to live here with Grammy Biddy and Randy. I don't want to go back to that awful apartment. DJ's eyes filled with tears. Drake felt sick and ashamed. We don't have to stay there, buddy. We'll find something better when we get back. I want to stay here, his chin wobbled. Please don't make me go back there. Drake didn't have time for this. Come on, DJ. We can't stay here. You can stay as long as you want, Randy interjected from his spot in his recliner. Randy, man. Drake rubbed the back of his neck as he tried to rein DJ in. Enough, DJ. It's time to pack. Why can't I stay? DJ said. Because you can't. Drake wasn't hearing any more of this. We're going back to Oklahoma. I could do my research here, DJ argued. Enough, DJ. Drake raised his voice. Biddy stepped from the kitchen, twisting a tea towel in her hands. Go on, DJ. Listen to your dad. Drake watched as DJ got up, closing the book carefully. Thanks, Randy, for all the reading material, DJ said. His voice cracked as he handed Randy the book. Randy passed it back to DJ. Why don't you finish it? Tell me how it ends. What? DJ took hold of the book. Really? Randy nodded. Just as long as you promise to return it next time you come. DJ smiled. I promise. He took off toward their room, no longer arguing, and began to pack his things. Drake couldn't believe it. When he had everything packed and ready to go, he did one last sweep of the house for any belongings, and Drake and DJ said their goodbyes. Thanks again, Randy. Drake held out his hand. I really appreciate everything you did over the past couple weeks and taking care of my mom. Randy stood up and took Drake in his arms, patting him on the back. You've got a good head on those shoulders. You've always got a place to stay here on the island, son. 
Randy gave Drake one last pat on the arm and moved to DJ. You listen to your dad. You hear me? Randy ruffled DJ's hair. DJ walked over to Biddy. I'm going to miss you, Grammy Biddy. I'm going to miss you too, sugar. Biddy pulled DJ into a big hug, and DJ wrapped his arms around her waist. Drake picked up his stuff. Okay, buddy, we have to go. DJ got up and ran to Drake, burying his face in his stomach. I'm going to miss them. We'll see them again, Drake said, trying to comfort DJ, but also holding back his own emotions. DJ wiped his eyes, and Drake could hear Randy blowing his nose from his recliner. He walked to Biddy, who had tears running down her cheeks. We'll be back. She pulled Drake into her arms and just hugged him. And once we get settled, we'd love to have you visit. DJ nodded at this. A horn beeped outside the house, and DJ looked out the window. The Uber's here. He embraced Biddy one last time, then grabbed their bags and went out the door. Drake waved as he got into the Uber, relieved in a way. He didn't want to drag out any more goodbyes. Last night had been hard enough. He didn't want to go through it all over again. DJ didn't talk on the drive or look at his book. Instead, he looked out the window, with his new binoculars hanging around his neck. As the car drove through the village, Drake looked up at Lila's apartment window. What did he have to go back to, other than finalizing his divorce and working a job he hated? Darlene probably wouldn't even care if he had stayed. But what then? Lila would start to see the whole Drake, not the guy riding into town. She'd see the broken Drake, the guarded Drake. Darlene always complained he had been too closed off. Drake had been a distraction for Lila, someone to get over Mr. Perfect. But in time, she'd want something more, someone more, just like Darlene had. When it was time to board the ferry, DJ headed straight to the top deck. As they reached the door to the deck outside, he thought back to when they first arrived at the tiny island. He and DJ had been angry at the world, hurt by the people they loved, and lost. He had been so lost. DJ turned on his new Echo Map machine and stood facing the harbor, staring at the 3D images lighting up the screen. The harbor floor is 15 to 18 feet deep further out in the harbor, which can accommodate larger vessels to anchor. DJ sputtered out more facts. Things Randy had either told him or that he'd read from Randy's books. As DJ rambled on about the water's depth and tidal charts, Drake leaned against the railing, watching the village wake up with the morning sunrise. All the windows reflected the pinks and yellows and oranges, blending as the sun rose above the horizon. The village's Christmas tree lights were still on, and he could make out the gold star on top. DJ jumped at the ferry's three short blows. We're backing away from the dock, he told Drake. Drake pictured DJ sitting in his spot, turning to a new page as Randy observed from his chair. Biddy would be cooking or running around. His mother never sat still. Then he pictured Lila next to him on the couch. He could even imagine inhaling her sweet scent. He watched as the village slowly disappeared in the background. He should be grateful. The trip had been better than he had expected. DJ was doing better than he had been in years, even before his and Darlene's problems. But instead, Drake felt more lost than he had when he arrived. Chapter 29 Biddy didn't talk to anyone the day Drake and DJ left. Instead, she stayed in her small apartment and watched Judge Judy. Randy had checked in a few times, but she could tell he missed them as much as she did. He told her that he'd take care of dinner for himself and not to worry about a thing. She expected Lila to come around and cry with her at some point during the day, but surprisingly, she didn't. The kiss in the foyer under the mistletoe had been so romantic. 
Biddy hoped Lila's heart hadn't been broken. Cowboys had a way of breaking hearts. She finally got dressed and out of her pajamas the next morning when she went for her walk with the ladies. Girls, my heart is breaking, she said as soon as she arrived at Evelyn's house. Wanda frowned. Oh, Biddy, it must be so hard to say goodbye again. Have you decided what you're going to do? Evelyn asked. I'm torn, Biddy admitted as they walked down to the beach. The tide had gone out that morning, and they walked along the packed sand, already freezing up from the cold temperatures. Biddy pulled her hood over her head. The walk that morning was a little chillier than she had expected. I feel wrong staying, enjoying my life when my son is struggling on his own. Evelyn nodded. Did you talk to him about it? Biddy shook her head. No, I didn't want to add to any of the pressure. He's going to find a new place. I'll come and visit as soon as he invites me and check things out. Darlene might change her mind and want to become a mother again. Wanda shook her head. I find it so unfair the ones who don't want children are blessed with fertility and bounty when others who've dreamt of them since they were little can't. Biddy rubbed Wanda's back. Her friend had been talking a lot about the things she didn't have. Speaking of babies, Biddy said, pulling on Evelyn's elbow. You kept that quiet. She told us just after the heart attack, Evelyn explained. She wanted to tell everyone at Christmas. Biddy felt honored they had changed their plans and told everyone at the Christmas party at Randy's. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you all got to meet Drake and DJ, Biddy said, smiling at the thought of all of them crammed into Randy's family room. Christmas will be at Renee's place this year, Evelyn said. Biddy looked surprised. You're letting go of the Christmas celebration? I'm still having Christmas Eve, Evelyn said. Charlie wants to do the seven fishes. You can't live on the ocean and not do the traditional fish dinner. By the time they returned to Randy's, Biddy felt good again. The warmth of the sun on her cheeks and the ocean air always did its magic. Her mood almost always changed for the better. She didn't feel quite as sad walking into the empty house or as lonely when she walked through to her small apartment. Her phone buzzed as she turned on the shower. She peeked at the screen. Tommy had sent a message. The screen went dark before she could see what it said. Why did she refuse to bring her readers around with her? She picked up the phone and another message popped up. Would you like to come over and have dinner with me tonight? I'll have the most amazing stuffed lobster you've ever had. Her thumbs hovered above the keys as she thought about what to write. Sure. Before she could send it, she erased it. That sounds fabulous! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. What was she, twelve? Triple exclamation points? Not to mention she never used the word fabulous. That would be lovely. She wrote it and sent it before she could change her mind. He wrote back right away. I'll pick you up at six. That's when Biddy heard voices coming from Randy's office. She hadn't noticed before, but she suddenly heard her name. She walked down the hallway when she recognized the group. Lila and Andrew and Randy all sat in the office. Andrew sat on the couch with a big book in his lap. Biddy, Randy said, clearly surprised to see her. Oh, I thought you were on your walk. He moved a bunch of papers around his desk. Lila kicked a book under the couch as she walked to Biddy. How are you, she said, seeming to be concerned, but also as if she were trying to push her out of the room. I'm good. Biddy said, noticing Lila standing in front of Andrew. Biddy crossed her arms. What are y'all up to? Lila looked to Andrew, who looked to Randy. You guys, I found it! Harper called out and stepped into the office. Oh, hey, Biddy. Did I mention that Andrew went to law school? Lila asked. And Lila did too, Andrew said. We're looking up the intestate laws in Oklahoma. Biddy swung her head at Randy. I thought you said you'd be quiet about it. Well, 
These two are the best around, Randy said. We think you have a legal claim to Richard's inheritance. I have legal claim? Randy nodded, then gestured to Lila, who pulled the book back out from underneath the sofa. Since Richard's children are still in probate for Richard's assets, you have a legitimate claim to Richard's house and property, including any earnings he made in the years married to you. Lila swept her hair out of her face. Fifty percent of it is yours. The state of Oklahoma doesn't allow someone to exclude their spouse from the will. What? Biddy's heart started racing. You may not have been listed in Richard's will, Andrew said. But legally, you're supposed to inherit 50% of what he left behind. Then the rest is split up among any of his surviving relatives. 50%? Biddy could barely get the words out. Her hand rose to her mouth. 50%? Looks like I'm going to have to study for the Oklahoma bar, Lila said. Biddy laughed. Why? Because I'm going to represent you, Lila said. I'm going to write your request to the state to challenge the will, Lila said, sticking the pen behind her ear. She crossed her arms against her chest. Even if I'm not listed in his will? Biddy didn't believe it. She hadn't fought against Richard's family because her name wasn't listed. Richard hadn't changed his will. Why would his lawyer lie to her? I was told that I had no legal claim to his properties or assets. Randy leaned forward over his desk. Whoever gave you that advice should be disbarred. Biddy thought about the period after Richard's death. She had been so tired, so exhausted after taking care of him, that she hadn't wanted to fight. When his attorneys and Richie Jr. had given her a number, she'd felt appreciative they were giving her anything at all. Biddy couldn't believe it. She just couldn't believe it. She'd finally gotten over everything, accepted her position in life. So, the ranch and the money, some of that might be mine? We need to file with the courts right away to contest the will. Lila put the book down on her lap. Then I'm going to take the bar exam. There's a uniform test in February, which multiple states use, including Massachusetts and Oklahoma. But that's just crazy, Biddy said. You don't have to do this just for me. Lila brushed her hands through her hair, twisting the long blonde locks around her shoulder. I need this. Lila rubbed her hands over her eyes. I've been running around in circles the past few years, doing what a doctor's wife was supposed to do. But the funny thing was, I never was a doctor's wife. I was playing pretend all that time. Biddy felt a stab in her heart for the young woman. She had been betrayed by men, by life, by responsibilities. I've always wanted to practice law, Lila huffed a laugh. I just didn't believe in myself before now. Biddy squeezed Lila's hand. Okay, well, what do I need to do? Chapter 30 Lila had never felt so invigorated in her life. When she left Biddy and Pops, she decided to pool everything together from law school. Books, notes, law papers, and more. She had passed the Massachusetts bar exam years ago, but now many of the states, including Oklahoma, used the uniform bar exam. She ignored the nagging thoughts of Drake and ignored the fact that he hadn't called or reached out since returning home. She hadn't texted him either. Would it be weird? Hey, remember me? The woman you kissed on Martha's Vineyard? Or had Drake gone home relieved to be done with her? She shook her head from her negative thoughts and went back to crusading for Biddy. Then the card arrived in the mail. The Christmas card had the classic red leaves of a poinsettia plant. Inside, he'd written, Dear Lila, Thank you for opening your holiday, home, and heart to DJ and me. It meant the world to the both of us. Always, Drake. And even though the card was nice and said all the right things, 
Lila noticed what it didn't say. It didn't say to call or to visit. It didn't say he missed her or had been thinking about her. It didn't say what a great time he'd had with her. It didn't say any of that. Always Drake, that's what it had said. Always what? She said to Harper at Books and Bread. Always thinking about you? Lila shook her head. Always means he couldn't think of a better way to close the card. It's easy, no strings attached. I think you're reading way too much into this, Harper said. Everyone saw how into you he was the other night, even Joel. Lila didn't want to think about Joel. Oh, I didn't tell you. Lila had to admit, it was nice to forget about her problems with Joel. He's buying our house. That jerk is buying my house. The house I decorated, the house I sweat and bled in, and, ugh! Shut up, Harper said, loud enough that the people sitting beside them turned their heads. No, seriously, he's buying it for my dad. Lila started to laugh because she didn't know what else to do. Actually, I'm not even sure if he's buying it. My dad probably made some deal with him. Lila was half kidding. She was certain there had been a deal between the two of them. Her father would never miss a deal. No, shut up, Harper said. But she was looking above Lila's head. Joel just walked in. Lila froze, unsure what to do. She scanned the room. Who would see this interaction? Who would tell Sonia or Abigail's crew this was happening and all the sordid details? Then she thought about Drake putting his hand on the small of her back and smiled. She leaned over the table, not looking back, not giving any attention to Joel. Did I tell you what a good kisser the cowboy was? Harper beamed with pride. Tell me after I tell Joel to get lost. This made Lila lose it. The laugh burst out of her chest, and with it, so did her anxiety. All of a sudden, it didn't matter that Dr. Joel Schaefer had walked into the room. Lila, Joel said behind her. What do you want, Joel? Harper's voice came out hard and sharp, like an officer of the law or a judge. Lila took in a breath and turned in her seat to face him. She lifted her eyebrows, waiting for his answer. Is there something you want? I want to say I'm sorry. Joel's face said it all. The laugh lines that he'd once had were now deep creases of stress. No longer did his green eyes shine. They were bloodshot and sad. Thank you, she said. He heaved in a breath and blew it out as though he was relieved. I hope everything works out for you, Lila. Lila smiled but said nothing back. Joel took the silence as his cue and left their table. I hope he gets E.D., Harper said to Lila, loud enough for others to hear. And he'll have to prescribe his own little blue pills. Lila burst into laughter so hard that tears immediately fell. She didn't care if people saw, because at that moment, she didn't care what anyone else thought. I love you she said to Harper, laughing at the thought of Joel prescribing his own ED medication. I love you too, Harper said. She didn't go directly home after having coffee with Harper. Instead, she decided to take a walk by the harbor. She knew that the depth of the water was 18 feet at the dock, that the ground was generally sticky and the depths shoaled gradually toward the harbor. She missed DJ's fun facts. And man, did she miss kissing that cowboy. She missed Drake a lot. She knew what she needed to do. She would go to Oklahoma. She would leave tonight. She would leave now. She ran back to her apartment and up the stairs. She had no excuse to stay in New England. Except that her mom stayed. Andrew and Harper stayed. For her. They all stayed behind for her. She couldn't just leave them. Why did Drake have to leave? She dug in her purse for her new key. She felt a little flutter of excitement about setting up her new office space inside. Charlie had left her his antique desk and chair. 
she would use her new toolbox and hang her diplomas on the wall. An image of a real office with the name plaque on her door, Lila Whitmore Esquire, flashed through her head as she opened the door to her apartment. Biddy didn't have to be her only client. When she closed the door, she stopped and thought about it. Whitmore Law Offices, she said aloud as she took off her coat. It had a nice ring to it. She grabbed her new toolbox and headed toward the office when she heard bootsteps climbing up the apartment stairs. She swung around and faced the door as the boots hit the top step. Then she heard a knock. She knew only a few people who would wear boots that sounded like that. Her heart raced as she walked to the door. Slowly, she opened the door, praying it was him. Drake stood in a suit and tie in cowboy boots. Drake! She covered her mouth with her hands. Was he really standing outside her door? What are you doing? Drake stepped up to her in the doorframe. I came back to do this. He swept his arms around her waist, pulled her to him, and kissed her. Lila melted into him, wrapping her arms around his shoulders, tightening the circle between them. You were right, he whispered to her. About what? she asked, tangling her fingers in his dark, thick hair. This place is magical, he said. She smiled and kissed him again. I can't believe you're here. Why are you here? He pulled back and flattened his tie with his hand. I got a job as a manager of a book and bakery shop in this little island town. Lila's mouth dropped. You're kidding! He shook his head. I'm just helping until Charlie recovers, and Renee will be taking some time off for the babies. Lila calculated the months in her head. That's great. I can't believe it. He nodded. Darlene agreed to let me stay with DJ, and we'll reevaluate everything later. Randy even talked to the school about DJ. Lila laughed at the thought of Pops bragging about the bright young man. And what does DJ think about all this? She asked. He couldn't stop thinking about this place either. Drake took her hands in his, intertwining their fingers. But I'm here to make a life for us, him and me. And I'm hoping you want to be part of that life too. Lila wrapped her arms around him and kissed him again. Chapter 31 Christmas ended up being at Seaview after all. Renee had changed her mind, being so tired with the pregnancy and everything else she did with the bakery. Biddy thought it had all turned out perfectly as she sat in the gathering room. She knew Evelyn loved having the holiday here with everyone at her and Charlie's home. And, of course, Evelyn and Charlie had invited everyone. Biddy and Drake and DJ, Wanda and Marty, the writers group, Randy and the twins, Sonia, and apparently even Tommy. Evelyn gave Biddy a wink as she noticed Tommy coming up to the front door. Why don't you go and greet him? Biddy jabbed her elbow in Evelyn's ribs, playfully, but walked right to the front door as Tommy was about to ring the doorbell. She swung it open, his surprise clear as he registered who stood there. Merry Christmas, Tommy said and kissed her on the cheek. You look beautiful tonight. Merry Christmas. Biddy said and kissed him back. I'm so happy you came. He nodded and then reached inside the pocket of his coat before handing over an envelope. What's this? She asked, not able to hold back her smile. You'll see, he said, nodding at the envelope and encouraging her to open it. She ripped it open with her finger and pulled out over a dozen tickets from inside. You got tickets to the aquarium? She flipped through them, there had to be almost 20 at least. How many did you get? I thought you could invite all your friends and their kids and grandkids to the aquarium with DJ, he said. Biddy's heart exploded. This is the most generous gift. She couldn't believe it. Maybe I'll get that second date with you, he said and winked at her. I think you might have a chance, she said, but hugged him. 
She led him to the gathering room where the rest of the group sat and talked and ate. Music played as laughter and conversation filled the space. As soon as Tommy and Biddy walked into the room, a boisterous welcome came from the crowd. Drake got up and shook Tommy's hand. Lila, who sat next to Drake, gave Tommy a hug. Charlie, Randy, and Mateo included Tommy in their conversation about when they hoped they'd be able to get back out on the water after winter. Biddy sat down next to Evelyn, who looked happier than she ever had before. Thank you for everything, Evelyn. Evelyn tilted her head. What are friends for? Evelyn jabbed her elbow into Biddy's side, and the two laughed. Are you ready for the wedding? Biddy asked, watching the men talk. Yes, everyone arrives in a few days. Evelyn took in a deep breath. It's going to be great, Biddy said, but she could feel her friend's happiness and nerves bundled together. You and Charlie are what I want to have someday. Before coming to the island, Biddy had been resigned she'd be alone for the rest of her life. Alone without a man, alone without her son, alone without her grandson. But now she felt like anything was possible. She had a support system bigger than she'd ever had before. You will, Biddy, Evelyn said, looking to the men standing together. I mean, I bet Mitch is still lingering around somewhere looking for a date. This made Evelyn and Biddy laugh with pure joy. Her whole body radiated a feeling of absolute bliss as she sat there under the Christmas lights among her family and friends. She couldn't have asked for more in life. And as the night went on and the waves drummed against the shores of Martha's Vineyard, Biddy was finally at peace. Lakeside Lighthouse, Romantic Women's Fiction Cliffside Point, Book Six Written by Ellen Joy Narrated by Jennifer March Chapter One Sonia dabbed her eyes with a tissue as Evelyn and Charlie said their vows. Sonia loved a wedding, and her new friend's intimate ceremony in her beautiful seaside home had turned out perfect. She didn't mean to get so emotional, but when she heard Evelyn's story about her first husband dying of a heart attack and finding a second chance with Charlie Moran, she couldn't help but think of her own marriage. Sonia had found very little happiness in hers. She stood beside her son Andrew, who hadn't kept his eyes off his girlfriend Harper, who stood at the altar as a bridesmaid in a gorgeous burgundy dress. Sonia had to admit, the young woman looked stunning. The feisty rider had turned out to be perfect for Andrew. Sonia had been wary of their relationship, but the young woman had grown on her. Her daughter had been another story. Lila stood hand in hand with her new boyfriend, Drake, and his son DJ, who hooted and hollered as Charlie and Evelyn kissed. Sonia would never have believed the two would become a couple. They couldn't be more opposite. Drake was a country boy from Oklahoma and Lila lived a life of luxury on Martha's Vineyard. But Sonia had to admit, something wonderful had formed between them, and they were truly in love. She wondered if her husband Jeff had ever hooted in his life. Jeff, whose idea of excitement was crushing his opponent, tried to never show any emotion, unless it was anger. His success depended on his even temper, even though it was always simmering. Her father Randy, or Pops, beamed as he announced as the officiant, Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to announce for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Moran. The whole room erupted in cheers and applause. Biddy even whistled. The newlyweds beamed as they made their way through the room, thanking and hugging everyone in attendance. Evelyn looked amazing in her cream satin dress. As the couple made their way toward the group, Sonia looked around the room. Most of the faces she vaguely recognized from the island. She peeked over at Tommy, who stood beside Biddy. She had been able to avoid him, besides polite pleasantries. Evelyn's house, Seaview, had been decorated throughout 
Christmas lights hung around windows, along railings, and above mantles. Even outside, the porches, the deck, and the path to the ocean were all lit up. Christmas ornaments hung on the tree. Sprigs of evergreen and poinsettias were placed in decorative pots. And even a tiny Christmas replica of the harbor town sat on the shelves. It was beautiful and warm and inviting. I'm so glad you could all make it, Evelyn said as she reached Sonia and her family. Evelyn hugged Sonia before she had a chance to offer her hand. She stiffened, even as she felt Evelyn's joy coming through her. You look beautiful, Sonia said to Evelyn. Evelyn moved to Andrew, and Sonia watched jealously as the two embraced easily and comfortably. When was the last time Sonia and her son had hugged that warmly? When was the last time she had been embraced, period? She played with her ring, twisting the large diamond so it sat correctly on her finger, wondering if Jeff's absence looked like what it was. The twins didn't seem to miss their father. Lila didn't even ask if he was coming. Though it wasn't unusual for Sonia to attend a wedding or funeral or social event without her husband. In fact, that would be more normal than not. Jeff always worked. But tonight, on New Year's Eve, who would really believe that excuse? So she made none. But like Evelyn and the twins, no one asked. Luckily, she didn't see anyone at the wedding who would care enough about her or her marriage. In the dining room, a celloist and violinist played music as waitstaff moved around the room with trays of hors d'oeuvres. Mmm, Drake mumbled loudly next to her after trying a bacon-wrapped scallop. Her scallops are delicious. Have you never had a scallop before? She asked, surprised. He shook his head and in his thick Oklahoma drawl said, Not too many scallops in my neck of the woods. Sonia tried not to watch her daughter interact with this gentleman in cowboy boots. Biddy's son was very attractive in that rugged, rough, and tough manner of an actual cowboy. But how much in common could her daughter have with him? What would the lady say about Lila dating the manager of a bakery? Lila didn't seem to care about what people might be saying. Her beautiful daughter's focus was entirely on Drake and DJ. She looked so happy. Even in her best times with Jeff, Sonia had never felt that kind of happy. The elated, lost-in-their-own-world love bubble. She spent her first years doing whatever it took to make Jeff love her. When he had asked her to marry him, she thought her worries of him leaving or changing his mind would vanish. But the anxiety only increased the more he worked, the more he had to travel, the more he stayed away. Outside, the last remains of sunlight disappeared behind the ocean's horizon. It's a beautiful house, isn't it? Pops asked. She nodded but stayed quiet. What did she have to say? Jeff didn't want to join you tonight? Pop said, knowing full well Jeff wouldn't come to something like this. She thought about telling the truth. She hadn't talked to Jeff in weeks, not since their argument about Christmas. Beef Wellington bite? A young server asked, holding out a silver platter. Pops grabbed two. Thank you. The server moved on to the next person. She decided against telling Randy anything about Jeff and her problems. I'm going to grab more of those, Pop said, scooting off with his new cane toward the server. That's when a couple pointed at Sonia and started making their way toward her. The man and woman waded through the crowd, and she realized she recognized them from the Christmas party. Wanda and... Shoot, she couldn't remember his name. Was it Michael or Mark? Hello, Sonia, Wanda said hugging her suddenly. Sonia patted the small woman's back. Hello? Marty, the man said, offering his hand to her as if he'd read her thoughts. Yes, of course, I remember, Sonia said, stepping back and smiling. Sonia played with her ring. Wanda looked frail, her hair light and spotty. She had learned Wanda had been going through a battle with cancer, 
but didn't know much more. She spun her ring as Wanda spoke. An uncomfortable undercurrent ran through Sonia as she tried not to look at Wanda's head. She didn't know the status of her treatment, but the effects were glaring. We'd love to have you and your husband over for dinner, Wanda said to her. Oh, that's so nice, Sonia said, but Jeff wouldn't want to go. Jeff would need something in it for him to attend the stranger's dinner party. He needed a connection, a tip, a new client, to network, something to make it worth his time. There wasn't much that had been worth his time as far as Sonia was concerned. Jeff never wanted to spend time with her side of the family or her friends, and now his latest stunt proved he didn't even want to spend time with his own family. Let me know a time that works, Wanda said, and we can have you over. I will, Sonia's eyes drifted up to Wanda's hair. I look forward to it. Great, Wanda said with a half smile. Her hand touched the back of her neck where her hairline began. Oh, God. Wanda had noticed Sonia's looking. Wanda gave another weak smile before taking Marty's arm and walking away. Sonia immediately looked for Pops, who was popping another beef wellington into his mouth. She moved to the peripheral of the party, watching, waiting, as the time ticked by and the year slowly ended. Three, two, one... Happy New Year! The crowd all called out. Everyone turned to one another, kissing and hugging, except for Sonia, who hid in the shadows, wishing for something to change. She had to be the one who changed, because Jeff wouldn't. All his promises had been broken. She saw Tommy take Biddy into his arms, as she threw her head back laughing, completely thrilled. He pulled Biddy into a kiss and Sonia's chest tightened at the embrace. After the kiss, Tommy began to whisper something in Biddy's ear. Whatever he had said made Biddy laugh again. A sinking sensation washed over Sonia. That could have been her in his arms.